You ever get out of high school and realize you have no idea what the hell you want to do with your life. Turns out, just kind of waiting and seeing where life takes you can really only get you so far. You're always told, oh what do you want to do when you get out of high school? Simple enough question. Well turns out it's a lot harder to figure that shit out when you don't really think of it the entire time you're in high school. So what do you do when walking down that aisle and accepting your diploma and suddenly you realize you have no clue what you want to do with your life? My name is Travis and when I graduated high school I had no idea what the hell I wanted to do with my life. College? Not appealing to me. Job? Even less appealing. So what did I do with all my government mandated education? Stayed home sleeping all day and gaming all night. Typical deadbeat shit. And like any loving and supportive parents, my lovely mom and dad threatened to kick me out on my ass unless I found something to make of my life. So I weighed my options. College. I had no idea what to study, the nearest college was several miles away, I had no scholarship opportunities, the idea of being in debt for the majority of my life was very unappealing. Job. I get home tired and probably have to listen to some asshole boss. So, it was a job I ended up choosing. Although trying to find any kind of employment in my town was near impossible. Unless I wanted to work at a factory for the rest of my life, I really had to expand my search from fast food to garbage man. Throwing my application to any place that had a help wanted sign. And that's how I ended up at all King Creoles. Honestly, I don't remember even applying here. I just got a call one day when I was laying in bed reading a book. Let's just say that's what I was doing. When my phone pulled me away from what I was doing. Sighing as I stared at the unfamiliar number. The person behind the line talked with a heavy old southern accent, but I could tell how excited he was to meet me in person. And I was excited to finally shove it in my parents' faces that I had made something with my life. Working at a voodoo shop. Living the dream, right? Of course, if you ask me now what I would have chosen now, college is looking a bit more optimal. If only a little bit. Now look, we've all heard the story of bosses from hell and shitty working conditions for shit pay. And to some extent I get that, I'll get into my boss in a second, I really don't hate this place. The customers piss me off more than anything. Let me explain why by explaining my job. I work at All King Creel's half-priced voodoo shop. Quite the mouthful, huh? It's this glorified shack full to the brim with freaky dolls and spooky cobwebs. Lovely place really, especially at night when all the desperate people come in begging for wishes or potions. Oh yeah, we give out free wishes. Like really real wishes. But I don't handle that, so I'm not gonna talk much about them. Just remember, if you ever come in and ask for a wish, please think it through thoroughly. I'm so tired of wiping up the counter after a bad wish gets granted. The main thing I deal with is doll sales and potions. Need that wart removed. Got a great potion for that. You a shitty parent and forgot little Jimmy's birthday. One of the dolls should do it. Just don't come crying to me when Jimmy's soul gets trapped in the doll. We have a strict no return policy. Is it a scam? No, you bought it without asking if it could suck up Jimmy's soul. Can't really do much about that now can I? Potions are more flexible, the only time I've seen it go bad was a weight loss potion. Had to sell the angry lady a potion to get rid of all her excess skin. I dunno what she expected, she was like 300 pounds, did she think all that skin was going to go somewhere? The way I check into work is also pretty interesting. If I can call it that. I show up on time, or 5 minutes late without fail, and stab a needle into a voodoo doll on the counter. It's not meant to look like anyone since it's a blank template, but still doesn't make it any less weird. I swear that thing looks at me, whenever I'm on my phone, when nobody is in the shop, and I've got nothing to do. What do you want me to do? Wipe the counter down for the millionth time. I've tried man, the dust always comes back. Without fail. You turn around for half of a second and it's back. It's gotten to the point where I just leave it and draw things in it. What else, oh yeah we have a basement I'm never allowed to go into. I was told by my boss, I'll talk about him soon, calm your horses, that I'm never allowed down there. Not that I even want to go down there, the loud knocking coming from it, and the crying has pretty well and truly kept me away from it. Hey, don't you start judging me about it. If you're so damn curious you'd go down there, if you're so damn tough. I'm just a cashier, if I'm told not to go down into the freaky murder basement, I ain't fucking going down there. What else happens here, HM? 
well, the place seemingly stocks itself, so that's pretty cool. Sometimes. This place can get so boring when nobody is here, that I wish I could restock the shelves or the potions. Something man, I get paid to sit behind the counter, and ring up things people wanna buy. Simple as that. I've been working here for about two months and man does it feel like I've been here for decades. Each of my days takes like fucking three man. Alright, I'll stop whining and talk about my boss. If you guessed his name is King Creole, then ding ding. Congratulations, you've been paying attention to my dumb ramblings. King Creole who will shorten to KC, for now, is weird. Like an uncanny valley kind of weird. He's this 6'4 lanky man, with messy black hair and button eyes. You ever watch Coraline? Yay we're approaching other mother territory. Though I guess he's got a beat, cause he's real. And his mouth is sewn up. Same with his throat and neck. Like he's got stitches all around his neck. Sometimes when he turns his head too quickly you can see it wobble, and his stitch is about to snap. It's gross. He's pretty cool all things said, though he definitely doesn't have a concept of personal space. When I walked into work for my first day, he came out of god knows where, and grabbed my hand, and put his face like a good 3 inches away from my face. One thing that strikes you about KC, apart from the stitches and Button's eyes, is how pale he is. Now I'm no bronze god myself, but KC is about as pale as white chalk. Like it's unreal. When I first met him, I thought he was wearing paint or some shit like that. But nope, that's his skin. I think anyway. If you look at him long enough you can to see his skin cracking. Like a sun bleached corpse or something. I dunno, all in all he isn't such a bad boss. He pays well enough. I get $20 an hour, to just sit here and ring up an occasional customer. You gotta wish. Sorry, that's KC's department. And of course, if you fuck up your wish, and end up as a bloody mess on the floor and counter, guess what poor idiot has to clean that up? Yours truly. So please, if you ever show up to all King Creole's half-priced voodoo shop, think your stupid wishes through. Now if you'll excuse me, my break is done, and that thing in the basement is really banging on the door. And that doll on the counter is really giving me the stink eye. If anything else interesting happens here, I'll let you guys know. Seems as though my original post was pretty popular. Despite me just talking about how bored I am with my job. Well turns out I guess I didn't make it scary enough for most people. So to fix that I thought I would tell you guys a story from my second week of working at this half-priced voodoo shop. As a reward for you guys liking it so much. Well, just in case you have no idea who I am and stumbled on this post before my last one, my name is Travis. And I work at All King Creel's half-priced voodoo shop. I run the desk as a clerk and overall just do my best to keep up with all the weird shit that happens here. Like what happened when I just started working here. I had punched in like any other day before. Stabbing a pin into that doll template that just stares at me all day from its spot on the counter. At this point I was still struggling in vain to keep the counter clean, but alas to no avail. So I resigned myself to just fuck around on my phone until I saw some form of life. Travis, my boy. Came the voice of my boss and owner of this fine establishment. King Creel himself. How has the job been treating you? He asked, his stitched up lips curled into a smile as he came around the counter and wrapped an arm around me. Causing me a decent amount of discomfort. As I've mentioned before, King Creel has button eyes, a stitched up mouth, and a head being kept on his shoulders by some stitches. He always wears a nice black suit with a dark purple tie and a top hat. Yes even indoors and yes I know he looks ridiculous, but look man I'm trying to keep this job as long as possible, so don't blow this for me. It's going okay, Mr. Creel I said awkwardly. Still at this point weirded out by his looks and his unnaturally chalk white skin. He nodded happily at me and gave me a good smack on the back. Getting a loud youth out of me. Fantastic to hear son. Now, remember. They come asking for a wish, you just come fetch all King Creel, and I'll be right on over. He hummed happily, finally letting go of me and standing back. I nodded since that was really the only thing I didn't have to do here. By the way, I think one of the dolls is missing. I pointed out to him. Pointing towards the wall of voodoo dolls that goes from the floor to the ceiling. Each of them is of a different design and of a different person, so if one goes missing there's usually a reason. Oh, well I'll be. He hummed, almost happily as his button eyes turned back to me, and he gave me a yellow tooth smile behind his stitches. 
I expect a customer will come in today. He chuckled, walking past me and patting me on the shoulder. His hand was cold as I stopped giving a bit of a shiver as he vanished to the office in the back, I sat my butt down on the uncomfortable stool that sat behind the counter and went back to looking at my phone. Periodically peeking at the doll on the counter and turning it back over whenever it somehow managed to turn and look at me. About an hour into my shift, the old rusty bell on the door clang, signaling me to get off my phone, as I quickly hit it and looked over to the customer. It was a girl, about my age, maybe a year older. She looked around at the place a bit disgusted by all the cobwebs. Quickly coming closer to me. Luckily, she didn't look at the wall of dolls, since their gaze followed her as she came up to the counter. Welcome to All King Krill's half priced voodoo shop. I said in my best, I do actually want to be here, voice. What can I help you with? I asked her. Putting my hands on the counter and looking down to make sure it wasn't too dusty. Hi. Um, the sign outside said free wishes. She asked me, with a raised brow. She seemed like the sporty kind of person. How did I know this? because she was wearing workout gear in the middle of fall. She obviously was jogging and saw our sign. How exactly does that work? She asked me. Yay, I gotta go get my boss to handle that. Wait here while I go get him. I asked her, and she nodded, still a bit skeptical about this place. And I really don't blame her about that at all if I'm being honest. Dot getting off my stool, I stretched a bit and made my way over to the king's office. Flinching when whenever was in the basement started pounding on the door again. At this point, I was still afraid of it so I just quickly ran past it into the boss man's office. Knocking three times like I always was told to do. Hey, Mr. Creole. We have someone here asking about a wish. I said. Receiving silence from the office. Raising a brow at that I tried again. Knocking another three times to get a response. Although the response I got was the girl at the counter screaming. Turning quickly I saw that it was just my boss standing at the counter. Looking back at the office and over to the counter, I scratched my head at how the hell he had gotten over there so quickly. But ultimately resigned myself to it just being not worth my time to think about it. I do apologize for startling you, darling. King Creole hummed, taking his hat off and putting it to his chest. I do forget sometimes that my appearance does frighten the faint of heart. He hummed with a chuckle. Yeah, I had had the same reaction as that girl when I had first seen him. Dot, it's a little early for Halloween. The girl pouted, backing up from him, and I can imagine, really rethinking the idea of coming in here. I wouldn't have blamed her if she had left right there. Would have saved me the trouble of cleaning up afterwards. Dot, what can I do for you, Melissa? My boss asked, putting his hat back on that messy mat of black hair he owned, and putting his hands out in front of him. Obviously throwing the girl off by knowing her name. She looked to me as if to see if I was having the same reaction. I just shrugged at her. He did the same thing to me so I didn't know what she wanted. Dot well. She began, looking back at him and pursing her lips in thought. What does asking for a wish entail? She asked him, crossing her arms at him. Not a bad question to ask in my own honest opinion. Dot ah, well. You ask little all me for a wish, and I grant it for you. No strings attached. He hummed, holding his hands up and showing that some strings dangled down from his gloved fingers. I do ask that you think your wish through very thoroughly. Wishes have a very bad tendency of backfiring. He said with a sad tone. I looked at my boss with a raised brow. That was the first time I'd seen him show any kind of emotion that wasn't, well, creepy happy is the best way to describe him. Seemingly sensing I was staring at him, his attention turned to me. Travis, can you please get something out of my office? He asked with a hum. I looked up at him confused, since I was never really allowed in there. But hey, he pays me so I might as well do it, right sure. What do you need? I asked. Looking to the counter and noticing that stupid doll was staring at me again. Dot get the brown satchel bag that's under the desk. I'll handle young Ms. Melissa. He hummed, turning his attention back to her. His hands coming down to the dusty counter and drumming his hands on them. Dot sure thing, sir. I shrug, giving one last look to the girl before turning and going to his office. Not before that thing in the basement started banging again and startled me. Quickly rushing past it and into his office. King Creole's office was surprisingly spotless. I say that because the entire shop is covered in dust and cobwebs, so seeing such a nice office was definitely jarring. I know you guys are expecting severed heads and dead bodies everywhere, but really he just has a desk and some photos on the wall. 
All of them are scratched out though, so I didn't really pay too much attention to it. Going over to his desk and looking underneath it, I did indeed see the satchel bag he told me to fetch. Taking it and heading out of his office, I came back to Melissa shaking his gloved hand, and both of their attentions turned to me. Travis. Good boy, you found it. He hummed as he motioned for me to come closer to him. I did and handed him the satchel dot with a cheerful grin on his stitched up mouth, he quickly slammed it down on the counter, kicking up dust and sending both me and Melissa into a coughing fit. He opened it up and searched inside of it for a bit. His smile growing wider and seemingly about to bust his stitches when he pulled out exactly what he was looking for. Pulling out a small can of what looked like skincare cream. Now then. Your exact wish was that you never wanted acne problems ever again. Correct? He asked the girl. Tilting his head and waiting for an answer. From my angle at his side, I could notice that his head really strained the stitches on his neck. That would have been funny to see his head go rolling around the shop. Melissa looked uncomfortable. Obviously self-conscious about my being there. But she nodded to the voodoo salesman. Who in turn handed her the cream. She looked down at it and then up to him. A quizzical look on her face. Well go on darling. Try it out. Creole said. A smile still on his face. Melissa looked down at it and uncapped it. I tried to peek from my spot next to Creole from behind the counter into the jar. It was just a normal white cream. Like any other kind of skincare product. Melissa sighed as she dipped her finger into the cream and got a conservative amount. Tapping it on her cheeks and face as she spread it out in circles on the surface. And when she was finished she pulled out her phone from her pocket and looked at herself. Eyes raised as she waited for something to happen. Andy, well. Something did happen. She started screaming really loud. And her skin started sizzling and dripping off her face. Now I'm not squeamish much, but being caught off guard like that I backed up and away from the counter. What the fuck is in this? Melissa screamed as the skin on her face started dripping off her faster. Like a melting candle. Meanwhile, I was behind the counter struggling to keep my food down. Luckily for me I had skipped breakfast, so I just gagged a lot. You asked for not more acne, dear. Creole hummed over her loud screams and the sizzling of her skin. Now you won't have to worry about that ever again. He hummed with a soft chuckle as he watched her squirm and scream some more. At this point, Melissa's face was mostly on the floor in a bloody mess. She clawed at what was left of her skin as it melted her down to her skull and sinews. Her hands weren't spared either as they too started melting their skin off. It took less than two minutes for the girl called Melissa to have become nothing but a steaming pile of bones, blood, and other gross shit on the shop floor. Travis, be a good boy and clean up this mess, please. Creole said as he turned his attention to me. I was still hacking and looked up to him like he was insane. I just watched some girl die in front of me, and now he wanted me to get rid of her, just a little bit crazy don't you think I I? I started to stammer, holding my stomach and shivering some at what I'd just seen. But my gaze turned when he gripped me by the shoulder and stared into my eyes with his button eyes. Be a good boy. And clean this up. Put the pile of bones in a trash bag and toss it into the basement. He hummed to me, raising his finger quickly when I tried to remind him that I wasn't allowed in the basement. I'll be down there so don't worry about it. He hummed. Patting me hard on the back and walking over to the door. Unlocking it with a key he produced from his suit pocket and inserting it into the basement door. Opening it quickly he closed it behind him. I could hear his muffled yelling and whatever was downstairs scurrying away from the door as his footsteps disappeared down into the unknown. Dot looking over at the pile of human bones and blood I sighed hard and looked behind the counter. Putting on rubber gloves and getting out a mop I went to work. Collecting all the bones by hand I put it in a trash bag and did my best to hold my breath. I didn't know if he wanted the organs in there as well. So I just scooped them up quickly and shoved them into the bag. Gagging hard when I finally let them go into the bag. Setting that aside I did my best to mop up the leftover blood. I did a decent job for it being my first time and all dot finally, I grabbed a bag and went over to the basement door. Looking at it and swallowing a lump in my throat before I opened the door and looked down into the pitch black hole. Looking at the bag I tied it up as good as I could and chucked it down there. Closing the door again and sighing hard as I kept a hand on it and looked down at the floor. A little shining piece of broken porcelain caught my attention. Reaching down I grabbed it and looked at it. It was just a white piece. Maybe from a vase or something. So I shoved it in my pocket and went back to my stool. Pulling out my phone and shivering as I scrolled through it. King Creel returned after 30 minutes. Slamming the door shut and locking it. 
mumbling something to himself as he took off his hat and dusted it. Looking over to me his smile returned and he walked over to me, peering over the counter to see my work. Excellent work Travis. He hummed, wrapping an arm around me and looking at me. Like a proud father when his son caught his first fish. Why don't you take the rest of the day off? Here, for all your trouble. He hummed, rolling his fingers like he was doing a car trick and producing $200 dots staring at that amount of money and then back at him, he could have asked me to lick the dusty counter and I would have done it. Taking it from him I nodded and thanked him. Getting everything I came with my phone and nothing else, I unstuck the pin from the voodoo doll and left without another word said dot in OW, look. I know what you're all thinking. I covered up some girl's death or helped get rid of her body. And you're right I did. But in my own defense, I did get paid a lot to do it. And it seems like everyone thought she just ran away. No police ever came to the shop and they never do whenever a wish goes bad. So don't you start preaching to me. Not like I'm the one telling people to make wishes without thinking them through. What would you do if you got held up at work? Like at gunpoint and some coked up junkie is screaming at you to give him all the money in the register. Hold your hands up and comply. Try and be a hero and fight him off with a bat or a gun hidden under the counter. I always thought I would just give the guy the cash register and hold my hands up while he left with it. That was until I got held up not once but twice in the same week. The first time I got to work on time. Looking around to make sure King Creel wasn't hiding behind some corner that I didn't know even existed in the shop. Satisfied that my boss wasn't going to scare me, I walked over to the counter and stabbed my needle into the counter doll. Taking a seat on my stool and sighing as I started my shift. Drumming my fingers up and down on the counter dot normally I would see at most four or five customers during an entire shift. Most want to wish, much to my chagrin. And maybe one or two of them want a potion. That's a simple procedure, you ask for the potion and I ring you up. Easy as that. I don't have to clean anything, and I don't have to help discard a body. But unfortunately for me, not many people want a potion. They'd rather try and wish for something. So, when a guy came in wearing a beanie and a hoodie, I was more than willing to bet that he was going to ask for a wish. I barely opened my mouth to talk to him when a gun was shoved in front of my face. By reflex almost I put my hands up slowly. Easy man. I said in a squeaky surprised voice. Don't try and say you wouldn't react the same way shut up. Is it just you in here? The guy asked, his eyes darting everywhere in a paranoid state. He was obviously on something. He had to be to try and rob a place that looked abandoned 90% of the time. Dada, uh, I think my boss is here. And that thing in the basement, but I'm pretty sure it can't get out. I motioned my head over to the shut basement door. Which of course this time was not banging or crying or screaming. The guy, obviously unamused, shoved the gun further in my face. Dot, get your boss out here. Before I blow your fucking brains all over the walls. He threatened, cocking the hammer back on his revolver. Dot, okay. Just, chill man. I said, putting my hands up higher as I backed up and started making my way over to the boss man's office. Lucky the guy was so busy focused on me. Because believe me when I say that the dolls on the wall behind him looked like they wanted to jump down and rip him to shreds. Dot, making it to King Creel's office, I quickly knocked on it. Looking back to the guy who was staring at the counter doll. I imagine he had the look on him that he gives me when I'm slacking off on my phone. Dot, Travis. What do you want? Creel's voice came from the office. The door opening and him looking down at me, then over to the guy holding up his establishment. His smile lowered a bit, but it didn't falter. Instead, he nodded knowingly and stepped out. Fixing his dark purple tie and walking over to the counter with me next to him. Jesus. The robber gasped when he saw King Creel coming towards him. A pretty normal response when seeing my boss for the first time. The man didn't falter for too long though, pointing the gun up at the lanky voodoo shop owner. Dot, what can I do for you? Creel asked with a hum. Hands clasped together as he looked down at the robber. Not an ounce of concern on that jockey white face of his. Dot, open up the register and the safe. The robber said quickly, looking back at the door then back to us quickly. The gun firmly in his hands and a serious look on his face. Despite his eyes darting between us. Dot, well, I don't have a safe. 
But if it's the register you want, Travis would be more than willing to open it for you. Right Travis, my boy. He asked me, giving me a hard smack to my back and sending me stumbling forward. The robber nearly shot me on the spot as I did so. My hand still up and I looked back to Creo like he was sending me to the slaughter. Well if you wanted to get robbed, I really couldn't stop him. I walked back behind the counter and opened up the register. And one look at it told me that it was way more filled than usual. I can say that for a fact because when I opened it up the thing shot some loose bills up into the air. My eyes were as wide as the robbers, who quickly pushed me aside and started filling up his hoodie and pants pockets with all the cash from the register. Now, Kevin. King Creel's voice hummed, in a tone that I knew meant trouble, the one he used when persuading someone into wishing for something. I started instinctively backing away from him as he kept up shoving bills into his pockets. He did look up though, obviously confused as to how the voodoo man knew his name. How the hell do you know my name? The robber, who I guess was indeed named Kevin, asked, pointing a gun at King Creel, who didn't flinch as he walked over to him. The robber was obviously freaked out, the gun shaking in his hand. Didn't your mama ever teach you that stealing is very very bad? Creel scared, raising a gloved finger and shaking it at Kevin, who shivered and started sweating backing up away from the man. And didn't anyone ever tell you not to play with guns? He asked the man. Kevin looked to me, his eyes wide with fear as he pointed the shaking revolver forward. A loud crack went off in the shop. My own eyes were wide as my ears rang, seeing that Kevin had pulled the trigger on my boss. I looked over to King Creel, who staggered to a stop, his head jerked backward, and the stitches holding his head on almost snapping off. Oh Kevin, Kevin, Kevin. His voice still rang, causing both my and Kevin's jaw to hit the floor. Creel jerked his head back into place, only this time there was an obvious bullet hole in his forehead. Looks like I'll have to teach you a lesson. He chuckled. Kevin then started backing up, dropping the gun to the floor and holding his hands up. I meanwhile looked over at Creel completely dumbfounded. I at this point had figured he wasn't really human, but surviving a headshot really kind of solidified that in my own head. I looked over at the register and saw that it was still very much full of cash. A neverending cash register. Another perk to working here I guess. Ah, Travis. Do be a good boy and look away, please. King Creole asked me as he closed the distance to Kevin, grabbing the robber by the throat and lifting him up from the floor. I don't want you to watch this part, he said sweetly, like a mom talking to her son about something. I opened my mouth to ask what was going to happen, but I thought better. Turning around and looking at the wall behind me, Kevin meanwhile screamed and begged for me to help him. Funny how that works. A couple of minutes ago he was holding me up, and now he's screaming at the top of his lungs to help him. Though that didn't last too much longer since his screaming turned into gurgles and hacking coughs. I did my best to ignore the increasingly wet and nasty slaps and rips coming from behind me. I'm gonna be honest, the fear of what he was doing to the robber was a million times scarier than the act of being robbed. All done. The satisfied hum of my boss rang in my ringing ears. I turned and saw the big splatter of blood on the wall and floor where Kevin had been. Great. No doubt I would have to clean that up. What did you do with him? I asked the old voodoo king. He looked at me with those big black button eyes of his and looked to his arm, which he brought up and showed he was holding a controller for a marionette doll. Except it was made of bones. Small bones that almost looked like some kind of animals. Of course, those thoughts were dispelled when he lifted his arm up further and produced a small bloody figure attached to the stings of the controller. I'm sure I don't need to spell out who the figure looked like. Dodd, I don't appreciate people threatening my employees. He sighed, dropping the bloody figure onto the table and made it dance around, making the counter messy with blood as he did so. I looked up to him, both thankful and pissed off, mostly because I figured I'd have to clean all this up. Dodd, thank you, sir. Do you want me to? I started, but was soon interrupted by him when he held his hand up and the little figure mimicked him. Got to hand it to him. He's a great puppeteer. Don't worry about the mess, Travis. He shrugged it off, chuckling as he picked up the figure and held it tightly clenched in his gloves. More blood leaking out of it and dripping onto the counter. Just get rid of this for me, please. He asked, tossing the gun at me. I fumbled with it, afraid that it was going to go off in my hands. But once I was sure it wouldn't go off, because it was empty, I looked up at him, noticing that the bullet hole in his forehead had disappeared. 
I didn't ask about that though. I simply nodded and went over to the front door and left. Walking across the street to a dumpster that is near our shop in the alley. Tossing it in there after I wiped it down against my pants, just in case my fingerprints were in there, I quickly jogged back into the store. More than happy to see not a speck left where Kevin once was dot that was the first time I was held up in the store. The second time came about two days later. I was working later than usual, my shift is usually from 9am to 3pm. This time I was working from 5 to 9. Not horrible, but we definitely get weirder people in the later hours. Weird people that are usually chilled with King Creole and the odd person asking for a wish or potion. Well, this time a fine gentleman came running into the store and hid behind a shelf that covered him from the view of the front door. I watched as he squatted even lower when a car drove past. Shining a light into the shop and going along after a moment. The guy looked up for a minute and then over to me. Hey, do you need anything? Or are you just here to loiter? I asked him. Look I was tired, man, and I was like half an hour away from unpinning my needle from the doll. Mentally I was checked out already. So when the guy pointed a gun at me, I actually rolled my eyes at him. Again. I thought as I put my hands up dot I need a place to hide. The guy said quickly, looking back at the door and rushing over to me. The cops are after me. He said again. And that's when I noticed the blood on his clothes. I sighed and looked over to King Creel's office hoping he could handle this. Of course, when I turned back around and saw him right behind this guy, I nearly shat myself. What have we here? He asked, putting his hand onto the other man's shoulder and flipping him around to face him. The man gasped and was quickly disarmed. Need a place to hide son Wa, he said in confusion, but at the mention of hiding, he quickly pulled out a switchblade, pointing it up at Krill. Where? I need a quick man. He shouted, looking behind Krull to see if the cops were making another round. Why, right this way, Sonny. My boss said with a happy tone, pulling the nameless man along and towards the basement. Now seeing that really sent my stomach down into a pit. At this point, I had gotten used to the basement creature, but seeing some unsuspecting person getting led there. I felt bad for the man. Faster you freak. They could be here any minute. The man said, flinching at any little creak of the shop. Creole took his sweet time, pulling out the key and opening up the basement. Opening it up and stepping aside like a grand unveiling dot all yours. He hummed. Watching with a wide smile as the man rushed into the dark basement. Closing the door behind him and locking it. And that's that. He hummed, looking back to me with that same smile and walking over to me. Um, what is down there, sir? I asked him, pointing at the basement door. Creole looked me dead in my eyes. I could tell he wasn't messing around just by the tone of his voice. None of your business, Travis, he said, in almost an animal-like snarl. I swallowed the lump in my throat and backed up a bit, nodding up at him and flinching hard when the door began to be banged on. Let me out, there's something down here. The man screamed, banging harder and harder on the door, the frame bending with just how hard he hit it. Of course, those soon turned into loud screams as I assume whatever lived in the basement caught up with him. King Creole looked back at the basement door and waited for it to stop banging. Soon enough it did and we heard the sounds of something being dragged down the stairs. I looked at him then. A look of anger was on his pale face. The first time I'd ever seen him like that. That whore gets what she deserved. He mumbled, low enough to where I assume he thought I couldn't hear. But here I did. I didn't say anything, wiping out the counter and unpinning my needle from the doll. Good night, sir. I said as I took off my Nama tag and shoved it into my pocket. My words shook him from his angry spat and he turned on his heels to look at me. A smile on his face once again. Good night, Travis, my boy. He hummed, turning and walking off back to his office. I nodded and turned to leave myself. I stopped at the door though, turning back and looking at the basement door. I looked back over towards King Creel's office, and once I was sure he was in there, I made my way back over to the door. I looked at it, noticing the blood coming from underneath the crack of the door. I knelt and tried to peer through the keyhole. I didn't see anything at first, just the usual blackness of the basement. I sighed and stood to leave. Until I heard a soft thud come from the door. I turned and raised a brow to that. Leaning down again, I put my eye to the keyhole. This time I was greeted by a green shiny cracked eye dot flinching hard, I backed up and quickly made my way out of the shop. 
shaking my head quickly and just getting out of there. I don't know what King Creole has down there. Dot and I really don't want to know either. Even if whatever it is keeps begging me to let it out. So by this point, I'm pretty sure you guys have a pretty good grasp on what King Creole is like as a boss. He's creepy and a murderer by most definition of the law. Right. I mean the button eyes and sewn up mouth should have been a dead giveaway to that dot well, he has ways of surprising you. Like some pointed out, he defended me during the robbery and the runaway convict situation. That alone sorta of tipped the scales to him being pretty alright. Well. Something happened a few days ago that really changed my perspective on him. It was a lazy Saturday. I was leaning back on my newly upgraded rocking chair. That's right folks, no more crappy tool. Old buddy boy Travis has a rocking chair now. Take that desk jockeys. Anyway, I was rocking on the chair, enjoying how good it felt to have back support when the rusty doorbell rang. I looked over at the door and saw nobody there. Odd, but not out of the ordinary in this place. Figured it was some ghost or something dot until I heard the sounds of tiny straining and a little hand came up from the other side of the counter. I raised my brow at that and quickly looked at the wall of voodoo dolls. Had one escaped again? I thought to myself. But my train of thought was derailed when a childlike voice pulled my attention back over Dottie excuse me. The voice asked. Innocent and just a little shy. I stood up from my rocking chair and looked over the counter to see a little girl standing there by herself. She looked to be about in second or even first grade. Her little hands quickly went behind her back when she looked up at me. Dada, hello little girl. Are you lost? I asked her, looking around the shop for any sign of a parental figure. Didn't take me too long considering how small this place is. Dot I want to wish. She said softly, looking up at me and giving a soft pout. The kind a kid gives when they expect the answer to be no, but they still want to shoot their shot. Dot uh, oh. Um. Let me go get my boss okay. I said to her. I wasn't exactly trained to handle children, much less one looking to ask for a wish. And having seen my fair share of wishes in this place, I almost wanted to talk her out of it. But a job is a job. Turning to go to Creel's office I was surprised to see him already leaving at ah, ah, Travis my boy. He said with a hum. Pulling on his suit to straighten it out and patting some dust off of it. I need you to watch the shop while I he began to say, but his button eyes quickly turned to see the little girl standing at the counter. Who was too busy looking up at the wall of voodoo dolls to notice us. Well, I'll be. He said, in a bewildered voice. Yay. She came in here asking for a wish. I was just about to come and get you. I explained, looking back over to the mystery girl. She was busy looking wide-eyed at all the dolls available. It was like she'd never seen a toy before. A wish, huh? He asked with a hum. Walking over to the little girl and clearing his throat. Oh, little Miss Olivia. He asked, bending down to his knees to get on her level. The little girl turned around and to my surprise, didn't flinch at all at King Creel's appearance. In fact, she had stars in her eyes when she saw him. Are you the wish man? She asked quickly and excitedly. Why, I do believe I am. He responded after a chuckle and a smile. This smile was different than the one he usually wore. His normal smile always gave off an air of creepy judgment. Like someone knowing the person they were talking to was inferior. But his smile this time seemed genuine. Dot, can you grant me a wish? The girl, named Olivia as you read before, asked quietly. Looking up to the voodoo man with all the passion a girl at her age could have. Hell, I wanted to grant her a wish just from that I'm afraid. You're too young darling. I can't in good conscience grant you a wish. Creel said sadly. Taking off his hat as if in silent apology. You could see Alvia's heartbreak clear on her face. She drooped like a dying flower immediately. Her arms behind her back coming to the surface. And that's when I noticed all the bruises on them. Dot Creel saw them as well. His attention turned to it and he took the girl by the arm. Gently lifting her tiny pale and bruised arm up and looking at her. Who did this to you? He asked softly. Olivia looked like she was holding back the floodgates. And they finally broke as she started crying and hiccuping. Using her free arm to wipe her face as she cried. But she managed to blurt out an answer to Creel. My mommy dot is a fun cue, the front door slammed open. Nearly breaking a shelf near it as a woman came into the shop. I could tell she was Olivia's mother by the resemblance of her to her crying daughter. Olivia. What in the hell are you doing in this place? She demanded to know. Coming over with a look of rage on her face. Dot, wow, wow. Calm down there darling. 
Little Miss Olivia was simply asking for a wish was all. Creole said, springing up and quickly pushing Olivia behind him. I acted as well, motioning for the girl to come over to be behind the counter. She reacted accordingly, coming over to me and hugging my pants, leg dot she shouldn't have left where I told her to stay. The woman spat in my boss's face. I could smell the alcohol on her from here. Figures. I'm not paying for whatever she asked for. Olivia, get your ass over here and get in the car. She screamed in my direction. I reached a hand down and patted the girl's head as she shivered violently against me. Dot I assure you, ma'am. You don't have to pay for anything. Creole hummed, holding his hands up defensively against the woman's gabs and accusations. Why all she asked for was a doll. And I'm mighty inclined to get her one. He hummed, fixing his tie as she walked past the angry mother. He walked over to the wall of voodoo dolls and hummed as he looked up at the wall. Pointing his finger out as if to try and find the right one, and snapping when he found a dot reaching out, he took the correct doll and brushed it off. Blowing on it and sending the dust in the mother's face. Sending her on a coughing fit. I smiled at that, seeing my boss stand up for this poor girl dot Miss Olivia. He asked her, as he walked over and passed the sputtering mother. He once again got down on her level and revealed the doll to her. It was a small one, about the size of my forearm. It was dressed in a black Victorian gown and had the hair to match. Along with the button eyes of all the dolls, we had in the store dot Olivia, pulling herself away from my leg looked at the doll with awe. Sniffling as she held both her bruised arms out. King Creole carefully gave her the doll and smiled as she looked at it. Brushing the doll's hair and quickly giving it a hug. Thank you. She said softly. Clinging to the item as she walked away from the counter and to her mother dot that thing better not have any fleas. She hissed, turning and grabbing Olivia's little arm and yanking her along. Olivia gave one last forlorn look as she was dragged away. The sad rusty bell jingling as they both left out I looked over to my boss, who was clearly as upset as I was. That scene was more difficult for me than all the bad wishes I've ever seen working here. Because of how hopeless it all seemed. As if reading my mind, Creole put his hand on my shoulder and forced my gaze to look into his button eyes. She'll be fine, son. I assure you of that. He said, nodding to me and tussling my hair. Sighing as he let me go and started back to his office. The thing in the door banging as he walked past it, causing him to freeze in place. He looked at the door with a clenched fist and smashed his fist against it. Shut up. You're never leaving that place. He screamed at the door. His mouth wide as he gritted his teeth. A few of his stitches ripped, causing him to cover his mouth and walk over to his office. Slamming the door with a loud slam. Leaving me alone with the uneasy feeling of being all alone in the shop. The rest of the day was hard to get through. All I could think about was poor Olivia and her mother. I sighed and sat back in my rocking chair. Not much I could do. I didn't know her last name so I couldn't report her to CPS. So I resigned myself to listen to King Creole, who has never steered me wrong. Only two other customers came in that day, and all they wanted was a ward removal potion and a heart attack potion. Don't ask. As I unpinned my pin from the doll on the counter, I looked over to Creole's office. Walking over to it I knocked three times. Not hearing anything from inside, I opened the door and poked my head inside. Seeing Creole at his desk sewing a doll at his office. Obviously lost in whatever thoughts were dancing around in that head of his dot sir. I'm gonna head home. I said, breaking his concentration, and he lifted his head to look up at me. He looked confused for a second, before looking over to the clock on his wall, and nodding seemingly realizing what the time was dot right. Yes. See you tomorrow, Travis. He said like a robot. He turned back to the doll he was sewing and said nothing more to me. I nodded and turned to leave, letting the door to his office close behind me. Walking away from his office I stopped at the basement door. Reaching into my pocket and pulling out that single shard of porcelain I'd kept all this time. I rubbed my finger over it and looked at the door. Please let me out. The voice of a woman came from behind the door. No pounding this time, just a soft and desperate voice of a woman. She had a southern accent, but it sounded far away, like if she was talking to me from a hallway. I didn't answer. All I did was place the shard of porcelain at the foot door and slowly pushed it underneath the crack. Turning and leaving for the day. I got home and hugged my mom. Just to thank whatever being is out there for giving me loving parents. The next day I still had Olivia in my mind, but I mostly resigned myself to just get through another day of work. Walking into the shop I saw King Creole standing at the counter. An amused look on his pale face. 
His smile only grew as I got closer. Good morning, sir. I said that look he was giving me, giving me a sharp chill up my spine. Travis, my boy. Did you try sneaking this underneath the door? He asked as sweetly as honey. Lifting up the shard of porcelain I had tried to sneak under the door. I audibly swallowed and nodded. I, I was just trying to. I, I don't know, I thought. I stammered, trying to give him the reasoning behind my apparent crime. Travis, Travis, Travis. He'd scared, walking out from behind the counter and walking close to me. He grabbed me by the collar and pulled me up close to him, his smile turning into a scowl that turned my blood into ice. Don't ever fucking give her anything. Am I understood? He growled, his yellow teeth sharpening as he spoke. I almost shit and pissed myself at his demeanor. I quickly nodded, shivering as hard as a human could. Yes, sir. I promise. I stuttered out. Breathing hard once he released me. His smile returning and his teeth going back to normal. Wonderful. Now you better clock in. I'm expecting a very fun appointment today. He hummed spinning around on his heels and walking to his office. Walking past the basement door and into his office and letting the door close behind him. Huffing hard, I walked to my rocking chair and sat myself down. Stabbing the doll in the head and rubbing my face hard. Last time I would ever try to even look at that basement door if that's how he reacted to my just returning something to it. Pulling my phone out, I used it to get my mind off what had just happened. Maybe an hour or two into my shift, my phone usage was interrupted by the front door flying open. The rusty bell nearly flew off from its place as the door swung open and shut afterward. I looked up and dropped my phone when I saw it was Olivia's mom. Although she looked a little dot dot paler. Her skin looked like Creole's skin. What the fuck did you give her? She shouted as she stumbled to the counter, hacking and coughing violently. Collapsing onto her knees just near me and looking up at me. Sending me flying back further from my chair. She had one eye dangling from its socket and the other one looked like it was made of milk chocolate and starting to melt. She clawed her nails into the counter and pulled herself up. Feeling around and grabbing my arm and pulling me close to her. I, I don't know man. I just work here. Was all I could offer the woman, trying to get away from her as her one eye fell out with a gross sounding plop. She recoiled and stumbled backward, gasping and coughing. White puffy stuff coming out of her mouth and falling to the floor. I knew what it was instantly. It was doll stuffing. Dot goodness. You're early. Creel's cheery voice came. I turned to see he was standing in his office door. He strode his way over to the woman and grabbed her by her hair, pulling it upwards so he could look into her eye sockets. Now dear. We can't have you losing your stuffing. He chuckled, producing some thread and a needle. Dot, what the fuck did you do to me? She shouted, shoving him away and trying to stumble away. Only for her leg to buckle underneath her, like a fucking accordion. Humans aren't meant to bend that way if you didn't know. Dot, dear me. You're changing much faster than I first thought you would. Creel chuckled, grabbing the woman again and yanking her up. I was in shock at all this, by this point, the woman's skin looked like one of the dolls we sell. That's when it clicked for me. She was turning into a doll dot sir. I spoke up, flinching when Creel slammed the woman onto my counter and started sewing her mouth shut, despite the woman's thrashing and quickly impinging appendages. He looked over to me with a quizzical look and smiled. Be a good boy and hold her down, Travis. He asked with a chuckle. Continuing to sew her mouth up. I looked to her and swallowed as I walked forward and quickly gripped her arms. Already feeling that there was not an ounce of bone left in them. All I could feel was doll stuffing. I closed my eyes as I held her down. I am not proud of this moment. When he was finished and finally allowed me to let go, King Creole gave her the finishing touches. Sewing buttons into her empty eye sockets and smiling as he wiped his gloved hands clean. Her present is all done. Just gotta wait for her to shrink. He chuckled, looking at me with an excited smile. I gave him a confused look, my eyes wandering down to the body. It was dead still and looking very much like she belonged in the morgue. The more I looked though, the more I realized that she was shrinking. Inch by inch. Well, at least I know where at least some of the voodoo dolls come from now. I was left in charge of the doll while I waited for this mystery guest of his. I already had an inkling who it was for, but with King Creole, you never know what to expect. I sat and watched as this fully grown woman shrank down to the size of a child, then a toddler. Then to the size of my forearm. And she was a doll, through and through. I lifted her up and looked at her, waggled her around, and finally left her on the counter. When the door opened again, the first thing I saw was a woman in a Victorian-style dress coming close to me. 
her hands clasped in front of her and looking at me with a warm and motherly smile. Good day, shopkeep. I do believe my daughter would like to speak with you. She asked in a soft British accent. I looked at her, my jaw hitting the floor. She was the doll. The doll that King Creole had given Olivia. As if to reinforce this point a tiny hand came up to pull on the big black dress. The woman looked down and smiled, leaning down and lifting up the thing the tiny arm was attached to. Where's Mr. King Creole? Olivia asked with her big old happy eyes. I looked at her and then at this woman who just yesterday had been a doll. Looking back at Olivia I opened my mouth to say something, but I was quickly cut off by Creel's office door opening, and the voodoo man smiled so much I thought he's bust a stitch. My darling, Olivia. How are you? He asked this like Olivia was a friend he hadn't seen in forever. E.T. his voice, Olivia smiled as wide as him, and the woman put her down. Letting her run up to my boss and giving his legs a hug. Thank you so much for my new mommy. She hummed, nuzzling her face into him. She chuckled and knelt down a bit, patting her head and motioning me to come over. I took the doll off the counter and came over. Getting on my knees with an old man grunt and handing the doll to Olivia. She gasped and happily accepted it. Wrapping her tiny arms around it and thanking Creole a million times. When all was said and done, Olivia said her goodbyes, and her new mother took her by the hand and led her out the door. This new mother turning around and waving goodbye to us and over to the voodoo dolls. Who all waved back. I do love happy endings. Creole sighed, taking his hat off and rubbing his messy black hair. Turning to me and raising a brow to my obvious uncomfortableness over the whole situation. Don't worry, son. She's in the best possible hands. He said, putting a hand on my shoulder. Sir. How come you didn't hurt her? I asked. Going back to all the times he'd caused horrible things to happen to anybody seemingly needing his help. He looked at me like I'd spoken Chinese at him. Son. My mama always said, help those that truly need it. Can you stand there and tell me she didn't need our help? He asked, patting my shoulder and heading over to his office. Leaving me with that train of thought for the rest of the day as I washed away all the blood left over from the old mother docking Creel is a strange man. He went from wanting to kill me for going near the basement door to hugging a child that he had saved from an abusive mother. I still deal with the back and forth of his personality. I don't think I will ever understand him. And I don't ever expect to. All I want to know is what is in the basement that causes him so much rage. You know the more I work here at all King Creel's half-priced voodoo shop, the more I start to question how the hell I never noticed it before. Now I'm ready to admit I'm no Einstein when it comes to this town. Sure I've lived here my whole life, but even then I'm still discovering new places. I didn't even know we had a Denny's near us until last week. But the fact that so many of our customers are high school kids makes me wonder how come I never heard of this place before. Then I look back at my track record of socializing in school and remember, oh yeah. That's why I never learned of this place. I think the reason I have to clean up so many messes here is that a majority of our customers are indeed stupid high school kids. They barge in here thinking they got away around King Creel's game. And every single time I'm the poor idiot that has to clean up their stupid mess. It's to the point where any time I see a teenager come into the shop, I instinctively reach behind the counter for some rubber gloves. Because I know I'll have to wipe what's left of them off the floor and walls. I think the worst case of this was when a group of four kids walked in. They were seniors and I'm pretty sure they were about to graduate. They came into the shop while I was busy actually getting to stock something for once. We had just had someone come in and buy a decent amount of voodoo dolls, so I was finally allowed to stock them. Using my old stool, I managed to just put them all in place when the bell rang and this group of kids came in. It was three girls and a guy who had his arm around the blonde girl. A couple I assumed. The other two girls seemed to have just tagged along for this ill-fated journey to my place of employment. The guy looked over to me and shot me that head movement all us guys make to each other. You know the one. Hey guys. I said, getting off my stool and heading to the counter. Sitting on my rocking chair and making sure all my cleaning supplies were in view. What can I do you for? I asked, realizing I was picking up on some of Creel's fancy southern talk. We heard there were wishes here. And since we're about to graduate we figure why not try them out. The guy said letting his girlfriend go and going over to the shelf of voodoo dolls. Getting in real clothes and looking at them all. The girls meanwhile didn't wander too far from him, since they no doubt were afraid of all the cobwebs around. Fair enough. Yup. Do all of you want one? I asked, dreading the answer I expected. 
The guy and his girlfriend nodded while only one of the other girls, a black-haired girl in a blouse responded as well with a nod. The last girl in her hoodie though just shook her head. Figured she just got dragged here. Travis. My dear boy, seems you've brought in quite the bit of customers. Creole Hunt. Walking over to me from seemingly nowhere, he does that a lot and smiling at the group of students. All of whom instantly backed up a couple of feet in shock at my boss's appearance. Wow. Freaky costume man. The guy said chuckling. Trying to keep up a brave face in front of his girl. But I could tell he was seconds from pissing himself. All the girls had the same expression. What can I do you for, Jacob? The boss man asked, looking at me. I was wondering why, until I realized my rocking chair was taking up space he needed to get to the counter. So I just easily backed up a bit and let him do his thing. Pulling out my phone, which had a dead battery. Instead, I decided to watch the inevitable horror that was about to come my way. Man, you're freaky as fuck. Jacob chuckled nervously, clearing his throat and coming forward with as much moxie as he could muster. Okay. I wish to get into my dream college. Full ride. So I don't have to pay for anything. He declared, confidently crossing his arms at King Creole. Had to hand it to him, that was a pretty airtight wish. I couldn't think of really any way for Creole to mess with that wish. Well until his girlfriend spoke up. What the fuck, Jacob? The girlfriend shouted, coming over to Jacob and pounding him with her fists over and over again. You're trying to find a way to leave me aren't you she shouted, grabbing him and thrashing him around. She seemed the clingy type. No you crazy bitch. I'm trying to secure my future. He shouted shoving her away and rolling his eyes as if this had been an ongoing issue. Me and Creole looked at each other and just shrugged. Wasn't our business to give these two couples therapy. Suddenly the girl pushed past her boyfriend and up to the counter, slamming her fists down on the dusty countertop and staring up with wild eyes to King Creole. I wish that Jacob will never leave my side. She shouted, causing Jacob to come over and grab her, pulling her away from us. Well, the king began, bringing a hand up and starting to rub his chin. My mama taught me that lady should go first. He smiled, shrugging, and snapping his fingers. Causing Jacob to stop in his tracks as he stopped thrashing around with his girlfriend. He looked at her with a new look in his eyes and started to kiss her. Now that's more like it. She giggled, wrapping her arms around him and making out in the shop. I rolled my eyes at this. Yes, I am horribly single, leave me alone. Although what happened next kind of helps me feel better about being single. She suddenly shouted in pain, trying to shove him off of her. For good reason, since he had gotten a thread and needle and was starting to stick it into both of their skins. I need to be closer to you. He shouted in a crazed tone. Starting to pick up speed as she screamed louder, trying to get away from him. Well, that went about as well as I expected it to go. He managed to pin her to the floor as he started to sew the two of them together. The two other girls were screaming and cowering together as they watched a scene. Dot, since Jacob appears to be preoccupied, Creole said with a chuckle, turning his attention to the two remaining girls. Would you ladies like to try your luck? He said with a smile, his fingers drumming on the counter as he waited. Dot, the black haired girl quickly looked at the hootie girl and shoved her away, backing up from everything and looking back at the door. I wish that I could live the rest of my life never seeing you again. She shouted, backing up and getting to the door. Creole shrugged and nodded to her. If that's what you wish for. He said, looking back at her and motioning for her to shoot with his hands. The girl nodded and turned, opening the door and running out at full speeds. Shame she didn't see that car that hit her seconds afterward. I flinched at just how sudden it happened. Like she was out of the shop and dead in a good 10 seconds. The last girl remaining was screaming her head off as she saw the girl hit by the car. And let's just say that Jacob and his girlfriend were closer than they were ever going to be. He and she were sewn together nice and tight. And bleeding everywhere. P please don't kill me. The girl mumbled, collapsing to the floor and shivering. Shaking her head and pulling her hoodie down. Revealing some nice long red hair. Looking over at her I did feel pretty bad. She seemed like the one who had been dragged here unwillingly by her friends. Dot, is it a wish, darling? My boss asked, stepping away from the counter and over to the sewn up bodies wriggling on the floor. Looking over at her she answered with a fast shake of her head, then what's your wish? He asked, poking at the sewn together couple with his finger. Showing some amusement from it. I don't want anything. She mumbled, curling up into the fetal position. Shaking violently and looking at me like I was going to come in and save her. Well, I get paid by this man. So I can't really offer much help. Shame. If that's the case then please leave my shop. I don't take kindly to loiterers. 
Ain't scared, the front door swinging open. The girl looked up quickly and then to the two of us. Cautiously standing up and walking out of the shop. Making sure to keep on the sidewalk as she started running away. Dot want me to clean up, sir. I asked Creole after an awkward silence. Looking over to me he smiled and chuckled. Dot if you wouldn't mind, son. He answered. Looking at the sewn couple and then over to the basement door. I could tell from his face he was trying to figure out a way of getting them down there. I meanwhile was already getting them up ready. Dot need help moving them. I asked him, as I sat the bucket down and started filling it with bleach and soap. A decent enough way to hide the blood, but if the cops ever shine that stuff that shows hidden blood splatters, this place would look like a cheap motel room. HM, I might. He'd scared, looking back over to the basement with a snare. Alright, help me move them to the door and leave them there. I'll head down there and he can just roll them down it when I say it's alright. He nodded at me dot in OT having much of a choice since I offered to help. I helped him pick them up and carry them close to the door. The girl gurgling something incoherent at me, since hers and Jacob's mouths had been sewn together. I assume it was a plea for help. Once they were down at the foot of the door, Creole unlocked it and opened it. I peeked from behind his shoulder to see if I could get a look. But nothing but blackness stared back at me dot right, looks like we can just kick them down there. Creole hummed, placing his dress shoe on the wriggling mass and shoving it down the stairs. The wet smacking and rolling were heard for a good solid 30 seconds. We waited, the door still open. Then we heard rapid crawling coming towards us. Before I could see the mysterious basement creature, Creole slammed the door closed and locked it tight. Well I said after a decent amount of silence. I'll start cleaning I said, backing away from Creole and heading back to my mop and bucket. Starting to wipe away all the evidence of our latest crime. When I looked back at the basement, King Creole was still standing there. He was looking at the basement with his usual anger. Before wordlessly just walking back over to his office. I let him go, continuing to do the part of the job I hated most. While I was busy mopping, contemplating if I really should have gone into college, the door opened up and I heard the familiar words of. Hands in the air I raised my hands up quickly, my mop hitting the floor, and I turned to look at who was holding me up this time. Turned out, it was a cop. Fuck. My arms straightened up quicker when I saw it was a cop this time, and not some idiot trying to rob us. Those thoughts of college were really starting to seem much more appealing. Dot turned around and step away from the mop and bucket. He ordered me. I did as I was told, heading over to the back wall. The cop closed a distance and slammed me against the wall. Slapping some cuffs on me and throwing me to the ground. Putting his gun in my back. Where's your boss? He asked me, grabbing my head up so I could answer him. Dot oh office over there. I motioned towards his office. With that, the officer let my head go, which slammed down into the wooden floor, giving me a good size bruise on my forehead. I rolled over to see what was going to happen. This was the first time I ever had a run in with the cops in this place. You. In there. Come out with your hands out. The officer shouted, gun trained on the door and waiting for anyone to comply with that order. I meanwhile strained to try and see what was going to happen. When suddenly my arms went limp and I was suddenly free of my cuffs. Pulling my hands out I looked down to see the voodoo doll template holding the cuffs. Turns out that thing doesn't hate me that much after all. Dot opening the door, Creole stared at the gun in his face and then over to the officer. His stitched mouth in a smile as he looked at the man. Rookie. Your sergeant should have told you that you're not allowed in here. He sighed, looking past him to look at me on the floor. And assaulting my employee. Shame on you. The voodoo man sighed, suddenly getting grabbed by the officer and tossed onto the floor, quickly dot keep your mouth shut you fucker. What did you do with the body? He shouted, putting his foot on Creole's back. I felt afraid for the officer. Handling King Creole like that in his own shop would not end well. And end well it did not. A second his foot was put on King Creole's back, every single voodoo doll on the wall came to life. Staring at the officer and jumping off their place on the wall hissing and screeching at him as they all rushed towards him. The officer looked at the sound of the noise and let out a shout as he tried shooting them. He got two shots off before they swarmed him. The best way I can describe what they did to him was piranhas eating a cow in the Amazon. They swarmed over him and ripped chunks of his flesh off his body. I never can stand, rude idiots. Creole hissed, angrily standing up and dusting himself off. Walking over the rapidly disintegrating cop body and coming over to me. Offering me a hand and pulling me back up. Sorry, you had to see that. He sighed dusting me off. His attention then turned towards the squad car waiting outside. His button eyes staring at the car and he made his way over to the door. 
stepping outside the shop for the first time since I started working here. I looked over at what was left of the officer. A bloody uniform and nothing else. In the split second I wasn't paying attention all the voodoo dolls had returned to the wall and now had some accessories with them. Some bones and skin pieces. My little template friend was back on the counter, still giving me the stink eye for probably not cleaning up. I was going to until a girl's scream caught my attention. Creole was dragging that redeep back into the shop. She was trying with all her might to keep from being dragged away. Her nails clawing at the wooden floor and spreading blood everywhere once her nails had been broken and destroyed. She cried and begged not to be hurt as she was dragged towards the basement door. This will show you not to misplace my good graces. Creole shouted, grabbing her by the hair when she caught the side of the counter and gripped it with all her might. Dragging her by the hair he got to the basement door. Opening it and dragging the Riti down into the depths. Creole didn't need to tell me to shut the door behind him. I went back to cleaning the bloody mess that was left behind. Stuffing the officer's uniform into a trash bag and set that aside as I mopped up every piece of blood I could see. I've gotten surprisingly good at this. Something about that girl's demise though didn't sit right with me. Out of everything he's done to people, hers was the one that rubbed me the wrong way the most. I know T like I can do anything about it. Cops are clearly out of the question, looking over to the basement door I sighed as I sat back at my rocking chair when all the cleaning was done. My eyes closing in exhaustion. I didn't get much time to rest, for Creel returned after nearly an hour and a half. Blood on his suit and pale face. I swallowed hard as he came over to me, staring at me with those blood spattered button eyes. Travis, my boy. You've been so very helpful these past few months that I think a raise is in order. He smiled, his yellow teeth back to being sharp fangs. How about $30 an hour? He hummed, tilting his head at me. I looked back at him with a bewildered look, quickly nodding without thinking. He smiled and rustled my messy brown hair and pulled out my pay for the week. Take tomorrow off. He ordered when I took my pay. I looked up at him and nodded quickly. No way in hell I was going to question him. Da packing up I unstuck my pin and took the officer's uniform in the trash bag and threw it away. Making my way home as I sighed hard. Rubbing my face as I thought about that poor girl dot being dragged into whatever hell awaited her down in that basement. Ever since the repeat incident, I was wary of going back to work. I've never really cared about the people who get what they ask for whenever they don't think a wish through. But she wasn't there for a wish. She didn't want anything. She was just there. Yeah, she brought a cop to the shop, but if I was her I'd do the same thing. Whatever happened to her down in the basement, she didn't deserve a dot and why day off was spent mostly in my room sulking. Just wrapped up in my blankets and contemplating the many horrible things I had done for King Creel. When my mom came in and knocked on my door. Travis. A couple of police officers are here looking for you. What the hell did you do? She asked in a confused and scared tone at the same time. As far as I know, she thinks I'm selling crack for all the money that I'm getting. I swallowed as I tossed my blankets away and made my way past her and down to the lobby of our house. Two officers were standing there and looking up at me. Travis, can we please talk to you outside? The older man said, brushing his graying hair back and placing his hat back on. I nodded wordlessly and looked back at my parents who were staring at me from the kitchen as I was led outside into the cold autumn afternoon. I put my hands in my hoodie pocket and looked up at the officers, my face betraying that I was nervous as all hell. Is this about King Creole? I asked after a prolonged silence. My eyes widened when the officers nodded. They looked around quickly before the older one took his hat off again and looked at me dead in the eyes. Tell him that we're so sorry for the trouble that one of the rookies caused him. We didn't have time to radio him and tell him to wait for backup. The man said in a quick nervous tone. My jaw fell to the floor at just how desperately this cop was apologizing to me. I can tell him tomorrow when I go back to work. I offered the man, who breathed a long hard sigh of relief and nodded quickly. Taking a notepad out and a pencil. Tell him the agreement with the department still stands and that we're so terribly sorry about what happened. He said, scribbling something on his notepad and ripping it out. Handing it to me I looked down at the note, which was basically just what he had just told me but in written form. I guess in case King Creole didn't believe me. Yeah, okay. I nodded, putting the page in my hoodie pocket and shaking both of their hands. Then wordlessly walking back into my house and walking past my parents who bombarded me with questions. I didn't answer them. Just going back to my room and collapsing back on top of my bed. 
pulling the covers back over myself and resigning myself to dealing with all this some other day. Making my way to work the next day, I sighed as I entered the familiar dusty shop, walking over to the counter and sticking my needle back into the template, looking back at the basement door which was eerily silent. Shaking my head and reaching into my pocket, I walked over to Creel's office and knocked three times. Standing back a bit and waiting for the boss man. Ichi didn't leave me waiting for too long, as he soon opened the door and smiled big and wide when he saw it was me. Travis. How was your day off? I missed you boy. He chuckled, coming fully out of his office and giving me a hug, which I half-heartedly gave back. It was fine, sir. Um, the police came and told me to give you this. I said, reaching into my pocket and handing him the handwritten note. He looked at it quizzically and took it from me. Looking down with his button eyes and that smile on his face growing wide enough to strain the stitches on his mouth. Oh, marvelous. I was beginning to think that they had forgotten about little Olmi. He chuckled, sticking the note into his suit and smiling at me. I do apologize again for you being roughed up as badly as you were, Travis. He'd scared, putting a hand around me and leading me back to my counter. It's fine, sir. It didn't hurt that badly. I said, rubbing the bruise on my forehead a bit. It only stung if I touched it really. Lucky for me my hair is long enough that I can hide it behind my bangs pays to never get a haircut sometimes. Good. Good. I do enjoy your company in the shop. Even your little friend was missing you. He chuckled, tapping the template doll on its head. I looked at it, and for once it wasn't giving me a stink eye. Glad I'm not such an ass to it after all. Keep up all the good work, son. Creel said, giving me a firm pat on the back and leaving me to run the front end, once again dot doing my usual ringing up of the odd customer. I was soon enough met with something that did make my day a little better. Olivia usually came back to the shop every Saturday with her new mother, so it's always a little ray of sunshine to see her so happy. My doll broke. She said with a sad little pout. Holding up the doll of what used to be her mom and showing that the arm had indeed come off. Can Mr. King Creole fix it? She asked sadly like this was the absolute end of the world. I looked up at her new mother who looked at me with this blank gaze. Well, I thought then it was blank. Now I think it was one of worry and pity. Dot I didn't even have to go get Creel when he threw open the door to his office and came over to Alvia, who ran to him and gave him a hug like he was her long lost father. He smiled and giggled with her as he took her doll in her hand, leading him to the office. Dot Are you aware of what awaits you? Olivia's new mother asked out of the blue, her soft British accent in a low and whispering tone. I looked at her with a confused look. Dot What do you mean? I asked her. Sitting up in my rocking chair and looking at the voodoo template. Taking it off the counter and placing it on the floor. Looking back at her for more information. She looked to the wall of voodoo dolls behind her and leaned in close to me. He's using you. You need to get out of here before it's too late. She said in a soft begging tone. Grabbing me by the hoodie strings and pulling me close. Get away. She begged, quickly letting go of me and doing a full 180 of emotions. A big happy smile on her face as Olivia came back with her doll all fixed up. Be more careful with her, darling. She's fragile. He instructed, giving Olivia a pat on her head and handing her back off to her new mother. Olivia nodded up to the voodoo man and took her mother's hand as she was let out of the store. Her mother looked back at me, and a sad look came to her face. After they were gone, I turned to King Creole and mustered all the non-existent strength I had. Sir, why did you hire me? I asked him. Quickly placing the template back on the counter and putting my hands on the dusty, surface.The question seemingly caught him off guard as he looked at me like I'd spoken to him in an alien language. He stared at me with those button eyes for a good long time. Long enough for me to grow uncomfortable. The same look he gave me when I asked him about the basement. I just needed an extra hand. Was all he said. Dotto. Uh, okay. I nodded quickly. Sinking away from his piercing gaze. It felt like every button eye was looking at me in the shop. It was a lifesaver when the front door opened and a customer walked in. Creole instantly turned into his usual happy self and happily granted the person's wish of curing their cancer. 
Shame about the heart attack they had right afterward. As Creole took a hold of the dead body, he dragged it towards the basement and opened the door behind him, grunting as he tried to get a better grip on the cadaver. I was about to offer help to him when a wide arm jutted from the darkness of the open basement and wrapped around his neck. Ah, you sneaky fucking whore. He shouted, slipping on the first step of the basement and tumbling backward into the darkness. I watched the whole thing in abject horror. The arm that had grabbed my boss was one of porcelain. I could tell this because of all the shards of it that had fallen off of it when the two of them went tumbling down. Standing up quickly, I looked down into the basement. An entire pile of porcelain shards waiting for me at the entrance of the door. Sir. I shouted down into the dark depths. Do you need any help? This was paycheck on the line man, this was serious. I didn't hear anything from him and I looked down into the dark depths. Swallowing the bile building in my throat, I pulled my phone out and turned on the flashlight and clenched my fist as I took my first step into the basement. It took me a whole 30 seconds to take my second step just out of fear for whatever was going to come towards me in the darkness. Sir. I shouted into the darkness again, taking a few more liberal steps before I froze again. I shone my flashlight deeply into the darkness and heard a fast scurry heading towards me. Oh fuck this. I shouted quickly, turning and booking it upstairs. I managed to get up there and put my hand on the door, flashlight still shining down into the dark dot what met me was a woman, body made completely out of porcelain crawling up the stairs at mock speeds towards me. She wore a dirty and tattered white dress, and she was missing one of her eyes. I didn't let her get far as I quickly slammed the door in her face and pushed my full weight up against the door dot let me out. She screamed, smashing her hands against the door. Cracking porcelain hurt as she smashed and beat against the door. Before he wakes up, please. She screamed, confirming to me that she'd subdued my boss. I closed my eyes and just kept my full weight against the door as she kept on banging. Dot, I can't. I have no choice. I screamed back, just keeping my eyes closed as she banged and pounded with futility. I didn't know who this creature was and I didn't want to know what was going to stop me from ending up like her. So I just kept against the door until she suddenly fell silent. I wasn't about to take my chances and just stayed against the door. Until a familiar voice came from behind the door. Open the door, Travis. Came the haggard and tired voice of my boss. I cautiously looked at the door and backed away from it. The knob turning and the figure of my boss coming out and slamming the door shut. Locking it with the key and pounding his fist into the door. Are you okay sir? I asked him, backing up to give him his space. He looked back at me, the stitches to his mouth torn open as he covered it with his hand. Nodding to me he pointed to something behind me. Looking I saw the template was holding a spool of thread and a needle. Nodding to him I walked over and gave it to him. Ichi he lifted his hand up and quickly started to sew up his mouth. A thick black liquid was dripping from his mouth as he sewed himself back up with expert precision. Finishing it up in under 30 seconds flat. I'm fine son. She just got the drop on me. He growled, tossing the spool back at me and working his lower jaw. He then turned his attention back to me and grabbed me by the throat, shoving me into the wall and giving me a firm squeeze of my throat. I told you never to fucking go down there. He snarled at me. I, I was w worried about you. I choked out, trying to pull him off of me, gagging and looking pleadingly at him. He gritted his teeth and dropped me, causing me to gag and choke for air as he walked away from me. I looked up as he walked away from me. Silently going into his office and slamming the door closed. Pulling myself up into my rocking chair, I breathed hard just trying to get my bearing. It took a good hour for me to finally pull my phone out and shakily look at it. What could I possibly do? The police obviously wouldn't help me if they came to me to apologize for them coming here. I had no one to answer anything for me. Except, I looked back at the basement door and walked over to it, stepping over the still dead customer. I'm sorry. I just I'm afraid of him. Do you know anything about him? Is there some way to stop him? I asked into the keyhole. Waiting to see if the porcelain woman was still there. I waited there, about to give up when a soft voice came back to me. Da Charles. She whispered softly. Charles Sumner. Was all she whispered. Going silent again and not responding again. I nodded a silent thanks to her and went to my counter. Pulling up my phone and starting my research. 
well, it turned out that the only thing I knew about Charles Sumner was that guy that got beat with a cane in the Senate before the Civil War. So I don't think the internet is going to help me there. I worked the rest of my shift and left without a word to King Creel. But instead of heading straight home, I went somewhere I hadn't been in years. The library. A wealth of knowledge. And the only place I could think that would have anything on my boss. Getting to the reference section one poured into everything and anything I could. Looking at the newspaper section. The headlines, deaths, famous people from my town, anything about Charles Sumner. And then, about an hour before they were about to close, I got a hit. Charles Sumner 1900-1925. He was a pretty famous pianist back in the day, and was even part of a band called the Sumner Orchestra. Other than that I didn't get too much about him, but it did lead me down a rabbit hole when I saw the only picture of him in the reference book. It was clearly my boss. King Creel in the flesh. No button eyes, no stitches, nothing, he was no doubt human in this picture. That was surprising. What surprised me most was the woman standing next to him in the picture, because that was the porcelain woman. She was famous enough to have a caption along with our boy Charles. Mary Simmons, a well-loved singer in the band. And according to the book, Charles's fiancé. I dropped the book when I saw that and stared in disbelief. She was his fiancé. What could she have done to deserve what she was getting? I needed to know more dot than all of the lights in the library cut out. I looked up quickly and nearly pissed myself. Grabbing my phone and turning the flashlight on. I clung to it tightly as I looked around quickly. I looked back at the book and, sorry about this library, ripped a photo out of it. Stuffing it into my hoodie and making a break for it. Until I found myself falling flat on my face. Looking down, my eyes went wide as I saw a couple of voodoo dolls at my feet, having tied my laces together while I was in the darkness. Dotto give me a break. I shouted at them, kicking them and quickly ditching my shoes as I made a run for it again. Getting to the front doors I pulled on them, to no avail. I was locked in. Why couldn't the internet have had this information? Now I was going to die in my least favorite place in this stupid town. And that was saying something. Looking around I had to find a way to escape. I had the idea to head to the fire escape. Looking around I soon made it to the nearest door and reached out to open it. Only for my arm to go completely limp on. I raised a brow at this before I lost control entirely of my body. Once again hitting the floor with a grunt and looking around in terror as I couldn't move. A million questions I asked were soon answered when a familiar voice came up behind me. You should have left well enough alone, Travis. Creel berated me from the darkness. The lights coming back on and revealing him standing right next to me. Holding a voodoo doll that looked exactly like me. He held it in a firm grip, a needle held right up to the doll's neck. I swallowed hard and looked up at him. Dot, I just wanted to know more about you. I shouted at him, the fear in my voice obvious. But he held a hand up to his mouth to hush me as he knelt down with a doll in his hand. Dot, use your inside voice, Travis. We're in a library. He chuckled, grabbing me by my hair and pulling me up by it. You want to learn more about me, huh? Want to know about what that whore did to me? He asked, his teeth growing sharp as he talked. Reaching into my pocket and pulling out the page I'd ripped from the book. He looked down at it with disgust at first, but also a sense of sadness. Please. Don't kill me. I whimpered, shivering, and trying to gain any kind of control back over my body. He looked at me, and then at the paper. Tossing it back at me and giggling like a little child. I'm not going to kill you, son. I need you for things. He said, grabbing me by the hair and pulling my head up to meet his button eyes. But after this little stunt you pulled, it looks like I'll have to put things in motion. He sighed, pulling me up to my feet and tossing the doll of me up and down. What do you mean? I asked him, again getting shushed by him. He patted my head and whispered something into the doll's ear. I suddenly got super drowsy and struggled to keep myself standing. Looking at Creole and finally I passed out. I woke up this morning and gasped. Looking around quickly to see where the hell I was. I was in my room. Had I dreamed of all that? The picture of Charles and Mary however was still in my hoodie pocket however, and that quickly dispelled any idea of a nightmare. I got up and went to the bathroom next to my room. And screamed. Because looking at my reflection in the mirror. Were two big black buttons. Where my eyes should have been. Look I don't know what he's doing to me. And I don't know how to stop it. I'm scared guys. I'm going to find out how to stop him before I end up like all the customers I've shit about. If I don't upload, assume I've failed. My skin is getting really pale as I finish this up, so I got to get a move on.
Wish me luck. Keeping the door closed on my parents as they attempted to learn why I screamed, I finally convinced them I had seen a giant spider and killed it. When I finally heard their footsteps walk away from the bathroom door I took another look at myself in the mirror. There was no doubt that my eyes were replaced by buttons. I couldn't blink, not that I really needed to. And I could see much better than I could before. This would have been nice if my eyes weren't fucking buttons. I was stuck. I had to learn more about Creole and learn how to defeat him before I turned into whatever the hell I was about to turn into. And I have to give it to you guys. Mentioning that I should find Olivia's new mother. Unfortunately for me, I had no fucking clue where she lived. I pulled on my hair trying to figure out where she could live. When I had an idea. All of the items that were on her original mother's body was sitting behind the counter at work. This included a cell phone and her wallet. Where her ID would be. Great, back into the lion's den. Suiting up in my hoodie and pulling the hood on quickly, I ran past my parents shouting that I was late for work and booked it outside. I hope I can see them again someday. Making my way to the shop I gathered all the courage I could and walked into the shop. And was immediately confused when I saw nobody there. The office door was closed and the basement door was locked shut as usual. Well, at least this part would be easy. Walking over to the counter I fished around in the container of people's things and soon found what I was looking for. Sophie, I said aloud, looking at the ID of Olivia's old mother, which contained her address. And it was within walking distance of here. Stuffing the ID in my pocket I quickly turned to leave and walked right into Creel standing behind me. You do look very distinguished with buttons. He cooed. Grabbing my face with his hands and pushing the hood off my head. Looking up at him, I shivered as he stared at me with a happy expression. You're looking quite pale these days. Are you sick, Travis? He asked fake concern plastered all over that pale face of his. Looking down at my hand I saw that it was quickly becoming the shade of white he was. What the fuck are you doing to me? I shouted at him, pounding on his chest and finally shoving him off of my face. Backing up from him and starting to head for the front door. I need a store clerk. You answered the advertisement, Travis. He said with a chuckle, picking up a voodoo doll of me from the counter. Pulling a needle from his pocket and holding it back up to the doll's neck. I froze and looked at him with gritted teeth. Looking behind him, I feigned concern. Making it look like Mary had broken free from the basement. He fell for it and looked back at the basement door. He did so long enough for me to chuck Sophie's cell phone which I had kept right into his head. Knocking his hat off and staggering him for a bit. Turning I quickly fled out of the shop and started booking it towards the direction of Olivia's house. I was hoping that the voodoo doll had a limited range on me, and luckily I think it did. As nothing happened to me as I ran to the neighborhood. Panting and out of breath, I looked around to try and find the correct house. Soon enough managing to find it and stumbling my way to the door. Knocking on it hard. You work with Mr. King Creel. Olivia gasped when she opened the door for me. A look of confusion on her face when she saw me with button eyes and pale skin. Can I get button eyes too? I need to talk to your mommy. I said through exhausted panting. No wonder I almost failed PE all those times in high school. She nodded and let me into the house. I looked around and saw that every single picture in the house was of Olivia and her new mother. Not a single one of Sophie existed. Damn is he good. Oh dear god came the soft and concerned British voice of Olivia's new mother. I looked up at her and stumbled to her, grabbing her by the collar of her poofy black dress and shaking her. The desperation clear on my face. Help me. How do I stop this? I screamed, begging the woman to help me in any way she could. I did not want to end up like Sophie or all those other people that Creole had killed. I know his real name, and I know who's trapped in the basement. Please, tell me how to save myself. I shouted again. I, I do not know. If I speak ill of him I may. She looked over to Olivia who was playing in the living room. Oblivious to us and in her own little world. She turned back to me and bit her lips. Go to this address. She said quickly, pulling out a notepad and scribbling on it. Please tell me it isn't far. I begged. Having to run here had really wiped me out. It is, I am afraid. But it is the only place that may help you. She said, tearing off the sheet of paper and handing it to me. I looked down at it and raised my brow. Isn't this right near the shop? Won't he know? 
I asked her, wondering if she was sending me on a suicide mission. But she shook her head and kept her hands together around the notepad. He does not go there anymore. You should be safe. She said, then her face twisting into fear as she covered her mouth with her hands. The notepad fell to the floor as she backed away from me. I shivered as she did so, scared at what she could have seen. Why are you blushing, mister? Olivia asked me, her attention now on me and tilting her head in confusion. Was I blushing? I didn't feel hot enough for that. I pulled my phone out and looked at myself in the camera. And my heart sank in an instant. My cheeks were painted red. Like a puppet's. I turned and ran out of the house, adrenaline up and completely in panic mode. He was turning me into a puppet. And if I didn't stop him soon, it was going to be over for me quickly. I had to find out more about him and maybe find a way to stop this in the process. Slowing down after a while, I made my way back towards the shop. But instead of making my usual left turn towards it, I continued forward and ended up at a decrepit old building. Just like the voodoo shop. They really need to fix up this part of town. The faded old letter read out library only I had never seen nor heard of this library ever. Although considering how it looked, I could kinda see why. Sighing and walking in with my head held high I walked up to the doors. And found them completely sealed behind wooden boards. Luckily enough for me though there was a broken window right nearby. So I entered the building and began my search. I headed for the reference section where I found much more information detailing things about Charles Sumner. And let's just say it's a tale alright. Charles Sumner was born into a poor family. His dad dying of cholera and his mother having to raise him on her own. Luckily for the two of them, Charles's mother was a voodoo witch doctor and very well loved by the community. Charles meanwhile became a piano prodigy at the age of seven. He would go on to make a career of it and soon enough by the time he was age 18 he was in his own band. Now he wasn't a millionaire or anything, but it seemed like he was well off. And that's where Mary Simmons was the vocalist for Charles and his fiancée. Well nice, this information didn't help me at all, and I was about to give up completely and just burn down the whole shop, when I suddenly turned to the last page the reference book I was reading had on Charles, when in big black letters, a headline was shown from a newspaper. Charles Sumner missing. Intrigued I read as best I could the old and decaying page of the book. Charles had gone out with his bandmates and had never returned home. I looked around and tried to find any other information. On Charles, Mary, anybody. And then I found a dot Mary Simmons and six others go missing. I read aloud when I found an ancient newspaper article about it. I looked up when I heard footsteps outside, but it was just some crackheads mumbling to each other. I went back to the paper and read it as best I could. Mary had gone missing about four months after Charles did. I struck my chin at that and looked back at the other books I had thrown around everywhere. His mother. I mumbled to myself going on a hunch and trying to find a book or something on her, if she was so beloved by the community. And I did. Although she retreated from public life after the disappearance of Charles, I did manage to find one interview she gave before then. She blamed Mary for the missing Charles. More importantly, the missing $10,000 he had won in a contest the night he went out. Gotcha, I said aloud. Closing that book and trying to use my mind to piece some things together. Having a good read, son. Creole asked me, sending me flinching into the bookshelf and staring at him as he sat up above me on the bookshelf across from me. A really good one, Charles. I shot back at him. The smile on his face disappeared when I called him that. He growled at me and hopped down to my level, grabbing me by the collar again and slamming me harder into the bookshelf. Don't call me that. He snarled, lifting up his fist to beat me, only for me to headbutt him and grab a book from the floor striking my boss in the face with it and pushing him over. He tripped and fell to the floor, but stared back at me with anger in those buttons of his. What did Mary do? Why did you keep her trapped in the basement? I demanded to know, lifting the book over my head to hit him again. He looked at me with sharpened teeth and got up to his feet, fixing his tie and looking at me like I was a worm that he had just stepped on. Grabbing me by my collar again he stared into my button eyes with his own. That whore deserves everything I give to her. He snarled, his teeth again growing sharp. In a pure rush of adrenaline, I grabbed his mouth by the stitches and yanked as hard as I could. I managed to rip out the entire length of his suture, causing him to drop me and stumble backward. Gagging and coughing her looked at me with that black ooze dripping out of his mouth much quicker than it did before. Acting quickly I ran at him and pushed him over with all my weight. 
Fishing inside of his coat pockets as we both stumbled to the floor I managed to pull out the two items I knew he needed. His spool of black thread. And the key to the basement. Thanks, Charles. I shouted with his chuckle, standing and booking it towards the library entrance. No pun intended there surprisingly. I heard him scream and shout at me, but when I looked back he was struggling to stand up. Clearly ripping those threads out of his mouth did something to him. Good thinking adrenaline fueled me. Making it out through the window I had gone in through I sighed hard as I looked down at my arms. Still pale as him, but they had stopped at my elbows, meaning I had bought myself some time from all that. Sighing hard I now knew what I had to do. I was going in the basement. Armed with the key and the rusty pipe I stole from the outside of the library, I started walking towards all King Creels. A million things were going through my mind at that moment. Thoughts about Charles, what had happened to him. And what was going to happen to me. Opening the door to the shop everything was dead silent. Even the rusty bell was much quieter than it usually was. Looking to the wall of voodoo dolls I saw that they were all starting to rot and fall off the shelves. I must have really weakened him. Renewed by this, I strode towards the basement and stopped. His office. I looked over to it and changed my course to look through it. Maybe there was something in there. Going into the clean office I saw most of what I had seen the first time. A tidy office and scratched out pictures. Only this time I paid attention to the pictures. Seeing that indeed, these were of Charles and Mary. Opening up his office desk I didn't find much of anything. Countless buttons and threads. As well as several pairs of gloves. About to leave I saw on his desk a picture that wasn't completely scratched out stood prominently. A picture of a young Charles Sumner and his mother. Mother Creel. Looking out of the office and towards the basement door, I knew that all my answers would come from down there. Walking over there I finally inserted the key and turned it, opening the door and staring down into the depths. Taking my phone out and turning on the flashlight I made my way down there. The rickety old wooden steps creaked with every one of my footsteps. I looked to the ceiling and to the floor as I made my way down. Passing several bones and articles of clothing on my way down I finally touched solid ground. I was in the basement after all this time. And it was as freaky and gross as I'm sure you guys imagined. Decaying and rotting bodies laid everywhere, some hung up by strings like puppets and others clearly having been chewed on by something. And that something soon caught my attention. The sound of crunching porcelain turned my attention to the corner of the room where Mary sat looking up at me in horror. He's gotten to you too. She whimpered softly, curling up into the fetal position. I made my way over to her, phone trained on her cracked and broken body. I kept my pipe in my hand just in case she got any ideas. What happened to him? Obviously, he didn't just wake up like that, as I did. I demanded to know. Keeping a distance from her and waiting for the answer. She curled up tighter. Obviously not wanting to spill her beans. But finally, she spoke up. I cheated on him. She mumbled. Looking up at me with the one eye she had. Her face was cracked and her right eye was missing but the other shone off the flashlight I had trained on her. He was a nice guy, and when he asked me to marry him I cave. But I was already seeing someone else. A mobster. She mumbled softly. And you wanted to make him disappear and steal that $10,000? I asked. Sort of siding with Creole Charles on this one. No. That wasn't the plan at all. I told Henry that I just wanted him to get scared and leave town. Henry and his goons took it too far. She said quickly, looking at me and lunging out. Grabbing me and shaking me quickly back and forth. I didn't tell them to torture him. Wait, torture? I asked quickly, shoving the porcelain doll off me. Holding my pipe up to get her back from me. She looked fragile, but something had to be chewing on all these corpses down here. And she was the only living thing down here. Why yes. Those stupid idiots, she mumbled, starting to cry and looking up at me holding her two hands up and rubbing her messy hair around. They, they tortured him, beat him, ripped the eyes out of his head and cut his head off when it was all said and done. She explained, looking up at me for some kind of sympathy. What? You were just gonna fuck him up and steal his money. I don't believe you for a second. He's done horrible things to people, but if you caused that to happen to him, you're no better than him. I said with a huff. It didn't make sense, the way she put it at least. What? But, she began, obviously trying to fix her lie. But she gave up and sighed, rubbing her cracked face and nodding behind her hands. Looking back up at me with an exhausted face. Fine. 
I wanted to get rid of him. But I wasn't strong enough to just come out and say I didn't love him anymore. He spent every single moment of his time playing gigs which I had to sing in. And I hated it. I hated all of that. So when Henry came and swept me off my feet I decided to be selfish for once in my life. She shouted back at me, stumbling to her feet and staring at me with daggers in her single eye. Guess you didn't expect him to come back as a vengeful voodoo ghost. I snickered. Backing up from her and heading back towards the stairs. She followed me, the anger still obvious on her face. If Henry hadn't done such a shit job hiding his body, his mother wouldn't have discovered it and turned him into that freak. She mumbled, turning and looking around the wall she must have looked at for almost a hundred years now. Now I'm nothing but his punching bag. She sighed, looking back at me with a hopeless expression. He fixes me, then breaks me over and over again. She despaired. I'm sorry Mary. I really am. But at the same time, you aren't some innocent victim. I responded, looking down at my phone when it vibrated. An unknown number. Although I knew exactly who it was. No. I said softly. Sorry, Travis my boy. Your luck's run out. The familiar voice said to me. Before something struck me on my head and I lost all control of my body. Flopping to the floor and passing out. His nice dress shoes coming into view just as I lost conscience. Wakey, wakey son. Creole hummed, smacking me hard in the face with a glove. Snapping me awake and looking around. Instantly trying to move, but finding myself stuck and trapped. I looked around and saw I was still in the basement. Only I was tied to a table. You gonna cut me in half? I asked, groaning at the stinging pain in my head. Looking at him and realizing that he had lost an eye. Then seeing he'd used a thread from that eye to sew his mouth back up. Unfortunately not. I do need you to be somewhat intact. He sighed, walking over to me and tapping my nose. Smiling as he pulled away. No, Travis my boy. I do in fact need you alive. Well, sort of. He chuckled, slamming a heavy bag onto the table, on top of my leg causing me to cry out in pain. Charles, please. He doesn't deserve this. Mary's soft boy spoke up, causing Creole to stop his searching in the bag and looking off into a direction I couldn't focus on. Grabbing the pipe I had equipped myself with he walked out of my field of view. Although the sound of breaking porcelain was more than enough for me to understand what he was doing to her. Sorry about that. He returned with a chuckle. Dropping the pipe on the floor and searching through the bag once again. Smiling nice and wide when he finally found the item he was searching for. Pulling out an ancient drill, the kind you need to crank to be able to use. W what are you going to do to me? I asked him, pulling on my restraints hard and trying to escape the restraints that had me firmly down on the table. He looked at me with a wide and happy smile as he placed a drill on my exposed palm. I need a permanent employee. Someone who can work hard and never ever take breaks or refuse an order. If I had been a good little boy and just followed my orders, I wouldn't have had to do this step. But, you just had to start snooping. Didn't you? He sighed, starting to drill into my hand. I'm not ashamed to say I screamed. I screamed and begged. I thrashed and tried every way possible to try and escape. It wasn't so bad with the second hand, I think I was passing out from blood loss by that point. The feat lucky enough for me was a walk in the park compared to the drill into my hands. As I struggled to stay conscious I saw that he had begun to tie thick pieces of string into the holes of my hands and feet. You'll make a fine addition to the crew, Travis. You practically look the part. He giggled, his voice distorted as I slipped in and out of consciousness. Although the feeling of something sharp and cold on my throat brought me back to reality. He had a hacksaw over my throat. What? I sputtered out. My voice lured from blood loss. Trying to protest, but too weak to move at all. Sorry, son. This is the only way to grant you immortality. Lucky enough for me, my head was still intact enough for my mama to bring me back to life. So you'll be nice and easy. Just a quick dip in that solution I have whipped up. And you'll be a new man. He chuckled, pressing the hacksaw hard on my throat and starting to saw into me. The first few goes were on a scale of pain you could never imagine. But by the time he cut into my spinal cord, I was already dead. Wakey, wakey son. You've got to stop falling asleep on me. Creole's soft and loving voice spoke to me as I regained my consciousness. I looked around and saw that I was sitting up on the table. I looked down at myself, startled when I saw I was in my own black suit. My tie was red unlike Creole's purple. 
I'm alive, I ask, looking over to him and touching my throat, finding a long row of stitches all across my throat like his. Yes, into these some. He chuckled, smacking my back and pulling my attention over to a large black cauldron nearby. Mama's old recipe. A quick dip of your head in there and you can kiss mortality goodbye. He chuckled, pulling me to my feet and helping me stand straight. I shivered at the thought that I had been dead. But even more so, when I looked down at the strings tied to my hands and feet. What am I? I asked him, looking over at him and wanting to cry. Despite my clear lack of eyes. He looked back at me with a big yellow smile. Pulling me close with his arm around my neck. You're my store clerk son. And my own personal puppet. He chuckled, lifting up a mirror and showing me myself. I did start crying then, even if no tears came back. My face was pale, and the red cheeks bright and vibrant. My normally messy hair was nice and combed downward. Now you're going to work with me here. Forever. He chuckled, stepping back and smiling as he motioned for me to go up the stairs. I looked up at the stairs and refused to take a single step. Until the string tied around me went tight and some unseen force began to force me upstairs. I tried to fight it. I tried so hard. I tried running out the door. Running far away. Into the arms of my parents so I could wake up from this nightmare. But I had no such luck. That force made me go to my counter and stand there. Just stand there unable to move. I just want to go home. I mumbled, still crying, as Creole made his way back upstairs. Looking my way with a smile and a chuckle. Now, Travis. We can't have a sad store clerk. Let's fix that. He'd scared. Snapping his fingers and smiling at me. Of course not, King Creole, sir. I said happily. Saluting him and smiling back at him. My mouth and body may have said that. But my mind was screaming and wanting to strangle him with the strings keeping me held upright. boy, Creel hummed, clapping his gloved hands together and heading into his office. Leaving me standing there with no way to sit down or do anything. Just stand there and smile like a fucking idiot. I can only control myself at night when he locks the shop and spends all his time down in the basement. I'm allowed to sit and do whatever I want. But the second I approach the door my invisible handler forces me back to my post. This is my life now. The puppet in King Creel's sick little games. All I can do is smile and thank you for coming in. I can't scream for help or anything. I'm trapped here. And I can't find any way out. Help me. Please help me. And make sure to visit all King Creel's half-priced voodoo shop. We have everything you could ever want. King Creel is a lovely boss and is more than happy to grant any wish you could ever want. And I'm more than happy to clean up anything that you leave behind. Welcome back to all King Creel's half-priced voodoo shop. Fuck, now I'm even starting to type this shit out now. Hey guys. It's me. Travis. Still alive unfortunately and losing my sanity little by little every day. I know you guys probably have a lot of questions as to how the hell I'm even able to talk to you guys right now. And I promise I'll get into that. As painful as it is to talk about. But if you're new here, then allow me to introduce myself. My name is Travis. I work here at All King Creel's half-priced voodoo shop, and because of my own stupidity, I've ended up becoming a human puppet for my boss, King Creel. And when I mean puppet, I do mean puppet. I'm suspended by strings from the ceiling, and my face is white as chalk, and I've got stupid red cheeks painted on. During work hours my mind is sort of disconnected from my body. My body and mouth say things that my mind doesn't want to say. I'm basically the most disgusting thing in history. An overly cheery store clerk. Sometimes I want to punch myself with how sick and disgusting I sound. Being a stupid puppet for my boss. The only time I get to take back control of myself is when the shop is closed. Although whenever I try to leave through the doors I'm quickly taken over again and forced back to my post at the counter. And yes. I have tried to end it all. Whatever force is pulling on the strings attached to my body forces myself to end any attempt on my own life. So, I'm stuck here being the boss's puppet. How's it? 
Some of you ask if my parents ever came looking for me. And yes, they did. A couple of days after I was turned into a puppet I was standing at my counter. A stupid smile plastered on my face as I looked around with my button eyes. Quickly I stood stick straight when King Creel came out of his office. His stitched up mouth was turned up into a smile as he approached me. How are you doing, Travis my boy? He asked me with a chuckle. Giving me a hard pat on the back. I turned my head to him and just smiled nice and wide back at him. I'm doing fantastic, sir. I said happily. While internally I was screaming every curse word I knew at him. Wishing I could rip his stupid head off his shoulders and punt it down the basement with Mary. He chuckled and nodded at me. Say. I need you to go into the basement for just a second. I left something down there when I was tending to Mary. Could you be a dear and go get it? He asked me, standing back and offering me the key to the basement. Reaching out and taking it and giving him a little salute. Sure thing, sir. I hummed. Walking over to the basement and opening it. While my body readily gave in to his orders, in my head I thought of why the hell he was sending me down here. Nothing was important enough for me to go down here. And I got my answer the second I closed the door behind me. The rusty bell rang at the door, and I heard the sound of a couple of people coming in. And I heard the voice of my mother. Are you King Creole? She asked. Her tone was one of sorrow and insecurity. I turned on my heels quickly, staring back at the door. My mother was here. I reached out towards the door but found myself unable to close the small distance to touch the knob. I wanted to force myself to stretch my stupid hands just a couple of inches closer. But I couldn't. Why yes, I am ma'am. Creole chuckled. The sound of my rocking chair squeaking as he was no doubt sitting in it and rocking in it. What can I do you for? He asked my mother. Our son went missing a few days ago. And we were wondering if you've seen him anywhere. My father spoke up. His heavy voice was also heavily covered in sadness and worry. I was just a couple of feet away from them, and I couldn't do anything to draw attention to myself. I opened my mouth to try and scream. But nothing came out of my throat, but a long soft wheeze. Well, he was here the last day I had him scheduled to work. He left and that was the last I ever saw of him. Creole lied through his teeth. A tone of concern on those stitched up lips of his. I truly don't know where he is. He explained. We understand. If you see or hear from him. Please give us a call. My dad said to the man who was torturing me. A sheet of paper being heard from the other side of the door. And the sound of my mom crying softly. I was alive. I was right here. Open the fucking basement door. I sure will. He's a fine young lad. I do hope he turns up. Creole said to my parents. Soon their footsteps grew faint and the front door opened and closed. That rusty bell jangling and signaling the last I ever saw of my parents. Finally able to move again, I clawed at the basement door and opened it up. Oh, Travis. You just missed you mama and pops. Such nice people, worrying about their son. He chuckled when he saw my standing at the basement door. Holding up a missing person's flyer at me. Showing my old face. Before my button eyes, pale skin painted cheeks, and my severed head getting stitched back on. Oh, that's too bad. I said in my happy tone. My mind practically screaming and begging to be let out of this prison. Is this what someone in a coma feels like? Or people who get trapped in their bodies and are unable to move? I'm sure they'd love to see you. Who knows? Maybe I'll pay them a visit one day. If you ever misbehave. After all, I know where they live now. He giggled, holding out the flyer of my past self, and showing that my address was plastered onto it. You fucking monster. You won't have to worry about that at all, sir. I said, crossing my heart against my will towards him. I would never do something that stupid. I nodded, smiling as I was forced to turn back around and head down to the basement. Creole's giggles filling my ears as I descended into the dark depths. 
Finally arriving down into the basement I looked around for whatever the hell it was that he had left down here. While I was down there I saw the voodoo king's old fiancé and murderer, Mary. The living human porcelain doll who was currently busy chewing on the rotting corpse of one of the dead customers. She stopped and looked at me, pulling away with a large grey slice of meat in her mouth. Travis. What are you doing down here? She asked, quickly swallowing the meat in her mouth. Normally I'd be gagging and throwing up all over myself. But my body didn't react at all to that. Plus I'm always wearing a nice suit, and getting vomit off of this would be a bitch. Daddy sent me down here for something. I sighed. Finally having some control over myself as I walked over to her. Looking at her and then at the corpse she was munching on. I won't blame her for that. A girl's gotta eat you know. Oh, he must want his cane. She sighed, pointing over to the item laying on the floor near some cracked and broken porcelain. I nodded and walked over to the item. Picking it up and looking at the item. It was a simple one made of some black wood with a white orb handle. I'm guessing he beat you with it. I asked her, looking over to her and staring with my button eyes. Finding myself hitting the orb against my palm. Yeah. She said simply, turning back to her chewing and ripping another chunk out of the decaying body. I looked at her and then down at the cane. Sighing and trying to wrap my head around how the hell my life had gotten to this point. Should have fucking gone to college. Leaving Mary to her cannibalism I started the path up the stairs. Getting up there I handed the item to Creole and he smiled at me. Thank you, son. He hummed taking it and looking down at it. Anything for you, sir. I said with a smile. Shivering internally when his head jerked up to look at me with a quizzical look. Anything, huh? He asked me with a hum. Strucking his chin and standing up quickly putting both of his hands on my shoulders and giving them a hard squeeze. Like, killing your parents for me. He asked me in a low growl. I froze. I couldn't. There was no way in hell I was going to do that. I opened my mouth to no doubt agree to him like the stupid doormat I had become. But instead, I grabbed him by the head and smashed my own into his. Sending him sputtering backward. Oh, still have some fight in ya, huh? He asked me with a chuckle, holding up the cane and bringing it down on my head. Sending me stumbling to the floor like a doll. Because I am one. He raised it up to deliver another one to me when the door again opened and we both looked towards it. Is this a bad time? The customer asked. A girl wearing an oversized hoodie asked us. Creole looked down at me and then at her. Placing the cane on the floor and walking over to her. The cane tapping along as he went over to her. Sorry, dear. What can I do for you? He asked with a hum. I, meanwhile, was forced back up by the strings and standing up nice and straight for our customer. Brushing myself off and heading back to the counter to stand there like the animatronic I basically was. Uh, you grand wish is right. Can you get a guy to like me? She asked shyly. Creole chuckled and nodded slowly. Wrapping an arm around her and pushing her over to the counter. Travis. Be a dear and get Ms. Liz here the love potion. He asked of me with a giggle. Nodding to me. I quickly nodded back and reached out to give the woman the asked for the potion. God, I wish I could have talked her out of it. The love potion is probably the worst potion we sell here. Especially if you're as vague as this girl was about it. She took it and looked at the vial it came in. Looking at Creole dubiously and reading the back of the bottle. Smart girl. Nodding to herself she opened it and quickly drank it. Gagging at the taste but swallowing it all. She stood there for a bit recovering and soon her phone went berserk. It vibrated like crazy and she pulled it out quickly. A smile spreading on her face when she saw it was from the guy she loved. She thanked the two of us and ran off. Putting the phone to her ear and chuckling as she left the shop. The poor girl had no idea what she was getting into. Every single time someone uses the love potion the person they love ends up killing them and doing weird shit to their body. Saying that they love them so much they wanted to keep them always. Yeah, making a creepy human statue out of their body is totally showing love. 
Creole must want to marry me after what he did with me. Let's see what'll happen to her. She'll probably come running back here in no time. I'll keep you guys posted if she does end up back here. Creole must have been in a good mood because he didn't end up beating me again. Just going off to the office and closing the door. Leaving me to stand there at my post. He doesn't go anywhere at night if you guys are wondering. He just stays in the office until the shop opens up again. But that gives me a chance to rest, curled up under the desk. No reason other than to cry. Well, my button eyes don't really produce tears, but my body does everything else that crying entails. I don't know how to get away from him. But there has to be a way. If I can smash my face into his, there has to be a way to be able to break the spell he has on me. I'll get out of here. And I'll rip his head off. I swear I will. And do be sure to check us out. King Creole has been talking about getting more employees. Hope to see some of you here. You know what I miss the most ever since becoming a puppet? Using the bathroom. As weird as it sounds, having at least some kind of privacy inside a room with a toilet for me to sit down. I've never taken something for granted so hard as being able to sit down from my own free will. The stupid strings keeping me suspended and forced to stand up straight make me long for the days of being able to sit down by myself. King Creel has been treating me worse than usual lately. I don't know if I did something or he's still mad about me smashing my face into his, but now every day before we lock up shop, he puts his arm around me and invites me down into the basement. Since I was so curious about it, he drags me down there and forces me to stand there and watch while he uses all types of things to beat Mary with. Look I may have thought before that she deserved whatever she was getting from Creole, but seeing it day after day, it's starting to make me afraid for myself. What happens when he starts treating me like her? She's porcelain and to some extent, she's grown numb to everything. She just takes it waiting for it to be over. Me on the other hand, I'm human. Or I guess my body is pretty much human. And I've seen what Creole does to humans that piss him off. One day before lockup, I was doing my usual standing at the counter, wondering of ways to end my eternal suffering. When the bell at the shop door clang. Bringing my button eyes over to the person who had just wandered into our lovely shop. He was a hevisa guy. Tall and bundled up in a jacket since it was so cold. He looked at me with about as much discomfort I usually had towards myself whenever I catch a glimpse of myself in a mirror. Hello, sir. And welcome to All King Creole's half-priced voodoo shop. I sang in my stupid greeting voice. All the while subconsciously I was telling this guy to stick a knife in my heart and end me. Not too different from when I was human working here, now that I think about it. Yeah, whatever you freak. Is your boss here? I'm told he can make problems disappear. The guy said, looking around the shop and sneering at all our items. And probably all the cobwebs everywhere. Although I've never seen a spider here, and I live at the shop now so I have no idea how they show up here. He sure can. I'll go fetch him right away. I said cheerily. The strings attached to me forced me to walk over to the office and tap it lightly to a little tune. God, I wanted so badly to just smash my face into the wall when I was forced to act like this. Oh, sir. We have a customer looking for you. I said happily. Stepping back when the door flung open. Creole smiled with his stitches on his mouth, giving a nice creaking sound as they threatened to snap. He waltzed over, patting my combed hair like I was a dog, and heading to the counter to meet with this man that had wandered into our shop. What can I do for you, Paul? He asked with a cheery laugh. His gloved fingers drummed on the counter as he looked at the man and waited for an answer. The man gave the same look to Creole he gave me before shrugging and handing him a business card to the voodoo boss man. My body pat says that you can make problems go away. He said, crossing his arms that rested on his beer gut and waiting for Creole to respond. He seemed shifty, like the kind of guy you see on wanted posters or the kind you look out for if you belong to the neighborhood watch. Ah, of course. What is the nature of your problem? I do hope it is easier to solve than Patrick's was. Quite a mess he got himself into. My boss scared, looking over to me and motioning me to come over. The strings yanking me over there since I really had no choice but to obey him.
I need to lay low for a couple of days. Feds are on my ass about some sexual assault allegations. Paul explained. Figures really, he does look like the type to be involved in something as disgusting as that. Creole nodded, the drumming of his fingers stopping once Paul finished. Well, I can offer you my basement. But it is becoming quite full down there. My boss thought aloud. Holding his chin as he thought aloud. His button eyes scanned this man, but soon the smile he always had plastered on his face went away. And a look of disgust came across it. On second thought. I can squeeze you in. He chuckled, walking past me and patting me on the shoulder as he led the man to the basement door. Travis. Be a good boy and close up shop for the night. He said to me as he unlocked the basement and allowed Paul to enter first. I looked at him and quickly nodded. Being dragged over to the door I flipped the sign to say we were closed and locked the door. Turning my attention back to the basement door and realizing I had regained control of my body. I took that glorious opportunity to stretch as I've never done before. God the feeling of my popping joints feels incredible now. Taking this slim window of opportunity I walked into the boss's empty office. Looking around for anything to aid me in my current predicament. I didn't have much luck since once again the only item King Creel has in his office seems to be sewing supplies. And I don't think any of that is going to help me here. My attention turned from his office to the basement when I heard Paul start to scream. Along with hard smacks and the sound of something wooden breaking. Travis. Get down here boy. Creel's voice ordered me. Forcing my body to stand up perfectly straight and forcing me down the basement. The best way I can describe the feeling is sleep paralysis. Being unable to move at all while freaking the fuck out. Walking down into the basement and reaching the end, I almost wanted to do a 180 and start walking back up the stairs. Paul was being hung by a meat hook from the wall, and Creel was slowly sharpening a knife on a nearby whetstone. His look was one of anger until he saw me, and that scowl flipped into a big wide smile. There you are, boy. Hello, sir. What are you doing with the customer? I asked, surprisingly for once being able to agree with whatever my mouth said. Creole chuckled as he walked over to me and grabbed me by my combed hair, striking the now extremely sharp knife against my stitched up neck. I backed up a bit, but he pulled me back into it. Why, I'm making the problem disappear. He said with a soft low hum. Pulling away and coming over to Paul who had his mouth tightly sewn up and just able to mumble and thrash about on the meat hook. Creole approached the man and placed a knife on his stomach and dug it deep into him. Causing a silent scream from the man. I'm sure you're giving him the swift justice he deserves, sir. I said, clapping my hands and smiling at him like the kisses he had turned me into. Now I've got a pretty in-depth understanding of how Creole's morality works. He'll never harm a child, but will harm their parents if he deems it worthy of his intervention. Anybody coming into the store and asking for a wish is instantly damned for being selfish. No matter the wish. And he absolutely despises molesters and rapists. Guess this guy filled one of those categories. My attention was turned from the torture in front of me to Mary. Who motioned for me to come over. I looked over to Creel and was able to force my body to walk over to the porcelain woman. Looking down at her as she struggled to keep herself up. Her legs having been broken into shards and barely back together. He'll be at this for a couple of hours. She sighed, offering me a spot to sit down. I looked at it and sat down. She pulled herself onto a pile of clothes and sighed as she brushed back her wild and messy blonde hair. Child molester. He'll take his sweet time with this one. She explained to me, looking over with her single eye. Despite all the time she was put back together, she always had a hole where the right part of her face and I should have been. What's he going to do with him? I asked, trying to make conversation with a woman in a similar predicament to me. Although she had suffered for far longer than I have been. He'll off all his skin. Use it to make voodoo dolls and leave the rest of him to me. She sighed, the weight of her decades of torture weighed heavily on her. When I raised a hand to comfort her she immediately shirked away from me and silently shook her head. She didn't like to be touched at all. I can understand where she's coming from. Is there any way to save ourselves? I asked her. Hoping for any bit of information she had. But she simply responded with another silent shake of her head. A chip of porcelain falling off her face and onto the floor. She gave up decades ago. What was he like? Before this. I asked, looking up as Creole cackled in delight as he sliced off the molester's skin. Well, at least I agreed with his actions here. 
Truth be told I would have asked for a turn if I knew how to skin properly. But maybe that's just my slowly slipping sanity talking. An idiot. A sweet adorable idiot who was too stupid for his own good. She sighed hard, rubbing her cracked face and letting out a long haggard breath. He was sweet. He really was. A mama's boy who brought me back to my house on time. And showed up on time exactly on the dot. She said with a sad sigh. So why did you do it? I asked her, my button eyes turning my attention from the torture in front of me over to her. It still made no sense for me as to why she would kill Charles Sumner and lead to his transformation into King Creole. I was young and stupid. And blinded by money and sex. Charles was such a prude that he wouldn't have sex until we were married. I wouldn't have cared as much if he didn't drill into me every single day. She groaned, both of us receiving a stink button from Creole as he turned to see what we were doing. But he quickly turned back to having his fun with Paul. Starting to cut into his face. So, you ask your mob boyfriend to kill him? I asked her. Seeing that she was indeed a selfish whore. In Creole's own words not my own. It wasn't supposed to go like that. I just wanted Henry to beat him up enough to scare him into leaving town. But then Charles had to go and win that contest. When Henry found out about the $10,000 he wanted it. And so he tortured Charles into giving it to him. Then he told me that they had accidentally killed him. She explained sitting up and looking at me with her glass green eye. Looking at me with the most sincere idiot seen from her. I take it that Mama Creole didn't take too happy to her son being murdered. I asked her, using the distraction that Creole was having as getting some much needed information from a primary source. Not at all. She said with a soft chuckle. The kind a person gives when they realize how fucked up their situation is. I know that chuckle real well. She suspected me from the start. And since Henry was an idiot and didn't hide the body at all. She found Charles. And the rest is my horrible history. She explained. She really was a flawed person. But was I any better? I helped my boss cover up murders. Got rid of bodies for him. I was not better than her really. Is she still with us? She an immortal voodoo creation like her boy? I asked, looking for any way to get out of our situation. But she responded with a shake of her head. She died in 1960 I think. Old age. Creole was devastated. He didn't come down here for over six months. She didn't want immortality, so she just went quietly into the ether. She sighed, flinching when a chunk of human meat was flung at the two of us. Both of us looked up in terror when Creole pointed the blood-soaked knife at us. Do not speak of my mother, you fucking whore. He snarled, lifting his leg up and stomping her face in. Sending the girl flying backward into the pile of bones that was behind us. He next turned to me and pointed the knife right at me. I raised my hands to show I meant no harm, but he just chuckled at me. There's no way you're getting out of your situation, Travis. You're my special store clerk. My good little boy. And my very own puppet. He smiled, snapping his finger. My body going stiff again and being forced to stand up straight. You are correct, sir. I am at your eternal service. I said with my stupid yes man tone. Wanting so badly to rip that knife from his gloved hand and plunge it into his chest. But all I could do was smile like a jackass and follow his order to take all the skin he had peeled up to his office. Taking it in my hands and starting up the stairs I sighed through my nose hard. This was going to be my life now, wasn't it? The slave of an undead voodoo man. Why did I have to be an idiot and get involved in this? I was about to start making $30 an hour goddammit. Why did I have to ruin all this? I thought all this as I came upstairs and came face to face with a police officer. We looked at each other before we both looked down at what I had in my hands. Then back up at each other. Well, how the hell would I explain this? Turns out I didn't have to. I'm here to wish for something. The woman said. She was middle aged, looked like she was a hard ass, but her tone of voice really sent me back. I looked down at the skin in my hand and thought for a second. Uh. Yeah, Lem just put this away, and I'll get my boss. I said, far enough away from Creole for me to be able to control my actions. Going to the office I thought to myself. Was she going to be my way out of here? Well, I had some hope. For the first time in a while. I should have known not to.
walking down the basement with this police officer, I did my best to act as naturally as I could. You know with strings being constantly tied to me. She was obviously uncomfortable with me, but if she's a cop she most likely knows about King Creole. If that one time that cop tried to arrest the two of us is any indication, then the whole police force knows what goes on in here. I finally made it down the steps with her in tow, watching as Creole was beating Mary with his cane for probably the same reason he had been before. Sir. This officer has a wish. I said, for once in my normal voice. He must have been so upset that he wasn't even bothering to control me at that moment. He looked up at me with a scowl on his face, before staring at the officer. His button eyes went from her to me, then down to Mary, whose face was barely held together from his vicious beatings. Ah. Officer Kilpatrick. You're early. Our appointment wasn't until seven. He chuckled, taking his top hat off and running his fingers through his black messy hair. Putting the item back on and walking closer to us. Pointing his thumb back at Mary and moving his head towards her. The sign for me to move Mary out of sight. Nodding, I went over and gently picked Mary up. She's light as a feather, mostly since her body is hollow on the inside I'm pretty sure. And I carefully placed her in the corner of the room. Careful no to put her down too hard and risk more pieces of her falling off. I know, but I got off early so I figured I might as well just come here. She crossed her arms and looked at the voodoo shop owner. We had a deal. I made sure that your missing clerk wouldn't be investigated thoroughly. Now you owe me a wish. She said, her eyes traveling to see me staring back at her. That couldn't be possible, I thought to myself. Creole had that much influence that no one was ever going to come looking for me. This officer had been my one chance at getting out of this hell. But it turned out she had signed my eternal damnation here. Yes, yes dear. I'm well aware of our little deal. Creole chuckled, brushing some porcelain off his suit and staring at the middle-aged officer in front of him. You want your precious little daughter back? He sighed looking at her with his back to me. She kept looking over at me tending to Mary and obviously feeling guilty about what she'd done. You can do that, right? And not have her ending up like a freak like you too? She asked, pointing to the two of us and waiting for an answer. Gonna be honest, that one hurt. Being compared with Creole really hurt what's left of my soul. If I still do have a soul. If that's what you wish. But that is particularly hard to do. And for that, I'm going to need her body. Creole explained walking past her and over to the basement stairs. And I'll need your help with that. Officer Kilpatrick. He said with a toothy grin. Those stitches strained to breaking once again. Why can't you send your little puppet? She snuffed, pointing to me again and once again chipping away at my soul and causing me to turn my gaze away from them and look back at Mary, who patted my chest to make me feel a little better. I'm afraid Travis isn't allowed outside of the shop. I will accompany you if you so wish. Her body must be brought back here of course. Otherwise, I'm unable to perform the required ritual to bring her back. Creole explained, tapping his fingers on his cane. Clearly waiting for this woman to get a move on things. Fine. She said with a long sigh. Walking past him and up the stairs. Creole turned his button eyes back at me, and I felt the strings pull tight as I was forced to stand up straight once more. Travis, dear. Be a good boy and close up shop. I'll be back within the hour. He ordered of me, leaving before I could give him any kind of stupid ass kissing response. I sighed as I was allowed to go limp again. Waiting until I heard the front door open and close before I turned back to Mary. You've got a chance to look for a way out now. She said, picking up some of her pieces and starting to put some of the pieces on them. Sighing as she got a good amount of her face back into a decent shape. Is there going to be any way out of here? I asked her, raising a brow at her. I got a shrug back and a look like I was an idiot. I haven't left this basement in almost 95 years. How should I know? She rolled her one eye. Damn. She got me. Pouting a bit as I turned to go upstairs, I looked back at her and smiled. She may be older than everyone I know combined, but all girls still has some bite in her. Making my way back upstairs I did my only order and locked up the shop. Looking around at the dusty and cobweb filled place with my button eyes and trying to find any kind of way out of her. That wasn't leaving the front door. Once again I had no luck. Turning my head I looked at the voodoo dolls on the wall and thought for a second. Any of you guys want to help me out of here? I asked them. Getting silence back from them. Well, it was worth an ask. 
I looked back over at the boss man's office and resigned myself to try and look in there for anything that could help me out here. Opening up his desk again I once again couldn't find anything useful. How does he not have any scissors? How the hell does he cut shit? Resigning again, I sat in his office chair and looked around at all the pictures. Picking up one of the pictures on his desk and looking at it. It was old and weathered but I could see that it was Charles and his mother. Made sense that this was the only picture of himself that he hadn't destroyed. He really must have loved his mother. I miss mine. So much. Setting the picture down I sighed and rubbed my face. My fingers going down and scratching the stitches on my neck. Something deep down in me wanted to rip off the stitches. Would that kill me? Since the fact that I wasn't able to just do it and that invisible force was keeping me from doing it, I think that it might. Well if I'm ever able to get to fight Creole in a fist fight I know where to go for. They were gone for a good while and when they finally came back to the shop, I was out of the office and standing at the counter like I usually do. Creole walked through after opening the door that I locked and holding the door open as Officer Kilpatrick brought her daughter's casket into the shop. Dirt dripping onto the floor and causing me to exhale through my nose in annoyance. I'd probably have to clean that. Travis, be a good boy and help Mrs. Kirkpatrick with her luggage, Creole ordered. I nodded and walked over, holding one end of it and helping her as we both were led down the basement. Getting down there, I placed the coffin down, giving Kilpatrick the stink eye. As best I could with button eyes. She was still uncomfortable looking at me and backed up when we placed the coffin down. Do I have to be here to watch? She asked, hugging herself and packing up away from the coffin. Creole walked over and grabbed the coffin, cracking it open and looking down into it, smiling as he saw the corpse in there. I walked over and peeked in. Yup. That was a dead child alright. A rotting dead child at that. Thank god I can't smell things anymore. Well, you don't have to. But it will help with the ritual if you do. He chuckled, picking up the corpse and placing it on the same table he'd used to turn me into a puppet. Well, this sure was going to be fun to watch. Especially with the maggots crawling in and out of her body. It was obviously too much for Kilpatrick since she started gagging and throwing up. Yep. Super glad I can't smell or taste things anymore. Creole went to work, straightening the body out and nodding. He then looked over to me with a smile and beckoned me to come closer to him. I duly obeyed and walked over to him, leaning in so he could whisper to me. Bring that skin I had you place in my office, he said, pulling back and shooing me away. Welp, now I've been downgraded to Aaron boy. Sighing I obeyed and made my way back up the stairs, picking up all the things he would need, the skin, threads, needles, etc. Making sure everything was in my arms, I made my way back downstairs, placing them on the table for my boss. He nodded happily at me and cracked his gloved fingers. One thing about Creole is that he is an expert at sewing. Be they dolls, or in this case humans. Must be all those years he did piano because his fingers are like waterman. Smooth moving. If he wasn't keeping me trapped in here as his slave I would strive to be this good. He laid the new skin on top of the rotting corpse and began to sew it to the old skin. Humming a song as he did so. Clearly lost in his craft. Kilpatrick came over soon to see what was going on. She raised a brow at the skin, at obviously now being a match for her daughter, but that soon changed when the skin began to mold and form to the child's body, turning the correct shade and even growing back the red hair she had used to have. Creole stepped back and nodded at his work, looking around the basement for something before looking to Kilpatrick. Buttons or glass eyes? He asked of her, throwing her off and causing her to take a step back at that. Obviously, she'd never had to consider a question like that. Why can't you give her regular eyes? She asked. Well, those are hard to come by. Where glass and button eyes are far easier to use. I assure you, dear. Nobody will notice. Well, with a glass option, of course. He laughed with a smile. Kilpatrick wasn't amused, though by her looks she was the kind of no-nonsense cop. Fine. Give her glass once. She sighed, crossing her arms again, the gun on her holster moving a bit. I looked at it, but if the times the shop got robbed were any indication, there was no point in trying to kill Creel that way. With his answer, Creel reached into his pocket and pulled out two pairs of glass eyes. And carefully he placed them into the gaping holes where the girl's eyes used to be. She was young, she looked maybe seven or eight. 
just about Olivia's age. I was wondering what had happened to her, but the gaping hole in her neck and has said enough about that. Shot it would seem. By who? I was soon about to find out the answer to that question. But for now, Creole dramatically dusted his hands off and stepped back. Now then. Will her mother step forward and offer her blood? He asked a nice smile on his face as usual. Kilpatrick walked over and looked at her daughter on the table. The softening of her face obviously showed that Creole had done an incredible job at making her look just like she had when she was alive. He looked at Creole and nodded as she offered her hand to him. He raised a needle up and pricked each of her fingers nice and deep. The crimson liquid dripped off of her fingers and into the girl's open mouth. It took a minute or two. But it was soon obvious that the body was starting to change drastically. Before she'd resembled a wax figure doll. But with each trip into her mouth, she gained color and started breathing. Wow, he really can grant any wish. Although this being King Creole I was expecting the inevitable. Sussy. The woman gasped when the little girl sat up from the table breathing rapidly and looking down at her hands and arms. Clutching her throat as she seemingly tried to stop the bleeding that had caused her untimely death. But she then looked up at her mother and blinked a couple of times. Susie, it's mommy. She said, getting on her knees and grabbing her daughter and kissing her until a couple of minutes ago rotting face. And mommy. She said in a soft voice. Her arm soon came around and hugged the woman. It was a tender moment. Which lasted all of five seconds. Why did you kill me, mommy? The little girl suddenly asked. Causing me to raise my brow and look over at Creole, who was just smiling and chuckling up a storm as he backed away. I follow in his lead and backing up as well, what? Kilpatrick asked quickly. Pushing the little girl away from her, still keeping her hands on her shoulders. Her face one of denial as she chuckled and looked around the basement. What are you talking about, baby? I I didn't do anything to you. She explained. But the girl looked straight on at her with her glass eyes. I came downstairs while you and daddy were fighting. You shot daddy in front of me. The little girl said. Her voice deadpan. Sitting up more on the table and standing up on it. When I started crying you shot me too. She said, holding an accusing finger up at her mother. Why you were supposed to be in bed. She said quickly, backing up into Creole who chuckled as he clasped her shoulder from behind. Smiling as he held her in place despite her attempts to shrug her off. I, I had to make it look like a robbery. She shouted, struggling against the unnatural strength of Creole. You lied mommy. You always said lying was bad. Susie said, her voice becoming more and more distorted, her mouth opening up to reveal row upon row of needle-like teeth inside of her mouth. You killed me and lied. She shouted in a distorted voice, pouncing from the table and onto her mother. Taking a big chunk of neck meat, sending mother and daughter down to the floor in a gargled scream. Creole stepped over the two of them as Sussy continued to chow down on her mother. She never said to make her forget about what happened. He explained with a chuckle. Tapping me on the shoulder and turning around to watch the scene with me. Your parents seem really desperate to find you. Maybe they'll come in and wish for you back. Better hope they worded it correctly. He giggled, slapping me hard on the back and leaving me alone to watch the scene as he returned upstairs. I stood there and watched a little girl lead her mother for a good while, mostly because I dreaded returning upstairs. I was about to until something came sliding over to me and hitting my nice dress shoes. I looked down and I swear I almost lost both of my button eyes. A pocket knife. I looked back over a Kilpatrick's body and saw Mary already going through the dead woman's pockets. Keep it safe. She said. Going back to looking for anything else. I bent over and picked it up, feeling the item in my hand and looking back over at Mary. I wanted to try cutting the ropes there, but I need another opportunity where Creole wasn't in the shop. Guess I just have to play the waiting game some more. Hopefully, I can stay sane long enough till that happens. Sussy finished eating her mother and came upstairs with me. Creole ended up turning her into a voodoo doll and placing her on the wall with the others. Why waste precious materials after all? It had turned out that Kilpatrick's husband and daughter were killed in a burglary gone wrong. And looks like Kilpatrick had a fat life insurance policy on her husband. So much for serving and protecting. Since the cops are firmly not an option anymore I'm still stuck at the shop. But at least I have a knife now. Not risking telling you guys where it is, just know it's safe. And hopefully, I'll be able to do something with it. A small step towards freedom but a step nonetheless.
I have done a lot of horrible shit while working here at the half-priced voodoo shop. But this tops everything before. I bet some of you have been wondering about that one girl who asked for a love potion. Well, I had forgotten about her until she came running to the shop in the middle of the night. I was doing my usual thing in the middle of the night when the shop was closed. Curled up on the floor behind the shop and contemplating my horrible sensation. Then a loud thud came onto the door, followed by a bunch of panic knocking. I popped my head from behind the counter and raised a brow. Positive to having the button's eyes is that I've got incredible night vision. So even with the lights off, I was able to see clearly the girl knocking on the door. I sighed and pulled myself onto my feet and forced myself to walk over to her. We're closed ma'am. I told her, looking at her and noticing that she was covered head to toe in blood. Not an unusual sight at the shop I have to say. I can hear you guys yelling at me for not helping her right away and look man, I'm a fucking voodoo puppet. I can only give so much of a shit anymore. I need you to help me. I came here before and asked for a love potion, and ever since then the guy I've been dating has turned into an absolute psycho. She screamed, smashing her hands on the window harder and yanking on the locked door some more. I sighed, looking at her. All sales are final. I said, thinking for a second and looking back over to the office and then back at her, sighing harder and opening the door for her, letting her in and locking the door again. Turning the lights of the shop on I looked at her with crossed arms. Look I can't do much for you. I'm in a much worse situation than you. Fuck you man. My boyfriend just tried to fucking cut my head off. She screamed at me, shaking as she hugged herself. It must have been the first time she took a really good look at me cause, when she looked at the stitches all around my neck she took a step back. Okay. Maybe we're in the same boat. She mumbled a bit. Yeah. Look I can take you down to the basement to hide from your boyfriend, but you cannot tell my boss this. Otherwise, we're both gonna end up fucked in the ass. I explained to her, walking over to the basement door and pulling on it. Groaning when I realized that it was locked. Should have figured that. Okay, maybe not. Look you can just chill here with me until the morning, and then we can both deal with whatever the hell happens. I said, exhausted from everything. Being unable to sleep is terrible. Thanks. I'm Liz. I think your boss already said my name. She offered her hand, and I shook it. Not minding the blood on her. Travis. So what's with the blood? Murder your boyfriend. I asked her, walking over to the counter and offering her the rocking chair I'm never allowed to use during working hours. She sat down and started rocking a bit. No. I did stab him a shit ton of times, but as I was leaving the house he stood up and rushed towards me. So I just ran and ended up here. She explained, rubbing her arms and pulling away, when she seemingly finally got a good look at herself. You wouldn't happen to have an extra change of clothes? She asked me. Yeah in the basement, unfortunately. I said with a chuckle looking around the shop, the voodoo dolls obviously not happy that I brought somebody into the shop after hours. I responded with a middle finger to them. Judgmental assholes. We kinda just sat in silence until she finally broke it with a question I knew was coming. So what happened to you? She asked me. I looked at her with a raised brow and started chuckling. Clearly, she doesn't read my posts. I walked over to behind the counter and produced the missing person poster my parents had given King Creole. I handed it to her. That used to be me I said with only a hint of sadness, crossing my arms and leaning against the wall next to her. She took it and looked down at it, then back to me. You look better with messy hair, she said, causing the first genuine smile I've had in a very long time I feel. Ever since being turned into a voodoo puppet, my hair has been forced to be down and perfectly combed. Opposed to my normal messy hair that I loved. Getting a compliment on my old hair was uplifting, to say the least. Thanks. I hope I can get it back someday. I sighed, looking over to the door and standing up straighter when I saw a figure shambling towards the shop. Hey. Does your boyfriend usually walk on all fours? I asked her, keeping my buttons trained on the figure shambling over to us. Uh. No. What kind of question is that? She asked, obviously confused, but soon shrieked when something started knocking hard on the front door. She stood from the rocking chair and started to back up into me, smearing blood onto my suit. That's him. She screamed. Figured. I sighed as the creature started slamming onto the front door. 
to say he was a human is like comparing me to a normal human at this point. His face was split straight down the middle, and he had plenty of teeth inside of the crevice where his brain should have been. He was also clearly unaware or uncaring of the fact his guts were spilling out all over the sidewalk. You said you just stabbed him. I asked Liz as I leaned over the counter to search for a weapon. I had to make sure he was dead. Clearly, I should have done fucking more. She said in a panic, producing a knife from the hoodie she was wearing. I looked at it and then at her and shrugged. I got nothing against women carrying something to defend themselves with. You have any kinda magic shit that can kill him? She asked me as I calmly looked into the box of things I kept behind the counter. Look, I'm just a slave at this point. I dunno if you noticed, but I'm being held up by magic strings that disappear into the ceiling. Not much I can do in that department. I sighed, pulling out Officer Kilpatrick's gun from the box and slamming it onto the counter. Here, see if that'll help I said, walking over to get King Creel out of his office. Liz. Let me in, I love you. I'm sorry about attacking you. The creature growled, slamming its split head against the glass front door harder and harder. Starting to crack the glass of the front door, causing Liz to quickly pick up the gun and fumbled with it for a second as she aimed it towards the creature. I knocked on Creel's office and waited for him. Tapping my foot on the floor as I waited. Except he didn't come out, which was odd to me. I tried again only for him not to respond either. Trying to open it I found it locked as well, and I groaned. I know for a fact he doesn't sleep since I don't fucking sleep. So where the hell was he? Bad news Liz. Looks like we're on our own with this one. I sighed, walking back over to her and going back to the box for something to arm myself with. Showing Liz how to turn the safety off as she panicked about it not firing. How can you be so calm about this? She asked terrified, only getting a shrug back from me. In my defense at this point I kind of expect this to happen. Finding the gun from one of the robbers I checked the cylinder and found three bullets still unfired. Great. One for the monster, one for Liz, and one for me. That was a plus I guess. Alright. So we fire as many bullets as we can into him. Is that really our only plan? I asked her, sitting down on the rocking chair with a huff as I rubbed my aching legs. Standing up for so many hours really does a number on them. Unless you have a better idea. She said, still pointing the pistol towards the creature that used to be her boyfriend. Who was rapidly putting more cracks into the glass door with each hard smash of his head. Well, at least he was dedicated to that. You guys gonna help out? I asked the voodoo dolls. Turning my attention towards them, but as usual, they just gave me a blank look back whenever I tried to talk to them. Nope. Got no ideas here. I shrugged, clocking the hammer back on the revolver and aiming it at the creature. We would have had a last stand there if I hadn't noticed the voodoo doll template on the counter. Ever since being turned into a puppet, I had forgotten about my little companion. He seemingly hadn't forgotten about me though as he was holding King Creel's key. Guess he wasn't such a little shit after all. Taking Liz by the arm I pulled her over to the basement door and unlocked it, quickly pushing her in and walking in myself as her boyfriend broke through the door. I can't see a thing. She huffed, flinching when the creature started pounding the door on the other side. But I gave her a pat on the shoulder, and took her hand as I led her down the flight of stairs. Able to see rather well down here. Don't worry. If Mary can't get through that door, he sure as hell isn't either. I sighed, leading her to the basement and flicking on the lights. Turning around when she screamed at all the dead bodies and human remains. Oh and Mary eating another customer. Hey, Mary. Don't mind us. I said, waving to her. He won't be happy that you brought someone down here. She pointed out, wiping her bloodstained mouth and looking at the girl I had brought down here. When is he ever happy about something I do? I asked back. Reaching down and handing Liz some random articles of clothing. Plus I don't even think he's here. I knocked and he didn't come out of his office. I pointed out, leaning against the cold stone walls of the basement. HM, well just make sure she's out of here, before he comes back. The porcelain woman said, going back to her meal with the same vigor, that we walked in on. Liz was obviously confused and scared, but I assured her that Mary was mostly harmless. Nodding she went over to the corner, and changed out of her bloody hoodie and jeans into another hoodie and jeans. Go figure. What are we going to do about Trevor? She asked after a decent period of silence. I looked at her with my button eyes and sighed, running my hands through my hair, and thinking it over. 
There was a chance that the voodoo dolls would deal with it. But I had only ever seen them do anything after King Creole had been attacked by the rookie cop. I guess wait is the only thing we can do. I shrugged. I really didn't have any ideas. If I couldn't even get out of this place, how the hell am I supposed to come up with some kind of way to kill a boyfriend turned evil undead creature? She wasn't exactly happy with this option, but there wasn't much we could do about it anyway. So, I'm guessing your parents didn't find you? She asked me. The subject wasn't the most ideal thing I wanted to talk about at this moment. But I figured there wasn't much else to talk about. No. Creole made it, so the police won't investigate my disappearance. My parents came here to ask him about me, and I couldn't do anything to alert them that I was here. I sighed, looking away and over to the corner. Well. If I get out of here, I'll tell them. Liz said. Causing me to look over to her. Would she do that? More importantly what would even happen after that? Creole wouldn't just let me go. He'd cause my parents more suffering, and by extension me. I still remembered his threat to me. No. I can't risk Creole from hurting them. Me and Mary are working on a way to get out of here. I just need some time to think. I sighed, rubbing my face and scratching at my buttons. But right now, I gotta make sure he doesn't find you. Let's just say he doesn't like people knowing that Mary exists down here. I said, walking over to her and taking her hand as I led her back to the stairs. I don't hear him. She whispered to me. And she was right. I didn't hear Trevor either. So turning off the basement, light we both started upwards towards the basement door. Silent as silent could be. Reaching it I placed my ear against the door and heard wet smacking. The usual sound I heard when someone was getting beat to death in the shop. Stay here, I told her, opening the door quickly and closing it behind me. My hunch was correct when I say Creole beating the living shit out of Trevor with his cane. His gaze turned to me, and his scowl quickly turned into a wide smile. Travis. Dear me, I thought this disgusting creature had gobbled you up. He chuckled, walking over to me and tussling my hair. Already I could feel my body tense up and my brain lose control as the strings took over. No need to worry about me, sir. I said happily. Praying to whatever fucked up God existed for me not to say that Liz was hiding in the basement. He looked me over and looked over to the basement door. No. Please no. You're hiding something from Lil Almi aren't you Travis? He asked me with a smile. Walking past me and over to the basement. I held my breath as he turned the knob. Only for it to not open. He'd scat and reached into his coat pocket. Only he didn't find the key in there or any of his other pockets. What the hell? He asked in annoyance. Looking at me and coming over. Grabbing me by my collar. Now you listen here, boy. He snarled, his yellow teeth sharpening back into fangs. You tell me what the fuck you hid down there. He snarled, causing me to gulp and try once again to bash my face against the voodoo monsters. But it wouldn't work this time. A girl, sir. I said, in that stupid kisses tone. The one who brought this creature with her. I choked out as I started to squirm away from him. Fighting my hardest to not fall under his stupid spell. Is that so? Then, it must be Miss Elizabeth. He asked with a coup. Pushing me away and producing a needle from his pocket. He inserted it and with a flick of the wrist opened up the door. Only to get met with a shot right into his face from Liz. The voodoo man stumbled backward and tripped over the bleeding corpse of Trevor. Run. I managed to choke out as the strings loosened and I seemingly was able to have control over myself again. She nodded quickly and started booking it towards the entrance. Only for her ankle to be grabbed by Creole's gloved hand and causing her to fall flat on her own face. I tried to assist, but the strings instantly took their hold on me once again. Well, Ms. Liz. Seems your potion didn't turn out so well. Creole chuckled, the hole in his head dripping and the black substance that usually came out of his mouth. Allow me to remedy that. He snarled pulling her closer as she tried in vain to escape him. Shooting bullet after bullet into his head. Travis. Help me. She screamed, looking at me with sheer terror in her eyes. I wanted to. I wanted to force myself to fucking move. But I was stuck there in place, just forced to look blankly at her. Travis. Get this bitch down to the basement. I'm going to teach her some respect. Creole snarled at me as he finally managed to pin Liz to the floor and slap the empty gun away as she tried to bash him with him. The strings pulled tight once again. I fought as hard as I could guys. 
I swear I did. But the strings pulled me over and forced me to pull Liz up and hold her against me, as I began dragging her to the basement. Creole stood up and dusted himself off as he chuckled. Walking along with me as I pulled Liz screaming and kicking down to the basement. I helped Creole strap her to the table. He scolded me for letting someone in after hours and deemed that the punishment I would receive was to help him with what he was going to do. He sliced the clothes off her and he took great pleasure in the fact that she was wriggling and screaming all the while. He hummed all the while and stepped away to the corner of the basement to look for the item he would use on Liz. He came back with pieces of porcelain. My heart sank instantly when I saw that. He placed each piece onto her and mumbled something to himself. Liz began screaming louder as the porcelain began to sizzle onto her skin and soon morphed perfectly on top of it. He repeated this pattern, panel by panel, replacing every inch of her skin just like Mary. Guess this is what he did to her. When he finished, Liz was completely porcelain. But unlike Mary, she couldn't move. She simply darted her eyes back and forth tears streaming down her shiny pale face. But he wasn't done yet. He looked over at me and smiled white as he snapped his fingers. And before my eyes, she started shrinking. Just like when he turned someone into a voodoo doll. In no time flat, she was the size of a porcelain doll, and he picked her up carefully. Travis, Travis, Travis. He sighed at me bringing the doll of Liz over to me and holding on to it as he tapped my cheek with his gloved hand. You shouldn't fall in love. You'll just end up in a million pieces. He explained, dropping Liz in front of me. I screamed as loud as I could in my mind as my body just stood there and watched as she hit the floor and shattered into a million pieces. A million bleeding pieces. Clean the mess upstairs. We open in a few hours. He said, leaving me to stand over Liz's dead pieces. Liz was my only chance of escape. But besides that, she was just a poor girl who wanted to be loved. And this is how she ended up. Mary said there was no way she could have survived. The only reason she survives his beatings is because he leaves enough of her intact to be rebuilt. There's no fixing Liz. And it's all my fault. After the unfortunate death of Liz, I slid further and further into hopelessness. All the days started blending together, and I started fighting the strings less and less. I felt like I was both being dragged around physically by the strings, and mentally I just gave up fighting. Creole seemed to notice that as he tried to get some kind of reaction out of me. But I gave him no satisfaction at all with anything he tried. That seemed to annoy him at least, so I got that small victory. I might have fully surrendered to the strings if a familiar face hadn't shown up to the shop. When the rusty bell jingled I didn't bother looking up from my staring contest with a voodoo template on the counter. Until the sound of little feet running over to me tore me away from my exhilarating game. Little Olivia stared up at me with her sweet innocent little eyes. Wow. You look like Mr. King Creole. She gasped. I had almost forgotten the girl and her new British mother. I looked at her and the first smile in a couple of days came to my face. She returned my smile and looked over to her mother as she came over to me. Her look was one of sorrow as she looked at me, covering her mouth with her hands as she looked at me. I couldn't stop him. I sighed as I pointed to the strings forcing me to stand. She reached out and held my hands in hers as she offered me some comfort. It felt nice to have someone touch me and not immediately hit me with a hard wooden cane. As if to further push that train of thought, King Creole emerged from his office, a big wide smile on his face. Olivia, darling, he said with a big cheery grin, coming over as the little girl ran to him and wrapped her little arms around him. Don't you worry, dear. I know what day it is today, he said with a soft chuckle, petting her head as he kneeled down to her level. She looked up at him flabbergasted. You know today is my birthday, she asked with a smile. The voodoo owner nodded and stood back up, looking over at me and Olivia's mother, a finger coming up and wagging at the two of us. Olivia's mother quickly dropped my hands and stood back. She feared the creature just as much as I did. He smiled when she was finally away from me and turned his attention back to Olivia. Of course I do. Now come along, darling. I've got the perfect present for you, Creole said, taking Olivia's hand and leading her to the office. Her mother followed after them, and soon enough left me alone once the office door was closed, leaving me alone once again. Well at least someone showed me some kindness. It felt really nice. 
The trio emerged from King Creel's office and chuckled as Olivia thanked him a million times for her gift-wrapped present, smiling down at her and then over at me, his button eyes meeting mine and he chuckled. How about a story? Before y'all leave for your party? He asked her, looking down at Olivia, who quickly nodded and jumped up and down, handing the gift to her mother and really just wanting to hear his story. Travis, my boy, bring that rocking chair and your old stool over here. He ordered me. I nodded and brought the two chairs over, Creole taking the stool and Olivia climbing up onto the stool. Once upon a time, there was a man named Charlie. He began, a soft chuckle leaving his lips as he looked up at me and Olivia's mother. We both looked away from his commanding gaze. Now, Charlie loved playing the piano. He wasn't very good at it at first, but he kept practicing and practicing. Day after day he played the same songs over and over just to get the movements down perfectly. And one day, he did it. He mastered the piano. The voodoo man smiled, lifting his fingers up and mimicking like he was playing the piano. Wow. Couldn't he just have wished to be better at the piano? Olivia asked the storytelling voodoo man. He let out a howling laugh, causing me and Olivia's mother to flinch. No, darling. My mama always said life can't be solved with a wish. You gotta roll up those sleeves of yours, and get it yourself. Charlie knew that, and he never stopped practicing and getting better. He even started his very own band. He smiled, seeing Olivia with stars in her eyes. He smiled and continued. He even fell in love and got engaged. But life isn't always fair to hard-working people like Charlie. He sighed, leaning back in the rocking chair, and letting it creak. Now, I and you already know this story. We know who Charles Sumner was, and who he became. I knew this very well in my futile attempt to stop my fate from happening. So why was Creole telling an abridged version to Olivia? Especially on her birthday of all days. The brutal murder of Charles Sumner isn't exactly the kind of children's story I would tell a kid. What happened to Charlie? Olivia asked, now concern plastered all over her face as she scooched closer to the edge of the stool, to look up at King Creel. The voodoo man's smile grew as he let the chair rock him back closer to Olivia. Lil Al Charlie won a contest. A contest that gave him a lot of money. He was gonna use that money to buy him, and his fiance a nice plot of land with a house on it. But Charlie's little lady friend was very naughty. She wanted that money all for herself he said, his smile straining his stitched up mouth as his rocking on the chair continued. She decided to get her secret boyfriend to steal the money from Charlie, so they could keep it all to themselves. At that line, my buttons instinctively drifted over to the basement door. Mary had been punished for her crime for close to a hundred years at this point, and it seemed like there would be no end in sight for her. Who was that Greek myth guy? The one whose liver got eaten by that giant bird every day? Prometheus, I think. I guess that's what kind of punishment all King Creole dishes out. So, on the night he won the contest, Charlie was brought to a bar to celebrate and have a party with people he thought were his friends. Then, they took him out to the woods. The smile on the pale voodoo store owner's face dropped a bit. Then they started beating him, saying all manner of horrible things to him. He'd scared, shaking his head and looking at Olivia, who was captivated by every word being spoken to her. Did they kill him? The little girl asked. Clearly, she was smarter than her years let on. She could tell where this story was going. Not right away. They beat him, and when they realized Charlie had gotten a very good look at all their faces, they picked up some sticks and stabbed them into Charlie's eyes. You cannot imagine the pain Charlie felt. His so-called friends, hurting him this badly. Creole sighed, taking his top hat off and running his gloved hands through his messy black hair. Only the problem was, that didn't kill Charlie. Oh, he screamed and screamed. Anyone would if that happened to them. The people hurting him, panicked again. What if someone heard that and would come? Creole quickly put his hat on, and sat up straight as he looked at Alvia. Did someone come? To save Charlie? The little girl asked. Hugging the doll of her old mother, that never left her side. I was also on the edge of my seat. Even though I knew the outcome. What can I say? he's a good storyteller. No, nobody did. But they were so scared that they'd be seen and caught that they had to act fast. One of them grabbed a rusty saw from the back of one of their trucks. The others held Charlie down, shoving his face into the cold wet dirt. And they started cutting. Only, there was a problem. 
The saw was duller than they were, and I didn't cut well at all, he said, and that made sense. The cut to my neck, that Creole gave me is nice and smooth, he did it with a nice sharp saw. His own cut, it's gagged and uneven in places, like someone really forced it to be cut. How long did it take it to end? Olivia whimpered. Her mother came over to hug her from behind to calm her down. The little girl burying her face in her mother's dress, but still looking over at Creole. Obviously still fascinated by the story. Oh, it took a very long time, darling, Creole said. 30 minutes from when the saw started cutting to when Charlie's head fell off his shoulders. They covered his bodies under some leaves and sticks and left him there, he said, holding his hands up as if that was the end. But he continued, another smile spreading across his face. But they didn't account for his mama. I raised a brow at this. Creole never talked about his mother. It was something that sent him into a fury whenever me, and especially when Mary brought it up. But here he was telling a little girl all about his elusive mother. Me and Olivia's mother were obviously curious. Charlie's mama was very skilled in the arts of voodoo. She was loved by everyone for healing the sick and helping the needy. And when she learned that her son was missing, oh now she sprung into action. She found Charlie's body within a few days of him going missing. But she didn't report it to the police, oh no no. He'd scared, wagging his finger at all three of us. She took him straight back home, and she fixed him right up, bringing him back to the land of the living. Olivia gasped and started clapping in excitement, looking up at her mother like it was a miracle. Now, Charlie was very upset at what had happened to him. He worked so hard all his life, and he'd been taken advantage of. Well, he decided that it was his turn to have the fun. He chuckled, looking up at me with a smile. He made everyone who killed him suffer, especially his fiancée and her secret boyfriend. He hummed with a smile. If he'd done something this horrible to Mary, I can only imagine what he did to Henry, her secret mob boyfriend. Wow. What did Charlie do when he was done? Olivia asked, setting her doll on her lap and looking up at him for an answer. He smiled down at her and tousled her hair. Why he decided to teach everyone the same lesson he learned. Taking the easy way only gets you punished, he said with a chuckle, looking over at me and Olivia's mother. Your new mommy learned that the hard way. Your new mommy left her family and moved to America to start a new life just for herself. Now, she's the best mother you could have ever asked for. He smiled, Olivia nodding back quickly and turning to hug her mother nice and tight. She looked over at me and nodded sadly. And what about him? What did he do to get turned like that? She asked, pointing at me, and then looking at Creole. I also looked at him, expecting some bullshit thing I had done to deserve this. What he said, made me want to pull out the switchblade I've been hiding this whole time, and just staple his fucking heart out. I was feeling selfish. He said with a giggle. Standing up and walking past me as the strings tightened, and forced me to stand in place, while he said his goodbyes to Olivia and her mother. Both of them left the shop. He approached me and wrapped his arm around my stiff body. Travis, my good boy. Your parents called me once again. They're begging me to help them find you. I think they might even be coming over again. Who knows? If they ask for a wish, I just might grant it. He chuckled, grabbing my face and pulling it over to look at him. He smiled wide as he squished my cheeks. You wouldn't dare. I choked out, managing to fight off the string's influence enough to say that. That got a hard laugh out of him. He smacked me across my face and caused me to go limp against my will. He put his dress shoe on my face and put hard pressure on it. I wouldn't dare. He asked after laughing at me for a good while, putting even more pressure on my head. If you weren't my sweet little pet, I would have already gutted you like a fucking fish and used you for a voodoo doll. He hummed, reaching down and grabbing me by my hair and pulling me back up. Listen here. If you so much as try anything with Mary, I'll kill your parents right in front of you. He said with a smile, dropping me back on the floor and fixing his tie. I struggled to push myself up and looked up at him, gritting my teeth and trying to think of a way to fight back against him. And what I said is the reason I haven't posted an update in a while. Your mother would be fucking disappointed that this is what you're doing. I said, and instantly regretted it when he stopped in place and looked back at me, his teeth grinding hard as he came over to me, grabbing his cane from seemingly nowhere and starting to beat me with it. 
that was normal when he got pissed off, but this time he dragged me by the suit collar and dragged me down to the basement. You will not speak of my mother. He growled as he tossed me down to the floor of the basement and snapped his fingers. The strings on my body hold tight as he had me suspended from the floor. I'll make sure that filthy mouth of yours is kept shut. He smiled as he produced a needle and thread. He stabbed my lips with it and sewed my mouth shut tight and left me dangling from the ceiling for two straight days. Mary managed to cut the threads on my mouth with the porcelain shards that she always had near her. After he calmed down, he dragged me back up to the counter and shoved me to the counter, pointing a gloved finger at my face. The voodoo human doll that was King Creole delivered a threat to me that has left me chilled to the bone. You so much as speak out of line, and I will turn your parents into dolls and burn them right in front of you. He snarled, stepping away from me, and letting his threat seep in. He means it, and he has the ability to do it. I need to stop him. I need to kill him. Let me get this straight, and for the record. I don't know how to do any kind of voodoo. It's not like King Creel has how to do voodoo books lying around everywhere. And let's just say the internet has been even less helpful. Anything I try just ends up with me getting beat by my beloved boss when he discovers what I try to do. So that's completely off the table for me. Though it would have been cool to give him the same shit he's been giving me. So far the only thing I had going for me was the switchblade and Mary. The old porcelain girl has plenty of fight left in her if her ambush of Creel was anything to go on. Plus I still have the key to the basement that my little template voodoo friend gave me. Creole seemingly hasn't noticed, or he has an infinite amount of keys, because he easily goes down there every day to beat Mary, and to do his usual messed up shit down there. So when he went down there today I expected to hear the usual shattering porcelain sounds. But I didn't hear it this time. I heard a piano. Now let me tell you something. Hearing any kind of music break the deafening silence of the shop was like hearing the voice of an angel. I turned back to look at the basement door and raised a brow as to where the hell a piano had come from. I've been down there a lot. There ain't no piano down there. I walked over to the basement door and found it open. Now, this was very strange. Well, he hadn't told me not to come down there, so I silently walked down there. The sounds of a sweet, yet sad tune played, and grew louder the closer I came towards the basement. I stopped just short of the final step, and pressed myself up against the stone wall, peeking my head over to see what was happening down here, and my jaw hit the floor faster than an anvil from the sky. The basement looked completely different. No hanging bodies, no bones, no rotting corpses. Nothing. Instead, it was a concert hall. Like a full-on giant concert hall. Seats with cushions with people sitting in them and watching. Now not real people obviously. Each one of them had a stitched up mouth and button eyes. Most likely he made an audience out of the boats down here. I looked over to the stage and my button eyes nearly fell off. Because playing the piano wasn't King Creole. It was Charles Sumner. Well combed hair, tan, normal eyes and a big smile on his face as he played the piano. My confusion was immense but he played the piano so beautifully. It was hypnotizing almost. I looked around for a place to sit and found one next to one of the guys who had once wished for a million dollars and ended up getting hit by a car ride after. He said nothing as I sat down. I kept staring at the stage, my button eyes soaking in the scenery of something that had only happened in the 1920s when Charles was still alive. I can see all that practice really paid off for him. It would have been a lovely concert, maybe one for the history books until Mary descended from the ceiling to the stage with wires attached to her. Unlike Charles who was all smiles and soaking up the opportunity, Mary looked sad and almost unwanted in a way. And yet she too was human again. The very definition of beauty. With golden blonde hair, pale skin, and a white dress. When she landed on the stage finally she took a step forward and looked back at Charles. He ignored her, but kept playing his heart out. Mary sighed and looked out to the crowd. I'm not going to do this again Charles. I hate it. She said finally. Causing Charles to miss the stroke of the key and then snap his attention over to her. Standing up, I felt my blood run cold as he pushed away from the piano and started to walk over to her. I reached down to my shoe and removed the switchblade. Yes. 
I've been hiding it in my shoes the whole time. It's what he gets for giving me way too big shoes. Listen you whore. Charles snarled from the stage. His anger was obvious and emanating from him. He walked over to Mary and grabbed her by the throat, the woman gasping and starting to hit him on his chest. You know what today is, and you damn well better sing. Or I'll make sure this eternal punishment of yours becomes even fucking worse. He snarled, some of the creole slipping out of the pianist. Good. At least I'll finally be free of you. She choked out. Rising another hand to strike him, only for him to intercept it and toss her to the ground. The woman coughed and hacked, soon, an entire chunk of her face falling into her hands. Her skin cracking all over the place and soon enough she was back to her porcelain form. Very well then. Oh, Travis. Charles suddenly asked, spinning on his heels and looking at me. I froze and quickly shoved the knife into my pocket, looking around and seeing that every person in the crowd was looking at me. Come on over here boy. I require your services. He chuckled, walking back over to the piano. Sitting down with some dramatic flair he began playing some practice notes. Those notes sent my strings trembling as soon enough I was forced to stand up and walk over to the stage. My buttons looked at Mary as I passed her and took her place on the stage. I looked then over at Charles who waved back at me and started up the music again. The second he did, the strings pulled tighter than ever and began to force me to dance. Now, normally I can't dance. I look like a thrashing fish more than anything. But the strings forced me to dance as elegantly as any professional dancer. This wouldn't be too much of a problem. Except for the fact that every motion the strings made me do caused me more pain than I can even begin to try and explain to you. Each and every pull of those strings felt as if each limb was being pulled out of their socket, along with my skin being pulled off with a potato peeler. I screamed with each and every pull of the string. Each and every dance move. Each and every tone of Charles's piano keys was like another peel of my skin. Mary watched in horror as I screamed and begged for him to stop. She looked between me and Charles before she finally stood up. Stop. Enough, I'll sing. She finally said, causing Charles to stop and turn to her. By extension this allowed me to stop as well. I collapsed to the floor, crying and whimpering at just how much pain I was in. My entire body limp and throbbing and blinding white pain. Mary walked over to me and carefully put her hand on me, flinching away when I hissed out in pain. You better start, before I force him to do it again, Charles threatened, his fingers hovering over the keys and ready to force me up once again. The woman waved him off, helping me sit up first before she backed up. Looking out at the crowd Mary sighed and took a deep breath, and she started to sing. Not like lyrics, but like an opera singer might. It was incredible just like Charles's piano playing. They went together in perfect harmony. Charles started to play it again, while Mary sang her heart out. I just watched from the stage completely enraptured as my aching body healed from my abuse. It was something that you can only really experience if you were there. It was as if Beethoven and Mozart cooperated together to create something made of pure beauty. It was heavenly. To think a monster like him could produce something so beautiful. With one final soft aria, Mary finished. And with a flurry of keystrokes, Charles finished. He stood from the piano, stepped away from it, and bowed to the crowd. The corpses standing up and clapping. Be happy birthday, mama. He said to the ceiling. Lowering his head and in a short breath, the stage was gone. I don't know how he did it, I can't even blink, and yet in the blink of an eye, the basement was back to its normal horrible self. Creole was back, putting his top hat on his head and sighed out from his nose. That explains why he went all out on this. Hope she's burning in hell as you'll be. Mary spat, causing Creole to swiftly turn around, and bitch smacked her. Sending shards of porcelain to the floor and causing Mary to fall back into the wall and fall to the floor. Creole then turned to me and smiled. As if she wouldn't be joining me. He chuckled, walking past me and towards the stairs his steps heading up most likely back to his office. I went over to Mary and helped her back up, handing her some pieces of herself which she thanked me for. Guessing he does that every year. I asked her, sitting down next to the porcelain woman. She nodded as she laid her head back against the stone wall we sat up against. His tribute to her. For bringing him back to life. And for being a good mother I guess. She explained. Looking over to me with her only eye and sighing. Shaking her head and looking over to all the bones and bodies lying around. 
I know better than him. I eat anything he sends down here just to be able to grow back any piece of my body. If I really wanted him to kill me I would just have to stop eating. And yet here I am still after all these decades. She said with a sorrowful chuckle. Looking over to me and reaching a hand out to touch my face. Sending me flinching a bit, but she softly rubbed my red painted cheeks. Those look good on you. Some much needed color. Would rather have some real color. I chuckled, letting her touch me for a second before pulling away. I don't know if it's because she's my only other contact in this horrible place, but it's comforting to know that she cares about me. At least enough to stop my suffering when she can. Our moment was interrupted by a hard crack to the back of my head, sending me falling into her lap. As I looked up I saw Creole snarling down at the both of us, trying to steal my pet whore. He asked, raising his cane and striking her harder growling as he struck her hard enough to shatter a good portion of her face. I looked over once I regained myself and saw what he'd done to her. And I acted. Pulling the switchblade out of my pocket, I brought the blade up and grabbed King Creel by the shoulder. Turning him around he looked at me in absolute confusion and fury as I slashed at his throat with the blade. I managed to cut almost the entirety of his front stitches, causing a big spray of black liquid to come flying out of his throat and causing him to stumble forward and onto the floor, clutching his throat as he did so. Why you idiot? What have you done? He choked out, staring up at me with the rage of a cornered animal. Acting on impulse I kicked him in the head and broke further stitches, causing more of the liquid to ooze out of him, and causing him to fall flat on his face as he bled out. I backed up and dropped the knife, Looking over at Mary, she was putting her face back together and staring in awe at what I had done. That didn't last too long as the voodoo man pushed himself back up, his head dangling down by his shoulder and chuckling up at me. He stood up and fixed his head back easily, pulling out his threads and needle and leaving the items to stitch up his neck. I backed up from him, quickly reaching down and grabbing the knife again. You really risk the lives of your family, for a whore like her? He asked with a giggle clearly pissed off royally and trying to hide it behind a forced smile and laugh. When the floating thread and needle were finished they dropped themselves into his hand, and he carefully put them in his pocket. He reached down to the floor and dusted off his hat, placing it on his head with a smile. He looked over at me with a cheery smile, and then lunged at me and shoved me into the wall with the force of an 18-wheeler. I tried stabbing him again, but he simply took the stab through his hand and looked at me. Why aren't you dead? I asked as I kicked my legs at him. He answered me with a chuckle and a pat to the cheek. Takes more than that to undo Mama's work. He answered, looking back over at Mary to make sure she wasn't doing anything to try and save me this time. Then looking back at me and looking at the knife embedded in his hand he'd scat at me. Looks like I'm paying your parents a visit. He chuckled, backing his head away from my own as I tried to headbutt him, bite him, anything. Don't you fucking dare you psycho. I shouted, desperately trying to get out of his death grip. But he just watched and laughed. Like an animal playing with its food. He had the upper hand on me. And I had lost my only advantage against him. He tossed me to the floor and stomped on my head with his dress shoes as she looked down at me. I'll do you one better, Travis. How about I bring them here? Show them that you're alive and well then, have you kill them for me? He said with a maniacal giggle grinding his heel into my skull and causing me to thrash and try to fight him off. But I felt the pull of the strings, and my angry growls and curses turned into a big smile. That sounds perfect, sir. I'll get the tools ready for you. I happily said, as he lifted his foot off of me and let me stand back up. He smiled as he looked at me and nodded. That sounds excellent, Travis. Why I bet they'll be so happy to see you. Just imagine the looks on their faces as you slice off their skin and help me turn them into dolls. He said with another childlike giggle. I wanted to wrap my hands around his head and crush it with the force of vice. But all I could do was nod and salute him. I can't wait, sir. I declared. He nodded and tousled my combed hair. Turning and starting to walk upstairs before he suddenly stopped and turned to look at me. Travis. Be a good boy and bring master his cane. He said with a hum producing a nice tooty smile as his stitches on the mouth strained to breaking point. I turned my head to look at the item sitting on the floor, turning back to him and finally walking to get the item, picking up the item and handing it back to him. Now, that's a good boy, he said, walking upstairs and leaving me. The knife was still stabbed in his hand. Well, 
I fucked up. I wasted my only chance to kill him. And now he'll be back with my parents at any moment. And it's all my fault. I should have fully decapitated him. Maybe that would have worked. I don't know anymore. I've been laying on the floor of the shop for about 5 minutes now just crying. Well, I was not because I think I have one more chance. My little voodoo template friend has just produced a scissor blade for me. I'm sorry I ever said anything bad about you little guy. I have a chance. I'll save you, mom and dad. I promise. King Creole took his sweet time bringing my parents over. And that worked in my own favor. With the help of my little template friend, I got a scissor blade. What better weapon to kill a voodoo doll making monster like him with? With renewed vigor, I acted quickly and headed downstairs to get Mary. She was my only real ally in this fight, so her help would be important. Although let's just say she was more than a little skeptical. That's the worst plan I've ever heard. She said, her face pressed against her hand as she shook it. Well, she didn't have much confidence in me. But at the same time, I didn't hear her coming up with any ideas. Even if I agree to help you, you're going to be under his control. How are you going to go against that? She asked me, a quizzical look plastered on her cracked face. That's where you come in. You ambush him from behind and split his attention. I know for a fact he loses control when he stops focusing. I pointed out to her, handing her half of a scissor. She looked down at the item like it was an armed grenade. Looking up to me. Where the hell did you get this? She asked, admiring the surprisingly sharp item. Dragging her porcelain finger across it and scratching her polished skin with the item. That template doll that sits on my counter. I said quickly, looking back up to the stairs and then to her. Look, it's not important right now. I leave the basement door unlocked, and when you see Creole get close enough to the door, ambush him. It'll get me enough time to be out of his control and help you. Please, Mary. I don't want him to hurt my parents. I begged her, grabbing her hands and squeezing them against mine. She was trembling as she looked down at the item and then up to me. Alright yes. Okay, I'll do it. She nodded, looking around the basement and walking off in a direction, producing a scarf and pulling it tight against her hands. I'll wrap this around his neck and fight against him as best I can. She said softly, coming over to me and handing me back the scissor. You need to cut his head off completely this time. No half-assing it. She said poking her finger into my chest. I nodded and wrapped my arms around her and pulled her into my chest thanking her softly before quickly going upstairs to arrange anything else that might help us in our battle against the voodoo king. My little friend wasn't much help, but he had done more than enough for me. I walked into the office and quickly looked around the boss man's office, and looked at the only picture he cared about, Charles and his mama. I took it and shoved it into my suit. Quickly I made my way back to the counter and sat in agonizing silence as I waited for him to show up. It was maybe an hour or five later that he strolled right into the shop with my mother and father in tow. I hadn't seen my parents in who knew how long. And when they saw me standing at the counter my mother screamed and quickly fainted in my dad's arms. Mom always was pretty squeamish. What did you do to our son, you fucking freak? My dad shouted, obviously having mixed up feelings about his only kid looking the way I look. Creole simply chuckled and drummed his fingers on his cane. His button eyes turned over to look at me with a more than satisfied smirk. Travis, my boy. Are you just gonna stand there? Come greet your mama and daddy. He ordered, snapping his fingers. The old familiar pull of the strings forced me over to my parents. At the very least he let me talk. Dad. I managed to choke out, through pent up tears. I wanted to reach my arms out and hug him tight. My mom started coming around again and she looked at me. Reaching a shaking hand out to me. I may have been an undead puppet, but I was still their son, Travis, my sweet baby boy, my mother whimpered, touching my painted cheeks and touching my combed hair, a forced smile on her face when she saw that, I always knew you would look handsome if you combed your hair, she said with her loving smile, that alone was enough to break me, 
For once I was thankful for the strings holding me up, because I just wanted to hold on to my parents tight and just let go. Aw. Oh. Now as much as I'd hate to break up the sweet family reunion Creole interrupted, walking over to us and smiling as he rubbed the head of his cane with his gloved hands. Travis here has been a very very bad boy. And unfortunately, I do believe the punishment is in order. He hissed, raising his cane and snapping his finger again. My body went as stiff as a board and a smile was forced upon my face as I took the offered cane and raised it above my head and brought it down on my mother's head. With a sickening crack, she went down. I was screaming internally as my dad looked at what I had just done. I wish I could have told him the reason why I'd done it. That I wasn't in control of myself. But I just as quickly raised the cane again and brought it down on his head as well. Good boy. Creole hummed, wrapping his arm around me and pulling me close. He smiled and pinched my cheek playfully as he took the cane back from the limp noodles my arms had become. He looked at the item and rubbed some of the blood off of the white orb head and patted me on the back. Be a deer and start taking them to the basement. He ordered. Walking over to the basement door to unlock it. And that's when Mary burst through the door and tackled him quickly. He barely had time to react before Mary was on top of him and wrapping the scarf around his neck and pulling it tight. As I had predicted, his control over me faded and I shook off the shock of attacking my parents and quickly pulled the scissor blade out. As Mary fought with him I ran over and plunged the blade into his mouth. What are you doing? Mary shouted, still trying to contain him to the floor as I jostled for space next to her. I didn't have time to answer her, so instead I showed her. Dragging the scissor across his stitched up mouth and cutting free all of them. His jaw dropped open soon enough and that black sludge began to leak out of his mouth. Next, I started putting the blade against his throat and started slicing as many stitches as I could. But inevitably he threw us off and stumbled to his feet. Barely able to stand on his own. Oh, you've fucking done it now. He snarled, spitting out loads of that black sludge as he stumbled forward to us. He covered his mouth to keep the fluid inside of him and kept his other hand on the cane to keep himself up. It was clear to me now that the black sludge was somehow keeping his rotting corpse alive. So getting it out of him was the key to beating him. Now Charles. I said through pants, reaching into my suit and pulling out a picture of his mother. Didn't your mama ever teach you not to swear? I asked, removing the picture from the frame and stabbing the blade through it. If I pissed him off before, I really fucking pissed him off with that stunt. He seemingly got a second wind and pounced on me. Tackling me to the floor and beating me with his fists and his cane when he felt like it. He might very well have killed me. If Mary hadn't stabbed him in the butt eye with one of her shards. He screamed something fierce and fell off of me. His left butt eye cracked in two and fell off to the floor. He looked up at her with his single remaining button and forced himself to stand back up. Going to kill me again, you whore. He asked her, reaching out for his cane and using it to push himself up. Obviously, his strength was waning as the floor was starting to be coated in his black sludge. No Charles. I'm finally going to end this. She said, helping me back up and handing me to the scarf to clean my bleeding face. I struggled to stand as well, but I finally managed and brandished my blade out like it was a knife. The voodoo king Creole was finally about to be bested. Except for the fact that we were in his shop where he had all the power. It won't be that easy. He chuckled, which turned into a coughing fit as he covered his mouth again. I was ready for anything until I noticed the wall of voodoo dolls was empty. I swallowed a lump in my throat as I pointed it out to Mary. We both collectively looked around and then up to the ceiling, where dozens of button eyes stared back at us. Forgot about those I said, having forgotten all about Creole's bodyguards. They fell on us like a pile of rats, each of them stabbing us with needles or razor blades or even little claws that they had built in. Mary had an easier time with it. She was made of porcelain, so it was much harder to actually hurt her. Me on the other hand. I was getting torn to shit. They slid down from my strings and just had a blast slicing me and stabbing me. Creole meanwhile struggled his way towards his office, most likely to sew up the damage to himself when the front door opened and a familiar British accent spoke out. Don't listen to him anymore. Olivia's mother shouted out. Her face twisted in fear and determination. All the voodoo dolls suddenly stopped and looked over to one that used to be among their ranks. Creole stared at her like he'd kill her if she said another word. But it didn't stop her. 
He has hurt all of us and caused you to forget who you used to be. You were all people once, lied to and betrayed by him. He's the enemy of us all. She pointed to the limping Creole, who looked around as all the dolls turned their head to him. You all got what was coming to you. You asked for something and I gave it to you. He declared. The voodoo dolls weren't persuaded, however. They all looked at each other and then leaped from me and Mary onto Creole. He cursed something fierce as they swarmed him and tackled him to the ground. It was like ants swarming dropped food. Thank you. I said to Olivia's mother. She waved it off and quickly took the scissors from me and reached up to cut off my strings. Only for me to stop her and point to my unconscious parents. Help them first, please. I said quickly. She looked at me with hesitation but quickly nodded. Kneeling and pulling each of them out of the shop. Was that part of your brilliant plan? Mary asked after a moment. I looked over to her and chuckled. Rubbing my combed hair and messing it up some. Sighing happily at being able to do that. Of course. I'm a master strategist. I declared. Although our joking was short-lived when Creel's hand burst through the pile of voodoo dolls and emerged from them. His button back and his stitches fixed. Guess having dolls made out of all the items he needed to fix himself up with to attack him wasn't the best idea. God, he was like a cockroach. Everyone's betraying me today. He snarled, fixing his tie and storming over to us. Me and Mary backed up and pointed our makeshift weapons at him. I peeked over him to see all the voodoo dolls lifeless on the floor. They had fought the good fight. I backed up and my foot hit something on the floor. Looking down, a beautiful sight met my eyes. My dad's simple lighter. It must have fallen out of his pocket when Olivia's mother had dragged him outside. Thank you so much for being a smoker, dad. I reached down and lifted up the item. Flicking it to life and tossing the burning flame over to the pile of voodoo dolls. And those babies must have been made of gasoline because they went up quicker than a forest fire. No. Creole screeched, staring back at me in horror as the fire began to spread further across the shop. You fucking idiot. Have you any idea what you've just done? He shouted at me, staring back at the growing inferno. The smoke from the voodoo dolls began to rise, but then the smoke seemingly turned at a 90 degree angle and headed down towards the basement. At the time I had no idea what had just happened. Now with hindsight, it was pretty clear. That smoke was the souls trapped in the voodoo dolls. And they were heading down to their bodies. Looks like your time on earth is finally up, Charles. Mary declared. Creole turned to her and grabbed her by the hair. Pulling her out of my reach and forcing me to stay stiff against the front door as he backed up away from me. Oh, don't think you ain't coming with me, whore. He snarled. I watched in horror as shambling rotting corpses started rising up from the darkness of the basement. Some had no flesh to speak of and were just bones shambling for their revenge. Creole looked back and shoved Mary into their waiting clutches. She was grabbed and began to be torn apart. I guess for eating their corpses maybe. I shouted, horrified that my only friend was being killed right before my eyes. But she looked back with not an ounce of fear in her eyes. Instead, she smiled and nodded towards me. I think it was her way of thanking me. For being with her. Being her friend. And helping her escape the hellish torture. She waved goodbye to me, and was shattered into a million fragment pieces. All of them shining and dropping to the floor. This ain't over Travis. I'll make sure you suffer for all of this. Creole screamed, as his shop was engulfed in fire, and the rotting corpses of his victims came closer and closer to him. His back to them as he shoved his finger towards me. You don't get out of this that easily. He screamed as he was grabbed from behind, and dragged back towards the basement door. He kicked and screamed, his stitched up mouth breaking open once more, and his sharp yellow teeth snapping at anything. This isn't over. He screamed one last time as the creatures pulled him down into the basement, and the fire engulfed the door. Then, the strings went slack, and fell to the ground. I looked at them, and my hands shook as they seemingly disappeared into thin air. I was free. But I didn't have time to waste. The fire was spreading fast, and I needed to get out of there, before I became one with the shop permanently. But there was one thing I knew I could save. Braving the roaring fire. I walked over to the counter and saw that my little template friend was still sitting there. I reached out and grabbed him. Shoving him into my pocket I quickly rushed out of the shop as the fires reached the ceiling. I exited and came upon Olivia's mother tending to my parents. He's gone. So is Mary. 
I said sadly, looking to the floor and starting to cry. She reached out and wrapped her loving arms around me, hugging me tight as I let out all my pent-up emotions out all over her. I may have been free from him, but I wasn't back to normal. I still had button eyes, pale skin, stitches across my neck, and those stupid rosy cheeks. Guess I would have expected that to change back to normal, but I guess not. Alexandra. The woman said after a period of letting me cry. I looked at her confused, and she gave a loving smile to me. My name. So you can stop calling me Olivia's mother. She chuckled, tousling my hair, and getting a sad, but genuine chuckle out of me. Guess I never did ask her her own name, huh? Alexandra helped me take my parents to our house just as the fire department showed up to fight the fire. Let's say the police were livid when they saw the burning voodoo establishment. Turns out, as told to me by Alexandra, that the police force made a deal with Creole decades ago. He keeps crime low for them, and they don't investigate when anyone goes missing. A beautiful partnership. It also explains why no one ever investigated us. And why that Ricky did. No one told him not to fuck around with King Creole. Arriving home with my parents, Alexandra assured me that their wounds were not serious and that they would recover. That left me plenty of time to think. To think about how to change myself back to normal. Don't get me wrong, immortality sounds great and all. But if it means once again being cooped up in my room for my entire life, I'd rather at least try to find a way to change back. I also had to find a way to tell my parents the entire story of what happened. Let's just say, this site helped a lot in that department, when they did wake up. It was a little awkward for them to see me like this at first. And I know they still try to avoid eye contact with me. But they still love me. And are so happy to have me back in the house with them. They offered to help me in my search to reverse this, but they've been through so much already, that I decided to go it alone. Well with the help of Alexandra and Olivia of course. And, the template. He's no normal voodoo doll. For once he can communicate with me. Well kinda, he leaves me little notes from time to time giving my advice and updates. More often than not it's that he loves me. Cute little guy is thankful I saved him. For now, I've been trying to get into contact with anyone who knows anything about voodoo and curses. Not much success. Just your usual nuts that shit themselves when they see me but I'm giving it my all to try and find a way to fix myself. Now more than ever, I've been able to finally fall asleep and enjoy a good night's sleep for the first time in who knows how long. But one night I had a dream. A nightmare really. I was back in the shop. The burnt out remains of the shop. And the only thing intact was the basement door. Reaching out to open it, I entered it and walked down the winding and twisting path. I made it down to the basement. There I saw him sitting in a chair waiting for me. He looked up at me with a big smile. A cup of wine in his hand as he looked up at me. My body froze as he set the cup next to him and stood up, walking over to me and giving a wider smile. I told him. It ain't over, Travis. He chuckled, patting my cheek and suddenly growing those sharp yellow fangs and leaning in to bite me. I woke up in a cold sweat, panting hard and looking around my room. Rubbing my head and shivering, I looked over to the voodoo template on my nightstand. And he knew why I was panting, he pointed to the window. I staggered over to it and looked out of it. In the darkness, one normally couldn't see what was standing out there. But with my button eyes, I saw him standing underneath the street lamp. He tipped his top hat to me, and when the street light flickered back on, he disappeared. He isn't dead. But I'll make sure he is. Adjusting to life after escaping King Creole wasn't easy. Not easy at all. Wearing normal clothes and not my suit felt strange like it was something wrong I shouldn't be doing. It was like I was an abused puppy getting used to life in a new loving home. I didn't trust anything at first. But soon enough I started getting used to things and eventually figured out some things about myself. The first thing is the fact that while I don't have to eat or sleep my body is capable of doing them. Eating is a challenge as food and drinks tend to leak out of my stitched up neck. My parents have thought it best to keep me hidden from the outside world, not that I'm complaining. People aren't exactly going to be very happy when they see what I look like. Although it did lead to some fun exchange with the police. 
C. They found my dad's simple lighter and the charred remains of all King Creel's half-priced voodoo store. And they soon paid a visit to my parents' house. I listened in from my spot in the living room and soon heard the conversation. You're under arrest for the crime of arson. The head cop declared, twisting my dad around and slapping the cuffs on him. He protested, thrashing around while my mom pleaded and begged to let him go. Clenching my fist I walked out from the living room and into view of the police. Let him go. I said, walking over to them. The cops each looked at each other in confusion. Clearly having thought me burned to a crisp in the blaze that had consumed their darling King Creel. I know about your deal with Creel. And let's just say I've got a good witness to let the press know why the missing people in this town aren't investigated. I threatened, crossing my arms and staring at them with my button eyes. Each cop looked like they were about to shit themselves as they quickly uncuffed my dad and retreated from the door. Their hands held up as I approached them and slammed the door in their faces. Looking back at my parents and confused by their scared expression. I'll explain later. That was all I said. And I would. When I myself had more answers for them. To date, I'm still not convinced that King Creel died in the blaze that consumed the voodoo shop. If my dreams and the fact I swear I see him from time to time are any indication that the old voodoo bastard is still alive I don't know what is. I've gotten in the habit of talking with Olivia and her mother Alexandra for advice. Seeing as Alexandra is the last living person that I still have a connection to from the voodoo shop, I run a lot of ideas past her. Today I braved the outside world, dressed up in my old hoodie with the hood up, and made my way over to their house. Making sure to keep my buttons on the lookout for Creel. Wherever he might be I know for a fact he isn't exactly happy that I torched his business. Making it safely to the small house the two lived in, I rang the bell. And Olivia ran out to give me a hug like she always did. You're here. Can we play checkers? She asked me as her little arms kept themselves around me as I let myself in. I smiled and patted her head. Something about how innocent and sweet she has always recharged my body. I'll see if I have time. Where's your mommy? I asked her, to which she smiled and let go of my waist. Taking my hand she led me to the living room, where Alexandra was reading over a pile of books. And when I say a pile, I say it was stacked from the floor up to the armrests that the chair had. Catching up on world history. I asked as Olivia went off to go keep herself entertained. No, I have the Netflix for that. She said, looking at me as she sighed and put the book she was reading down. Alexandra had been turned into a voodoo doll all the way back in 1927. So she was having some trouble adapting to all the new things that had happened since. When we told her we had a man on the moon and Britain no longer had an empire she nearly fainted. But she'd gotten used to a lot of the technology like TV and cell phones. I'm looking for a way to change you back. She said with an exhausted sigh. Any luck? The internet hasn't been much help. Either they want me to contact some voodoo gods or use a Ouija board or something. I sighed, sitting on the couch from across her. Picking up one of her books and raising a brow. Voodoo for dummies? I asked with a chuckle. Do not mock the knowledge of literature, Travis. And I do have a lead for you. In regards to King Creel's mother. She said, looking around the mess of books on the floor. Tapping her lips with her fingers as she looked for the correct book. Finding it after a few seconds and opening it up. Here. Mama Creel. She's buried in a cemetery a few miles outside of town. She said, offering me the book to look into. I grunted as I stood up and took the book from her. Looking down at the text and reading the passage. It definitely was Creel's mother as it mentioned her as the mother of the long deceased Charles Sumner. While this was good information, I was more confused as to what this had to do with my current situation. What? Want me to dig her up and have a nice conversation? I asked skeptically. Only for my shins to be kicked by her. Okay, I kinda deserve that. Try doing a seance to contact her. Alexandra explained, handing me a slim pamphlet from the stack of books next to her. Pouting as I took the item I looked down at it with a skeptical brow raised. Then again if my current situation is anything to go off of, I really should start believing that things I used to believe were fake are very much real. Be respectful. Voodoo spirits can be very unpredictable. I'm sure you know that well. She said with a soft smile. I responded with a chuckle and closed the book. She then handed me some candles and a lighter. Supplies for my seance. 
I'm sure we both know that. I responded, looking down at the pamphlet and nodding to her. Olivia came back with the doll of her old mother in her arms. Coming over and hugging me, just before I left. She seems to really like me Kindle like an older brother. It is sweet, and I do show my care for her as well. Bidding them goodbye I pull the hoodie back over my head and googling where this cemetery would be. Luckily enough it was within walking distance of the voodoo shop. Texting my parents and saying I would be out for a bit. Receiving pleas to not be out too long, I promised them and went on my way. Walking into the old part of town I stopped at the burnt out remains of the voodoo store. It was blocked off by police tape, but I easily stepped over it and entered the charred remains. I looked around at the barely recognizable store, stepping over soot and creaking wood. The big pile of ash on the floor was most likely where I lit the voodoo dolls on fire. Hearing a crunching sound I looked down at my feet and saw a few pieces of porcelain and my heart sank right through the floor. Damn it. I sighed hard. Leaning down and picking up the pieces and looking around for any more of them. But all I could find was those few shards of Mary. Her death tore me in many ways. She was finally free from Creole's abuse and her torture. But her manner of death really hurt me. But as long as she's finally free, I guess I shouldn't be too sad for her. Putting the porcelain shards on the charred counter I used to stand and sleep behind, I looked around one last time before heading my way towards the cemetery. Alexandra had failed to say that this cemetery was abandoned and overgrown to shit. Even the gate had dying vines, and I had to tug with all my strength to get the rusty gate open. Sighing in annoyance I looked around the old cemetery and started to walk around. Trying to find any indication of where Charles's mother was buried. Help ya, son. A nasally voice asked me. Now to say I nearly shit myself is an understatement. Who the hell expects a person to suddenly ask you a question in an abandoned cemetery? Spinning on my heels I turned my button eyes to see a tall black man in a top hat standing in a grave and leaning on a shovel. A big brown cigar in his mouth as he smiled at me. The fuck is wrong with you, son? I asked you a question. He said, smoke blowing out of his nose. I stammered, looking around and pulling my hood down. Cautiously coming over to the strange man who was billowing smoke like a chimney. I'm looking for a grave. There's one. One over there, another over there. He snickered as he pointed to graves in every direction. He raised his brows at me to see if I was satisfied with his response. He seemingly didn't give a shit about my button eyes. Then again I figured that he was some kind of voodoo person with his jetup. Mama Creel. Her grave. At that name, the man stood up. His eyes big and wide as he climbed out of the grave and blew smoke right in my face and it caused me to wave the smoke out of my face. Mama Creel, huh? Haven't heard that name in many many years. The fuck you gonna do with her grave? He asked me, getting right in my face. I'm so happy my sense of taste and smell is still gone from being turned into a puppet. Just by looking at him, I could tell he must have stunk. I want to do a seance. I responded, tapping my button eye with my finger. See if she can help me with this. I explained to the man. He took a good look at me, finger taking the cigar out of his mouth and nodding as he rubbed his chin. Yeah, I've seen shitty work like this before. He said, standing back and blowing out more of his smoke and chuckling. His voice was high and nasally. Her grave is behind you, six rows back. Can't miss it, it's got a big old statue of an angel on it. He pointed, causing my head to turn and look over. And when I turned to thank him, he had up and vanished on me. Stupid voodoo people, getting to teleport and shit. Making my way through the overgrowth and gravestones I did indeed come upon a giant angel statue. Guess King Creel wanted to make sure his mom was remembered all right. Scraping off the moss I was greeted by the words Mama Creel. So this was her grave. Kneeling down before it, I put out the candles that Alexandra had given me and carefully lit them. Didn't want to start a fire in this place. All right. Let's see if this'll work. I sighed, kneeling on my knees and sighing. Mama Creel. Um, my name is Travis. Your son has given me a voodoo curse, and I humbly beg for you to lift it. If you can. I looked at the grave expecting something to happen. The candles flickered a bit, but other than that not much else happened. Figured this wouldn't work either. I set about to give up. Until a rotting hand shot through the ground and grabbed me by the arm. Now that did get a loud scream out of me. 
as the hand yanked me down, as if pulling itself up. And sure enough, a worm-infested skull burst through the ground and met my button eyes. Keeping me in a death grip, and pulling itself until it was about waist deep in the dirt the corpse finally let me go. Standing up I tumbled backward against the grave behind me, and stared at the corpse. How can I help you, dear? The corpse asked me in a sweet and caring voice. Now that really threw me off. I know they say, don't judge a book by its cover. But when the cover is rotting and full of worms I probably wouldn't read that book. Uh, Mama Creole? I asked hesitantly. Getting a nod from the corpse. Some of its maggots fell to the ground as it did so. Well, I had my answer. I was currently talking to King Creole's mother. I need your help. I said after sitting back up from my backward tumble. Obviously, dear. You don't just call on me if you have nothing to chat about. She giggled. Waiting for me to get over the fact I was talking to a corpse. Still not the weirdest thing that's happened to me, if I'm being really honest with myself. Your son, Charles. He cursed me, well really he murdered me then brought me back to life to be his puppet. Is there any way for you to reverse it? I asked her, looking into those vacant eye holes to try and get any kind of idea of what she was going to say. And it wasn't what I was expecting. Oh. You're that Travis. She said in a disgusted tone, pulling herself further out of her grave. Clutching my arm again, and pulling me back into her face. The same Travis, that dared to hurt my darling, boy. She hissed opening her jaw up, and leaning in to bite me. He tried to kill my parents. I shouted back at her, pushing her moldy corpse and trying to keep her away from me. Why does this always happen to me? I really should have gone to college instead of taking this stupid voodoo job. He's out of control and killing innocent people. I shouted, still struggling with the surprisingly strong corpse. He was teaching you a lesson you ungrateful puppet. She snarled, taking a bite on my arm. Luckily her teeth didn't get through thanks to my hoodie sleeve. Looking around for a weapon, I grabbed one of the candles and shoved it into her face. The sizzling of her rotten face was enough to get her to let me go. I quickly blew out both candles, and soon enough she was seemingly dragged back into her grave by some unseen force. Hurling every insult known to man at me. So much for her being able to help me. Should have figured the woman who created King Creole, in both senses of the word, would stand by him no matter what he did. Well, now I was back to square one. Packing up the things I came with, I quickly got out of there and started on my way home. Being sure to avoid the voodoo shop this time. Making it home I skipped on eating and just went up to my room. Plopping myself onto my bed with a loud and annoyed groan. I would have passed out if someone hadn't started pulling at my hair. Yes, Tempe. I asked in an annoyed groan. Turning my head to look at the voodoo doll. He waved his little arms at me and held up a scrap of paper. He was learning how to write better and must have been reading the alphabet books my mom used to get me when I was in kindergarten. Sighing as I sat up in bed I took the little scrap of paper and read it. Basement. Something down. Okay, maybe he still isn't the best at writing. But hey he's getting there at least. I looked at him confused. Thinking at first that he meant my basement. Then it clicked and I remembered the store's basement door. I looked over at the desk where I had put the basement door key. Then I looked back at him. If he's down there and causes my death, I'm going to be so pissed at you. I declared at my little template friend. Getting out of bed and taking the key and shoving it in my pocket. Once again telling my parents I was going out. This time I didn't say I was going to the voodoo shop. They'd lock me in my room if I told them that's where I was going. Pulling my hood over my head and heading off towards the voodoo shop I was having second thoughts about this. And they got worse when I once again ducked under the police tape and entered into the burnt out shell of a shop. Swallowing a lump in my throat I approached the scorched basement door. Producing the key from my pocket I inserted it into the keyhole and opened up the door. It was as dark and endless as it always was. Producing my phone and walking into the darkness I held my breath the entire way down. The stairs were spared from the flames that engulfed the store, most likely thanks to the door, so I didn't have to worry about falling through them. Although when I finally touched the solid stone I stood there for a good solid minute. Too afraid to move a muscle. Come on Travis. You got this man. My weak attempt at a pep talk did manage to walk a few steps as I looked around the basement. To my surprise the entire basement was empty. No bodies, no table where I got my head cut off, no nothing. I was kinda disappointed really. 
I half expected all those corpses that dragged Creole away to still be down here. Slightly bolstered, I walked my way deeper into the basement to look around for something. There had to be a reason Tempe had sent me down here. And I tripped over it. Landing flat on my face with a hard thud, I looked at what had caused me to trip. Creole's cane. That really caused me to have some traumatic flashbacks. Getting beaten by that thing on nearly a daily basis still caused me to wake up and expect the pain to come to me. It was Creole's favorite way of getting me up from behind the counter. Sitting up, I reached out and grabbed the item. Rubbing the white head of it and sighing I used it to help get me back up. You found my cane. An all too familiar voice said to me. Causing me to freeze in place and clutch the item in my hands for dear life. Turning around my fears were confirmed when I saw him sitting in the same comfy chair I've seen in my dreams. Be a good boy and bring me the cane, Travis. He hummed, beckoning me to come over. I took backward steps and turned to run. Only to slam into a stone wall that suddenly was behind me. Why you can't do this to me? You're dead. I shouted at him, lifting the cane up and ready to smack him in his stupid smiling face. He chuckled at me and stood up from the chair. The wall suddenly started to push me towards the voodoo king. I've died before. I'll most likely die again. But as long as I have a way back, I'll never let you go, Travis. You belong to me. He said sweetly. Like the tone of the parent saying they aren't mad, just disappointed. Soon the wall had pushed me all the way to him, and he grabbed me by the throat. Easily he caught my futile attempt at hitting him with a cane, and he yanked it from my hands. Why you forgot one important thing. I choked out as he strangled me. He looked at me with some confusion before I rammed my head into his, causing him to grunt and fall backwards against his chair. Reaching down I picked up the cane he had dropped and swung it against him hitting him in the head and lifting the cane up to do it again. You don't have control over me. I huffed, lifting up the cane higher to do it again. Until I felt something wrap around my arm. Don't I? He asked with a chuckle, spitting out some of the black sludge from his mouth. I looked up in horror as the strings began to descend onto me. This couldn't be happening. I yanked my arm against the strings and tried to break it. I even tried chewing through the fucking thing. Soon another string came and wrapped itself around my other arm. Pulling both arms hard I was forced to dangle a couple of inches off the floor. Mama told me that you visited her. He said with a chuckle. Getting off the floor and dusting himself off. He stood and picked up the cane I had dropped and marveled at it with some appreciation. Yeah. She looked almost as ugly as you. I shot back. Receiving a hard smack from the cane against my face. I don't even know why I said that. Guess I was just pissed off at ending up in this situation again. I must teach you some manners. Since your parents clearly didn't. He chuckled, lifting his cane up to smack me again. Only for him to be grabbed by the shoulder. We both looked at the hand in confusion. Only Creel was spun around and decked right in the face. Sending him flying into me and falling to the floor. Whatever had just hit Creel stepped out into my field of view. And instantly melted my heart. Mary. I called out. Mary appeared to me as she looked when Creel had forced her to sing on stage. She smiled at me and shook her head. Part of your master plan, huh? She asked me. Coming over and cutting me down from my string captors. Rubbing my wrists I quickly wrapped my arms around her and hugged her tight. She patted me on the back before pushing me away. You have to wake up quickly. Take the cane with you. She said, pointing to the item. Creole nowhere to be seen. I quickly nodded and grabbed the item. Now what? I asked, only for her to stab me in the leg with a metal nail filer. Sending me screaming and suddenly waking up on the stone floor of the basement. I looked around quickly in confusion. Had I just dreamed all that? Well, judging by the fact I had the cane in my hands it must have been real. Great, now I'm in some nightmare on Elm Street shit. I looked around before I stood back up and held onto the cane. Heading back upstairs and quickly closing the door behind me. Rubbing my head, I looked around and saw that night was quickly falling. How long had I been down there? I shrugged it off and quickly made my way out of the burnt out shop and off on my way. Making it home, I was scolded and hugged by my parents who had been worried sick over me. I said I was sorry and that I promised to come down and eat something after I was done with something I had to do in my room. Heading up there I opened the door and looked at Tempe sitting on my bed. You're in big trouble. 
I huffed, tossing the cane on the bed, and watching as he stood up and examined it. So he's in my dreams now or something? I asked Tempe, who merely shrugged at me. As in the dark in this, as I was. Both of us were startled when a fucking rock came through my window. Landing on the bed it was covered in blood. Looking over to the window I stuck my head out to see who had done it. Then instantly stuck it back in, and covered my mouth so as not to scream. Standing on the street, was the rotting corpse. And next to it was Creel. When I poked my head back out to see again, they were gone. Great. Now I have two angry voodoo creatures after me. I did not leave my room for almost two days after I saw the two standing down on my street. Let's just say seeing two people that wanted me dead were staring at me from my street and driveway, really kinda made me want to hide my room. But they didn't do anything, and soon they disappeared and caused me to quickly call Alexandra. After about two minutes of her trying to figure out how to use a phone, she finally got a hang of it. Hello. She said rather loudly, causing me to take my phone away from my ear. Alexandra you don't have to shout. I can hear you just fine. I chuckled, putting the phone back to my ear. I could tell the gears in her head turning before she apologized for shouting at me. It was an easy thing to shrug off. Especially with what my life has become. Were you able to talk to King Creel's mother? She asked me. Causing me to check out the window, to check if the woman in question would suddenly appear just by the mention of her name. Oh yeah, I did. She was not happy to meet me, and now I think her corpse is walking around and wanting to kill me. I said sitting on my bed with a groan. Tempe climbed up on my lap soon enough and offered a scrap of paper with a heart on it. Gosh, this guy really has changed since tearing angrily at me whenever I was on my phone. Oh no. I feared this may happen. Were you respectful to her? Alexandra quickly asked, the sound of books being flipped through. If by respectful you mean sticking a candle in her face. Then yes, I was most respectful to her. I answered. The long period of silence told me that she was certainly not amused by my attempt to make a joke out of this situation. Did you at least tell her goodbye? She asked exasperated. Was I supposed to do that? I asked her with a raised brow. The sounds of her books falling to the floor painted the picture of her facipoming. In my defense, I only skimmed that long ass list of things I was supposed to do for a seance. This is bad, Travis. Very, very bad. She groaned, stacking the books back on her lap and sighing hard. I think you've angered her spirit enough for her to cross back into the mortal realm. Well, that explains why her and Creel were outside my house the other day. This time I heard her hand smack her forehead. I'm pretty sure I was causing her to age rapidly just through this conversation. What else did you screw up? Her tone was one of worry. Fair enough, at this point, I belong in a Looney Tunes episode with how incompetent I was in doing all of this. I met a black guy with a top hat and smoking a cigar that told me where Mama Creel was buried. I said. Once again all her books fell to the floor. I'm guessing she stood up from the chair she was sitting in. You what she shouted, causing me to pull the phone away again. Did you meet Baron Samedi without even knowing it now I've heard that name before? Mostly thanks to you guys and my previous attempts of escaping the half-priced voodoo store. He's a voodoo loa. Basically a spirit. He's the spirit of the dead, so kinda makes sense I found him in the graveyard. I guess I did. He blew smoke in my face and showed me where Mama Creel was buried. Then he was gone. I told Alexandra. Who was quickly running around and probably finding a book on loas. I waited for her to finish before I asked her. Why? Can he help me or am I going to have an evil voodoo god on my ass as well? He might be able to help you. But you need to do it very carefully and don't screw it up. She said in a disappointed mother's tone. Agreeing I pulled a notepad out and started to scribble what she told me. You need to offer him cigars, rum, coffee, or even simple bread. Then he might decide to help you. Might. What do I gotta offer him a human sacrifice to? I asked skeptically only to be yelled at to take this seriously. Pouting as I wrote down her instructions, I finally got everything written down and hung up on her with the promise that I wouldn't fuck this up. Heading downstairs I went into my dad's office and opened up his cigar box, shoving a couple into my pockets and borrowing his sipple lighter. Looking around in his liquor cabinet I was annoyed to find no rum, so I hoped that the cigars were enough. Telling my mom I would be back she warned me about the fact it was going to rain, but I shrugged it off. 
That's what hoodies are for after all. Running off towards the cemetery again I checked around the alleyways and lampposts to make sure the gruesome duo weren't anywhere near me. Making it to the cemetery I entered into the same path I cut open last time and went into the cemetery. Looking around for any sign of the Loa. Baron Samedi. I have an offering for you. If you want them. I shouted out in the abandoned cemetery. Walking around I took the chance and went to check on Mama Creole's grave. And swallowed hard when I saw the grave had been emptied of its contents. The hell you want, boy? The nasally voice suddenly asked me. Causing me to look behind myself and nearly stumble into the empty grave. The top hat wearing black man looked down at me with a raised brow as he looked down at me. Swallowing hard I reached into my pockets and pulled out the cigars. His tone changed as he gave me a rotting yellow tooth smile as he took one and smelled it. Sticking it in his mouth he chewed off the end and spit it out into the ground. A light. I asked him, holding up the zippo and flicking it to life. He smiled at me and leaned in. Taking a few puffs to get the cigar going and blowing out a stream of smoke. He nodded with a chuckle and looked down at me. Now, what can I do for you? He asked me, his tone much more friendly as he took in the scent of the cigar, was much more excited and happy. I need your help. Can you save me from King Creole and his mother? I asked him in desperation. He looked down at me as he happily puffed away on my dad's cigar. Stroking his chin and chuckling he looked down at me and tapping some ash onto me. Sorry, Sonny. I can't do anything. Mama Creole and I go very far back. And I cannot go back on it. He shrugged. I stared at him in horror, it really seemed like everything wanted to fuck me with a barbed wire bat. Oh don't worry. I'm not gonna turn you over to her. I'm far too busy to care about what she and her spoiled brat do. He waved it off, holding the cigar in his mouth. But you also won't help me. I asked him, he looked at me with a raised brow and chuckling. Look, I hate her some more than anything. But she has a deal with me. Keep his rotting corpse alive no matter what. But, since you gave me this beautiful cigar I'll make a deal with you. He said with a smile. I would have accepted his offer no question. Except the crack of thunder and strike of lighting showing me that the Baron was a skeleton staring down at me. Wait. Wait. I'll give you all this. I shouted, sticking my hands into my pockets and showing off the cigars. His eyes nearly leaped out of his head when he saw all of them. I'll give you them if you give me a good deal. No strings attached. I said, handing over the cigars. I like you kid. You're smart. He said with a toothy grin. Chewing on the cigar he had already and nodding happily. All right kid. I'll give you a hint as to how to beat him. He chuckled happily and blew smoke in my face again. Force him in the ground. I'll take care of the rest. He said with a smile. I stared at him in confusion, but when he blew smoke in my face I coughed up a storm. And when I saw that he was gone I sighed hard in annoyance. I hate riddles. Walking back home as the rain started and thunder cracked loud, I looked down at the ground as I thought of the riddle. I stepped in puddles as I made it to my neighborhood. And when I got to my house I froze in place. As my front door was open and split in half. Rushing inside I looked around the house in horror as I looked for any sign of my mother. And I found her alright. Travis, my boy. A familiar voice greeted me. He sat in my dad's chair, smiling with his stitched up mouth as he took a sip of coffee from a cup. With my mother's head sitting on the table next to him. My legs gave out as I fell to the floor, covering my mouth and shivering. Your mother makes a beautiful cup of coffee. Shame this was her last one. He giggled, smiling at me and standing up. Tossing the cup to the floor and walking over to me. You fucking monster. I screamed, standing up and rushing to tackle him. Only to be stuck in the back of the head and falling next to him. Looking up I was met by a tan-skinned woman dressed in one of my mother's dresses. Her hair was black and curled as she looked down at me like she'd stepped on a bug. Sweetheart, are you sure he's the one you want to keep? She asked Creole. Handing him the item she had hit me with. Which turned out to be his cane. He happily took the item and pushed my cheek hard with it as he put his weight against him. Yes, mom. Since he took Mary away from me, I want him to be her replacement. He said with a smile. Replacing his cane with his dress shoe. Grinding it into my face and chuckling all the while. You piece of shit. I snarled trying to push him off of me. Only for me to get hit on the head again with his cane. 
That certainly brought back some fun memories. You'll never get away with this. I swear to god I'll rip you to fucking pieces I screamed at him. Both he and his mother were smiling at my pathetic attempts to escape. I knew I had to do something. And the item in my pocket was the only thing I could think of. Reaching into my pocket I brought the zippo out and lit it up and put it up to Creole's suit pants. You little shit. He screamed, pulling his foot away and slapping the growing flames on his legs. His mother gasping and trying to help him put the fire out. Pushing myself up and heading towards the stairs I ran up to my room and slammed the door. Huffing hard as I shoved a door against it. I slid down the door as I shivered at the thought of my dead mother. I curled up hard and planted my face into my hands. I wish I could shed a tear for her. My button eyes prevent me, but my body still acts as it can cry. The sound of them slamming against my door and clawing at it caused me to stand up and look around the room. I saw Tempe jumping up and down on the desk pulling my attention over to him. I went over to him and picked him up, shoving him into my pocket and scribbling down a note for my dad. Hopefully, he could read my horrible handwriting. Going to the window I slid stepped out of it and crawled across the roof. Heading down the drain pipe and running away from my house as fast as I could. I arrived at the house of Alexandra and Olivia and stumbled into Alexandra's arms as I cried into her. Barely being able to tell her what had happened. She quickly took me inside and sat me in a chair. Running off to get me some towels. Sitting there and crying into my hands I felt some arms wrap around me. Looking up from my hands I saw it was Olivia hugging my leg to try and make me feel better. Smiling a bit I pat her head and reached into my pocket, showing off Tempe to her. Which caused her to gasp and ask to play with him. As Alexandra arrived with towels she wrapped me up in them and sat next to me with a hard sigh. She hugged me and assured me I was safe here. She patted me on the back and tried to get me to tell them what had happened. He cut my mother's head off. And his mother isn't a rotting corpse anymore. She's got skin and shit now. I mumbled, pulling the towels wrapped around me tighter. I lit him on fire again and ran off. I said sadly, looking up to her and sighing hard. It doesn't surprise me. She is a master at voodoo, and most likely only appears to be human again. She most likely is using a spell to appear human again. Alexandra explained, rubbing my shoulders lovingly. Trying to keep me from breaking down and crying all over again. Did you get in contact with Baron Samedi? She asked. Yeah. He's got a deal with Mama Creole to keep Charles alive. He only offered help with a stupid riddle. I said with a sigh. Looking up at her when she made a gesture to tell me what it was. Force him in the ground. I'll take care of the rest. I explained. She looked at me and stroked her own chin and thought. Looking at me and asking Olivia to get her one of the books on her table. She nodded, carefully putting Tempe down on the table and grabbing the book. Running over and handing it to her mother. She thanked her daughter and flipped through the book. Um, he is the Loa of the dead. My best guess is to put King Creole in the grave. He'll then most likely lead his soul to the underworld. Alexandra thought out loud. Looking at me. I gave her a skeptical look at her. Ah yes. I lay on the ground and you push him over me into the grave we dug for him. I mumbled to her. Getting kicked in the shins for my smart mouth. Rubbing my leg I sighed and looked at her. Even if we get him in the grave what's stopping him from coming back? He said he would take care of the rest. I guess we must simply get him in the ground. She said. Closing the book and looking at me. Our silence was broken by the window being broken. And my mother's head rolled to my feet. I looked at it and looked over to the window. You left something at home, Travis. Creole's voice rang out, laughing at me. I stood up and walked over to the window and stared in anger at the voodoo king standing on the sidewalk. He smiled back and waved at me. He can't come in. He wouldn't hurt Olivia. It's the one thing he won't do. She explained pulling me away from the window and covering my mother's head with a towel. She sat me back down and went back to the window, clearing her throat. King Creole. I would appreciate it if you leave my property. She said softly. He looked at her with a tilt to his head and shrugged. Tipping his top hat and walking off down the street. He'll still find a way to get in. I said with a mumble. Looking at the lump of a towel on the floor. Curling up in the chair and sighing hard. Travis. It's so cold. So cold. A voice came from the towel. I looked at it and reached a trembling hand out to pull the towel away. Seeing that my mother stared up at me with a sorrowful expression. It's so dark and cold. She mumbled softly. 
I stared at her and stood up, walking off to the bathroom and locking myself in there. I spent a long time there, covering my ears and just dry sobbing. The fucking monster killed my mom. And the last thing I said to her was that I loved her. I wish I could have hugged her and taken her with me. To keep her safe. It's all my fault. It took me four hours to get out of Alexandra's bathroom. By the time I finally managed enough strength to get out, Alexandra had removed my mother's head and assured me that she was in a better place. The usual crap that gets said to you when a loved one dies. Olivia offered a hug to me and I gladly accepted. Even Tempe gave me a hug the best he could. Afterward, Alexandra let me sit and cope with everything while she went about trying to come up with a way to get Creole into a grave. Soon my phone started ringing, and what I feared happened had happened. My dad had found my decapitated mother sitting at the kitchen table. To say he was hysterical was an understatement. Hey, dad. I said when I answered the phone. Pulling the phone from my ear as he talked a million miles an hour. Asking what had happened, if I was safe, who could have done it. Heck. It was my boss. I answered simply. I'll rip that fucking bastard's head off. My dad screamed. Sighing I rubbed my button eyes with my hand and looked at Alexandra for any kind of reassurance. But she was nose deep in another book, so I wasn't going to get anything from her at the moment. No, you won't dad. He's more dangerous than you could ever know. Look, just get out of town okay. I'll handle this. Just get out before something happens to you. I can't lose you too. I whimpered to him. That seemingly got him out of his murderous rage. He calmed down and became easier to talk to. Okay, son. If you think that's the best course of action for us. He said with a long sigh. It was obvious he was holding in all his pain and loss at that moment. Be safe, son. I can't lose you again either. He said. A rare moment of emotion from my father. It brought a sad smile to my face. I nodded and said I loved him. He returned the favor and we both hung up. Sinking back into the chair, Olivia tugged at my jeans and forced me to look down over to her. She climbed up into my lap and hugged my torso. She's a good kid. I can't think of any way of getting King Creole into a grave. Alexandra sighed, coming back into the living room and sitting on the couch next to us. But the annoyed frown turned into a smile when she saw the scene before her. Come here, Livy. Let's let Travis rest for a bit. He's been through a lot today. Olivia obeyed and came over to her mother. No, I'm okay. I said, standing up and looking at the spot where my mother's head had landed. Shaking it off I looked over to the street and struck my chin and thought. The shop is out of the question. The basement floor is stone and who knows what's underneath the floorboards. I sighed. And most likely his mother knows all too well her son's weakness. Alexandra responded to Olivia, sitting on her lap and looking up while her mother brushed her hair. So luring him to a graveyard is also out of the question. What about pushing him in a hole? Olivia asked, wanting to be a part of this conversation. I thought about it, then realized something. Force him into the ground. That doesn't mean it has to be in a grave. Hell, I can force him into a ditch and that counts as the ground. I said, looking to the mother-daughter duo, who looked back at me with raised brows. Alexandra looked down at Olivia and then up to me. I have a very intelligent daughter. She hummed with a proud smile. Her accent was just a bit more posh than usual. Our moment of excitement was cut off by a loud thud upstairs. We both looked up in terror. What was that? I asked in hushed fear. It came from Olivia's room. Alexandra mumbled, looking down at Olivia. The little girl also looked up, the gears in her young head thinking about what could be in her room at that moment. The only thing up there is the dolly Mr. King Creole gave me she said, causing me and Alexandra to look at each other in terror. There's no way. He wouldn't dare stoop that low. Would he? The loud thuds coming down the stairs behind us quickly dispelled any doubts we had. You little shit. Came a screech as something dragged itself down the stairs. Sophie, Olivia's old mother, was dragging herself down the stairs. Only the woman was looking worse for wear. She still appeared to be half dull half human. As such, she was once again a full-sized human. But some of her body still appeared to be made of fabric, and the parts that were made of skin were so tight to their fabric counterpart. She was bleeding and unable to stand on her legs, which seemingly had no bones in them. 
Olivia screamed at the sight of her original mother and clambered into Alexandra's arms. The mother quickly scooped up her daughter and put some distance between her and the woman whose daughter she had taken. I armed myself with the only thing at arm's length. A heavy ass book. The creature called towards us as we backed up. And to break the tension, I threw that heavy ass book at her. The fact I cracked her face straight down the middle didn't seem to bother her. In fact, she just spawned long needle-like teeth all the way down that split in her head. Maybe we should run. I said quickly. Which got nods from both girls. All of us booking it out of the house and out into the streets. I headed towards the car as Alexandra and Olivia piled in with me. Do you know how to drive this automobile? Alexandra asked me in a panic as I buckled myself in. I looked at her and nodded. Yay I took one semester of driver's ed. Just because I didn't finish it doesn't mean I don't know how to drive. Throwing it in reverse I smashed into their mailbox. But after that, I managed to get onto the street and gun it. It might have been bumpy any time I tried to break, but it wasn't too bad if I do say so myself. Alright, well now where do we go? I asked the pair. Keeping my eyes on the road and praying no cop tried to pull me over. Although by my looks I'm sure that they'd probably let me go. I do look like the guy they work for after all. Perhaps your house. You do not have any kind of voodoo in there do you? Alexandra asked me as she struck Olivia's head. The little girl was curled up, her head resting in her mother's head. Poor girl. No. None except Tempe. I suddenly realized, slamming the brakes hard and searching my pockets for him. I looked back at Olivia to see if she had brought him, and thanks to whatever messed up god there is, she did. The doll was busy being squeezed by the afraid little girl. I breathed a sigh of relief as I turned back to continue driving. Yeah. Except for him, we should be okay. I sighed as I drove us to my house. Arriving there I saw that my dad's car was long gone. I entered the house first, hoping that my dad had moved my mother's headless body. He had, and I thanked him for that. Letting them in, I sat them both on our living room couch and went to go put on some coffee and find something for Olivia to try and eat. Stepping over the puddle of blood I went to the sink and washed out the coffee pot. She's asleep. Alexandra said as she entered the kitchen. Also stepping over the blood puddle and coming over to me. How long has it been since you've eaten? She asked me, looking at my pale face with some bit of concern. A couple of days. I don't need to eat like this. I said, going and starting up the coffee machine. I received a sympathetic rub of my arm. Causing me to sigh hard and shake my head. Try to eat something. I'll handle the coffee. She said with a soft smile. I responded with a defeated nod and made my way over to the cabinets. Opening them, I was instantly greeted by a familiar smiling face. Travis my boy. You wouldn't believe how long I've been waiting for you. He chuckled, reaching his foot out and kicking me in the face. Sending me crashing against Alexandra and landing flat on my ass. He easily hopped out of my cabinets and straightened himself up nice and good. I backed up away from him as he approached me and Alexandra. You were waiting here for my dad, were you I shouted, standing up and grabbing the first thing in arm's reach. Which turned out to be the coffee pot. Swinging it around I managed to smash it over his head, sending him back a bit and soon enough causing him to lean against the wall, covering his head as his hat fell from his messy black hair. Maybe I was, maybe I wasn't. The important thing is that I have you and this traitor in the same place at the same time. He chuckled, reaching down and picking up his hat. Dusting it off with some dramatic flair, he placed it back on his head with a chuckle. Don't worry about Olivia either. Mama always was a good babysitter. He said with a smile, the stitches on his mouth nice and tight as he did so. Alexandra grew pale as she looked out of the kitchen and towards the couch, where she had left Olivia to sleep. But Creole stepped between us and the living room. His cane tapped on the floor with malice as he began closing the distance between him and us. I looked to Alexandra who was shaking in fear. Looking back at my former boss, I swallowed some of my fear and placed myself in front of her and Creole. Fuck you, Charles. I sneered, grabbing him by the collar and slamming him into the wall. My act of bravado was quickly subdued once I was hit in the head again by a hard object. Sending me slumping against the voodoo king. He caught me easily and chuckled, patting my head with his gloved hands. Thank you, Alexandra. I always knew you were a good girl. I cocked my head back in horror as he said those words. Alexandra stood with a pot in her hands. Another betrayal. 
And this one hurt the most out of all of them. She looked away with me, tears in her eyes as she backed away and let the voodoo creature take me away from my own house. As I slipped into unconsciousness I cursed under my breath. I'm sorry, Travis. She mumbled to me. I didn't really blame her. Between me and Olivia I would have chosen her as well. No hard feelings Alexandra. Although at the time I wanted to call her every swear word in the book. But I was dragged away and slipped into the ether as I was dragged out of my home. Wake up, young man. A woman's voice said. Tapping my cheek with some force to wake me up. As the vision came back to my buttons I looked around confused. This wasn't the store or even the basement. It was another stage. Similar to the one Charles had dedicated a song to his mother from. I was tied to a chair and looked around as everything became clear. You. Your mama Creole. I asked with a raised brow as I struggled against the ropes keeping me bound. She smiled at me and nodded, pulling a chair out and sitting down in front of me. Seeing her in good light and right in front of her, she was certainly looking good for her age. Especially since last I saw of her she was a rotting corpse. Her skin was tan like caramel and she had big black locks. Charles certainly has a liking for you. He's a sweet boy and I'm so happy he's made a friend. She said with a smile and a sigh. She suddenly produced a makeup kit and patted me with it. It appeared to be a white powder. Now ever since I was turned into a voodoo puppet, my skin has been as chalk white as Creole's. So smashing my white face with white powder seemed just pointless. Some friend he is to me. I mumbled under the constant smashings of the pad. She stopped and suddenly shoved a knife blade at my face, lowering the blade and plucking at the stitches around my throat. I swallowed hard as I stood still. She smiled as he dragged the knife across my throat. My, he did a very good job of bringing you back to life. He really was paying attention all those years. She smiled, pulling back and going back to cleaning me up. Producing some red paint and touching up my cheeks. It was like she was getting me ready for some kind of show. And when that thought came across my mind I instantly started to panic. Wait. Is he going to make me dance again? I mumbled, holding as still as I could as she touched up my cheeks. Please don't. I can't do that again. I begged her. She stopped her painting of me and looked at me. Pursing her lips in some thought as she looked me up and down. I know how painful it must feel, dear. But can you imagine what my poor Charles went through? When that whore and her thugs ripped out his eyes and cut off his head. My sweet baby boy didn't deserve that. She sighed, producing a comb and starting to brush my messy black hair back down into the comb state it used to be in. I don't deserve this I shouted at her, receiving a hard smack from her when I did so. She looked down at me like I was scum and grabbed me by the hair like Creole used to do when he was beyond pissed off. Know this, young man. I might have sided with you if you hadn't burned his store down and attempted to kill him with his own victims. She snarled, shoving me back and going back to combing me. Yup. She was just as crazy as her son. Maybe all those years in the dirt really sent her in a downward spiral. Or me waking her up made her grouchy. Mama. Are you almost done? A familiar voice asked from behind the stage. Creole's face poking out from behind the curtain. I craned my neck back to try and see, but it was forced back into place and I received another smack from his mother. Almost done baby. She hummed, waving him away back behind the counter and smiling down at me. You know, he's always wanted to post one of those stories like you do. Maybe after this performance he can. She asked with a smile. I only responded with silence. Nodding as if I had agreed with her, she stood and made her way down to the stage seats and sat in the front row. After a moment the ropes tied around me fell off and soon the strings came back down. I stared up in horror and tried to run. Only to fall on the stage floor and look back to see that my shoelaces had been tied together. And that once again I was back in a suit. Oh, God. It was happening again. And now. Came a thundering voice from seemingly nowhere. The strings firmly attached themselves to me again. Despite my thrashings and bitings at them. Soon they forced me to my feet. The familiar hard thug of them sending my body stiff and unresponsive to my brain signals. But they responded to someone else. A performance of great proportions. Travis, the dancing puppet. Came the thundering voice. My stiff body was forced to bow before the crowd of Creole's mother. A smile forced back onto my face, and I stood at attention. The sweet melodies of the piano began. 
I already knew who it was, but the announcer made the obvious known. And the pianist extraordinaire, himself. King Creole. The announcer shouted. Creole appearing in a puff of smoke, the melody turning into fast keystrokes as he went to town on the keys. I bit my tongue in anticipation of the pain. But nothing could prepare me for it. When the strings pulled tight and forced me to dance it was like I was tied to two horses and being pulled apart. Every swing and step I took was like a nail into each and every inch of my body. Mama Creole clapped in delight as she watched the scene. I smiled my stupid smile as I was forced to dance faster and faster as Creole seemingly picked up the pace of his playing with every dance move I made. He knew full well how much this hurt. And he wanted me to feel each and every tug and pull of the strings. I don't know how long he went for, but when it was finally over I felt like I was barely being kept together with shitty scotch tape. I hung limply from the strings. They were keeping me dangled up about an entire three or four feet from the ground. And it soon felt as if my arms would be ripped off. A beautiful performance. Mama Creole clapped, walking up on stage and throwing her arms around her son. He smiled and chuckled as he looked over at me. Tilting his head at me and enjoying the throbbing pain I was in. You look good like that, Travis. Maybe I'll keep you like that. Keeps you from snooping around. He said with a smile, taking his cane from his mother's hands and swinging it against my side. If the strings making me dance was like a million tiny paper cups at once, the swing of his cane was like being thrown into a salt and lemon bath with all my paper cuts. It was blinding pain as I screamed out. Charles, don't play with your toys like that. Mama Creole scared, walking over and stopping him from swinging at me again. Save it for tomorrow, when he feels even worse. She hummed, kissing his forehead and pulling him away. They talked for a few minutes before leaving me suspended from the stage. In complete darkness. I'm fucking back here again. My only ally has thrown me under the bus. And here I am back with the fucking strings and forced to dance for the psycho and his mother. I'll get out of here. I'll show him. I will. How about King Creole take over for a spell? Travis needs a break after all. I'm sure many of you are very concerned about Travis. But don't be. He's safely suspended from the stage where I left him. Just let him have some rest and let King Creole have a chance of talking to y'all. I must say, many of you seem to hate me. Maybe even despise me for kicking little old Travis like he's a puppy. Some in particular are very hostile to me. And I can understand that. You've all been hearing from a biased source after all. I would hate me as well. But why should I care about what any of you think? After all, you are some of the people that turned my puppet against me after all. Started planting all of those doubts into his little mind. Think about that, if faceless creatures started planting doubts in something you care about. But I don't hold grudges. Especially with possible future clients. Travis has been rather good at detailing what working for me once looked like. And of course, you know the tragic story of Charles Sumner. But Travis is leaving a big hole in the story. Something that for some reason he didn't say. And that concerns the sweet Ms. Elizabeth. Or has she liked to be called, Liz. From his account, I forced him to take the young Ms. Liz down into the basement and turned her into a doll. I did that, I won't deny my beautiful work after all. But he didn't tell all of you what happened shortly after I tied her down. Now if you recall I had been very rudely shot several times in the face by the young Liz. Needless to say, I wasn't exactly happy about this situation. But I was not one to worry over such trivial situations. Travis stood dutifully next to me as my body healed itself. Liz thrashed and yelled out for Travis to help her. But the strings kept him docile and under my control. Travis, be a good boy and look away for this part. We must be respectful of the young lady. I hummed as I produced a knife from my suit pocket. Travis was forced to turn around by the strings and be kept still as I sliced off Liz's clothes. Some may think me a pervert, but I assure you all that I take no pride in doing such things to a woman. It simply makes the process easier if she is nude. Finishing up with that I made my way over to Travis. Anything else, sir? He asked me in that cheery tone I love so much. His button eyes looked into mine, and I knew in his mind he was wishing he could do what Henry and his thugs did to me a hundred times over. But now he was safely under my control. Just stay here while I get the necessary materials. 
I smiled, patting him on his back and heading to the corner to grab some pieces of porcelain. Making sure that whore was in her proper place in the corner. I knew the whole time she and Travis were planning a way of escape, but I was confident enough that it would fail, and I was interested to see where it would all go wrong. As I gathered the pieces of porcelain I needed I heard Ms. Liz let out a loud scream. I looked over confused and saw Travis climbing on top of her. For a moment I thought I had lost control over him. But I still felt the strings connected to my fingers. So what was he doing? More importantly, why wasn't he standing in place as I told him to do? Travis. Just what in the hell do you think you're doing? I shouted at him. Standing up and walking over to him. Grabbing him from the shoulder and yanking him back I saw that a grin was on his face. Not unlike the one he wore when I had control over him. But this time there was something sick about it. I'm silencing this bitch. He said with some giggles. I looked over him and saw that he had taken a decent chunk of flesh out of her shoulder. Disgusted at him ruining my canvas I beat him over the head with my cane. Kicking him off the girl and quickly fusing some porcelain to her wound so she wouldn't bleed out before I could have some fun with her. Looking over at Travis I raised my cane again to strike him, but he simply stood up and waited at the table. A blank look over his face as he stared at Liz on the table. Travis. I asked him, stepping closer and waving my hand in front of his button eyes. Raising a brow at his inaction. I shrugged, however. He seemed domesticated enough, so I went about with my plans. The rest of Travis's story is true. I did smash Liz in front of him and leave him there. Although there's a reason I believe he said it was all his fault. If you recall, after I had turned him into my very own puppet he said he was losing his sanity. Why do you think he stopped bringing that up? Travis was held in my shop for a very long time. And was not allowed to sleep. In fact, he still isn't allowed to sleep. So how does he say he keeps falling asleep? He doesn't I'm afraid. I must admit this to you all fair readers. It would seem Travis has developed a fun side to himself. Do you need more proof? I admit you must think of me as the least reliable source after all. I didn't kill Travis's mother. Quite a bold claim, eh? Travis breezed past his mother's warnings of rain. Said that the last words were that he loved her. A sweet sentiment. Of course, it didn't end that way. I and my mother arrived just as Travis ran out of the house on a mission to somewhere. Probably some failed way of getting rid of me. Needless to say, he had broken down the door in his attempt to escape his own house. If he hadn't been in such a hurry to enter the house he would have noticed it was broken out of, not in two. Stepping inside with my mother it was obvious to see a struggle had broken out in the house. Making my way into the kitchen I raised a brow as I found his mother's lifeless body on the floor. Now there was something I wasn't expecting. You all thought I had killed her. Have I had any reason to do so? She asked me for nothing, she had not harmed me before. Yes, I wanted to do it to punish Travis. But didn't I say I'd do it in front of him? Where is the fun in him arriving to find her dead already? Kneeling over her head, I placed a hand on her and gave her some temporary life. Trying to find out from her what had happened. Her eyes sprang to life and looked around the house frantically. I looked at her with a chuckle. Waiting for her to calm down and reveal what her last words were. Travis. It's so cold, so cold, it's so dark and cold outside, put on a sweater. What are you doing? Ah. She screamed at me. Now that really brought my attention up. If Travis was the last person she talked to. And we had just seen Travis run out of the house. It doesn't take a detective to figure this one out, does it? I brought the findings to my mother, and she confirmed my thoughts. Why would he kill his own mother? After saving them from you? She asked, handing me back the head which had since fallen silent. I shrugged back at her and set the severed head back down. It didn't make much sense to me. But it did the more I thought back to it. Mama. Is it bad that I refuse to allow Travis to sleep? I asked her. As she was the one who created the way to keep my body alive and my soul kept inside said body. She looked at me for a second and then to the head on the table. Charles. Don't tell me you did that to the boy. You know very well what happens when a resurrected body is left to think for itself for so long. She sighed, taking a seat on Travis's surprisingly nice furniture. I shrugged and looked away. I thought he didn't deserve to sleep. I explained. How was I supposed to know that Travis was going to end up growing an insane personality? 
Mother sighed and thought for a while, before looking at me. We have to keep him alive a bit longer, son. She finally said. I know you want your revenge, and you'll get that, my love. But for now, we need to make sure he doesn't screw with any Loa and undo everything I work so very hard for. She said, standing up and wrapping her arms around me. Fine. But I at least get to use him in performance for you. I said with a smile. To which I got a happy nod. So we waited for Travis to come back for wherever it was he was going. And when he did, he ended up lighting my pants on fire and booking it. Shame. He's a slippery salamander. I admire that in him. Do you really think I'm lying? Fair enough. But let me ask you this. Why would I only cut off her head? Where is the fun and showmanship in that? Why didn't I turn her into a living voodoo doll? Or bring her back to life to attack him? A simple decapitation is simply too boring and unoriginal for me. King Creole takes great pride in his work. This must be hard for y'all to hear. And I understand that. You've grown attached to him. Like a puppy. But any feral or rabid dog must be put down. And I intend to do so. What's wrong with him? To the best I can piece together is that he blacks out and this violent personality takes over. It happened suddenly, just like when I cornered him in his house with Alexandra. After he had thrown me against the walls of his kitchen he then turned to Alexandra. Who confusingly looked at him. Then let out a scream as he attacked her. He lurched towards her and nearly took a chunk of her arm off. Luckily the woman was able to grab a pot and strike him in the head sending him into my arms as he slipped into unconsciousness. Thank you, Alexandra. I always knew you were a good girl. I said with a chuckle as I patted his head. She watched as I set him down and approached her. She lifted the pot to hit me next, but I raised my hands to show her I meant no harm. Easy. I let you stay with Olivia. I chuckled. How on earth do you think I can believe that? She said with the pot still firmly held in her hands. Then I pointed down to the voodoo puppet at my feet. She hesitantly lowered the pot, but still put some distance between her and me. Let's just say a lol Travis isn't right in the head currently. I said with a chuckle, pushing my hat up and brushing the bangs out of my buttons. Have you noticed that? I asked with a smile, looking down at the floor and putting my foot on his head to keep him down on the floor just in case. I thought it was just grief. She mumbled, stepping back and sitting down in one of the kitchen chairs. Face in her hands as she let out an exhausted sigh. He locked himself in the bathroom. First I thought it was just crying, but then he started throwing and ripping things apart inside there. And well, his mother's head certainly put some doubts in my mind. She said, rubbing her arm and avoiding the gaze from me. Figured as much. I'll take him off your hands. I said with a toothy grin. The feeling of the stitches in my mouth about to rip is a feeling that makes others worry, but it makes me want to smile more. Just to see how far they go until they burst. Sorry for getting off track there. No. Keep your hands off him. She declared, picking up that pot again and about to hit me. Until little Ms. Olivia came running and hugged me by the legs. I looked down at her and smiled as I rubbed her head. Don't hurt him, mommy. She shouted, gripping my leg tightly and refusing to let me go despite her mother's protest. She looked at me in defeat and lowered her weapon in defeat. Chuckling I picked her up and balanced her against my hip. My knight in shining armor. I joked happily. Tapping her on the nose and smiling at her as she giggled. Wiping some tears from her eyes. Yes bringing back her old mother was a low blow. But it was the only way to get them out of the house and protect Olivia. I would never hurt a child. I will stop you. And save Travis. Alexandra mumbled to me. Coming over and snatching the girl from me. Keeping her clothes and putting distance from me. I shrugged and grabbed Travis by the hair and started dragging him away. I'm sorry Travis. She said sadly as I dragged him away. If I still had eyes I would have rolled them. She cares far too much for him. I gave her a second chance to raise a child and now she wants another one. Give a mouse a cookie, eh? From my findings, it seems that Travis's murderous personality is quite the sadist. From just hanging up there on stage I can examine his words and his actions. He can't do much swinging and hanging up there, but he certainly has the mouth on him. It's pretty easy to tell when it's Travis talking and when it's his more fun side talking. His more fun side has the voice of him under my control. Sir. Would you let me down so I may have my fun? He asks me. Gnashing his teeth at the string suspending him. 
He thrashes around and demands to be released. He wants to have fun. He clearly has some issues that he wants to let out. Tell me something, Travis my boy. I asked, walking around him on the stage. Going over and sitting at my piano. Playing some scales to ensure that I will never lose my skills. He craned his head to look at me, the stitches on his neck nearly breaking at that angle. How do you kill your mother? Oh. That's a fun story, sir. He said with a happy noise I can best describe as a squee. I smiled at that and continued to play. Letting him relay the fun little details of the action. I was on my way to some graveyard when my mama told me to put on a sweater. Since it was so cold and gonna rain or something like that. He shrugged, the best he could be suspended from the strings on his arms and feet. And what did you do? I asked, giving the keys a nice flourish to get the details out of him. Well, I went into the kitchen where she was and grabbed a big old kitchen knife. I grabbed her by the hair and drove the knife into her neck. She let out a scream, but I think the knife caused her to stop talking. So right after that I grabbed the knife and just hacked away at her. He said with the giddiness of a naughty child. I rather enjoy this side of Travis. My, and to think you believed I would do something so crass and unsightly. I said with a chuckle. Ending my little practice session and walking up to him. Having the strings lower him so that I could meet him button to button, I saw that there was the same kind of bloodlust that I first had when I had killed Henry and his thugs. Seems that when you're first brought back to life and you're improperly taken care of some, unexpected results can happen. Well, mama never said her method was perfect. I bet most of you still don't believe me. But I issue a challenge to all of you. Pay careful attention to the next upload. I'll give Travis his little cell phone and he'll be able to update y'all. If at any time you see that Travis seems to be suddenly in a different location or talking to a person for a second and then they're dead the next, you'll know I was right. That's all from King Creole folks. I look forward to seeing what lil all Travis has cooked up for me. Don't believe a fucking word he said. He's lying through those fucking stitches of his. I would never kill my own mother. He fucking did it. When he handed my phone back to me and informed me that he had added a new part to my log I was worried to see where it was going to go and to my shock and horror it was worse than I imagined. He's lying through his fucking teeth. I swear he is. I told him as much. All he did was laugh at me and issue me a challenge. As he said that the strings released me and I collapsed to the stage with a hard thud. You think I'd lie to you, Travis my boy. He'd scat at me. Approaching me and he kneeled. Pushing my chin up with his fingers he smiled down at me and fixed my hair. How about this? I'll let you go for 24 hours. If you can't prove to me that you haven't lost your marbles. I'll let you go. Cross my heart. He said, pulling me up to my feet and dusting me off. What makes you think I won't just take this opportunity to run? I spat at him, keeping my distance and making sure he didn't do anything funny with me. I know his tricks. I know how he thinks. And I know for a fact he'll take any opportunity he can to hurt me. Because I've read your little conversation with the Baron. And I can safely say that no danger is going to come my way. He chuckled, turning and walking away from me. Despite the strings no longer controlling me, I couldn't just lunge and rip him to shreds as badly as I wanted to. Not until he exited the auditorium was I finally able to move on my own. Rushing after him and throwing the doors open I was met with the charred remains of the voodoo store once again. Looking around in pure confusion then looking back at the door which was now the basement door I rubbed my head in confusion. Shaking that out of my head and making my way out of the burnt down remains, a sign attached to the outside frame of the door to the shop was prominently displayed. It read, coming soon. The grand reopening of all King Creoles. I grabbed the sign and ripped it from its place. No way will I let him reopen the shop. Not after what he did to me. Running off towards my house I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Seeing my house was still abandoned and theorizing that Alexandra and Olivia were back at their home, I entered the house and changed into my normal clothes. Tossing the suit I was forced into wearing at the wall of my room and sitting down to think. He's lying. I mumbled to myself. There was no way in hell that I did that to my own mother. Heading back down to the living room I went to the spot where my mother had been lying. Well her body at least. I closed my eyes and tried to think. I know I said goodbye to her and left the house. Right. 
I did say that. I did. My butt and I scanned the room for the murder weapon that Creole had said I had used. A kitchen knife. Not finding one I chuckled. My first proof that he was lying. That was until I took a step forward and suddenly found myself bending under the fridge. How the hell did I get there? Looking around confused I soon found the reason I was laying on the floor reaching underneath my fridge. It was because I pulled out the bloody kitchen knife. Staring at it in horror I quickly tossed it away and backed up from it. Grabbing my hair and shaking quickly. No. No that didn't make any sense. He planted it there. It was obvious he did. He's just trying to fuck with me. Reaching out for the knife again I took it into my hands and looked at it. The blade was bent. I didn't do this. I mumbled to myself, dropping the knife and looking back to where my mother had been sitting. I had seen her. And I had told her I loved her. I had. I had. Shaking my head I quickly stood and rushed past the dried blood stain on the floor and looked around for my mother's body. But most likely Creel had had his cop buddies remove it after he took me. Reaching for my phone I quickly dialed my dad. Hoping he would pick up. Travis. I've been worried sick about you. He quickly shouted at me. Sending my stress levels way down just hearing his usual yelling voice. Letting out a cathartic breath I sat down on one of the couches and just let him scold me for a bit. Dad. How bad was mom's body? I asked, interrupting his lecture. There was a long period of silence as he was obviously caught off guard by the question. He and mom were high school sweethearts. They'd known each other their whole lives. And I knew he was hurting just as bad as I was. Bad. Real bad. Her neck was jagged. Like he just hacked away at her with a kitchen knife like it was a dull axe. He mumbled to me. That gave me some hope. Creel was decapitated with a dull saw. Did he do the same to my mother in revenge? Did you find the knife? I asked him, looking back at the kitchen and seeing the knife was still where I had left it. No. It was nowhere to be found. Where are you, son? I don't want to lose you as I lost her. My dad said. Obviously choking back tears. Rubbing my face I looked at the spot where Creel had been drinking coffee next to my mother's head. I'm at home. Where are you? I finally answered. Giving my dad time to get his emotions in check. I had warned him to get out of town when he had found mom's body. I was hoping he had heeded my warnings. At a hotel. Just outside of town near the freeway. He explained. I nodded as he gave me the details. I said I would be there soon. Hanging up with I love you. I sighed and started on my way. Past the destroyed door and took a look at the pieces of it. It was broken out of. Not into it. Swallowing a lump in my throat my next destination was Alexandra's house. Pulling my hood over my face I made my way there. It took me a bit to get there on foot. But when I arrived I knocked on their door. Noticing the hole in their window was still there. The door cautiously opened as Alexandra looked at me and hesitated to open it all the way. Travis. She said in a shocked gasp. Looking around me before opening the door all the way. Did you escape? She asked me, letting me enter the house, but she kept a good distance between the two of us. I thought it was for her betrayal of me. It had to be for that, right? No. He let me go. So I could prove that I'm not the one who killed my mom. I explained, walking past her and looking around the house. She avoided eye contact with me when I looked back at her. And I started to get worried. You don't think I did that, do you? I asked. My heart broke when I tried to approach her and she backed up further away from me. I don't know. Travis. How long has it been since you've last slept? She asked me. Concern plastered all over her face. I looked at her like she'd just insulted my mother. She wasn't on his side too, was she? Last night. When I was being suspended from the strings again. I told her. Crossing my arms and staring at her in a defensive manner. And her face grew paler as a result. I didn't know it could, since she was about as pale as I was. Travis. You couldn't sleep when connected to the strings. Remember. At the shop, you were never allowed to sleep. She told me. And my stomach dropped as I lost my balance and backed up into the wall behind me. She had a point. So. Ever since I escaped I've been able to sleep. I shot back at her, pushing off from the wall and pointing at her. Sending her cowering back and backing up into the living room as I followed after her. Travis. When you were in my bathroom. 
after your mother's head was thrown in there. What did you do? She asked, shaking. I stared at her for a good long while. My button eyes trailing to the bathroom. Walking in that direction I opened the door and stared at the sight before me. The entire room was a mess, things broken and thrown in random directions. All I remember was trying to cry in here. I didn't do this. You're trying to set me up. You hit me in the back of the head and turned me over to him. I shouted in anger, taking a shard of broken glass from the bathroom mirror and pointing it at her. She threw her hands in the hair and backed up further away from me. No. You attacked me. Why you tried to attack me and yelled awful, awful things at me. She whimpered, truly terrified of me. I looked down at my hand and stared at the shard of glass I was threatening her with. What was I doing? I dropped it and walked off towards the door. Tell Olivia to take care of Tempe for me. He makes a better doll than her old mother. I said as I exited their home. Tuning out words Alexandra said back to me. Pulling my hood back on I stuck my hands into the pocket and walked off in no particular direction. I didn't kill my mom. He's fucking lying. He's wrong. I love her, I would have never done that to her. My aimless wandering suddenly had me walking right into the gate of the old cemetery. I looked around in complete confusion. How the hell had I gotten here? I went in the complete opposite direction of this place. And this place was a good hour's walk from Alexandra's house. Pulling out my phone I stared at it in disbelief. It was an hour's walk. Because it had been an hour since I last checked the time. No, no. I stammered, stepping away from the cemetery and staring at the rusted and overgrown door. Creole's words to you guys echoed in my head like a gong. Watch out for when I black out. I shook my head so hard I thought the stitches holding it on would bust and my head would go rolling. The hell's the matter with you, son? A familiar nasal voice asked me. Causing me to look to my side and see none other than the Baron. Shovels slung over his shoulder and staring at me like I was some freak show attraction. He was chewing on one of my dad's cigars. I quickly stumbled over to him and looked up at him. What's happening to me? What did that psycho and his mother do to me? I begged him. He chuckled with a grin as he took the cigar out of his mouth and taped it over me like I was an ashtray. You shouldn't play with life and death, son. Only a professional can do it right. Creole's mother is one so he got off mostly scot-free. Him on the other hand. His work is downright shitty. He said to me, setting his shovels down and looking at me as he puffed away at the cigar I had given him. I would love nothing more than to tie up all his loose ends. But Mama Creole and I have an understanding. I can always tie up your loose end of course. He said with a chuckle. I looked up at him confused by what he meant. I don't have any loose ends. I've never brought back anyone from the dead before. That got a genuine cackle out of the Baron. He slapped his leg as he let out a howl of a laugh. Looking at me like I had said the funniest shit in the world. You are a loose end, son. Why do you think I offered to help you? Getting rid of Creole helps get rid of you. Before you get too comfortable with your little murders. He chuckled. I saw into those buttons of yours. I saw something bad brewing in them. So I offered you the way to beat him. Though it seems like you're running out of time in that regard. He said, leaning down to pick up his tools as I stared at him in horror. I haven't killed anyone. I shouted at him. He looked at me with a raised brow as he blew smoke from his nose, taking the cigar out of his mouth again and taping the ash off. You sure about that? You certainly did a number on your own mother. He said with a smile, pushing the door to the cemetery open and entering it, shutting it close behind him as I stared at the spot where he had been. I wrapped my arms around myself and fell to the floor as I rocked back and forth. No. 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 He's wrong. Fucking wrong. I screamed, looking back at the cemetery door and banging on its door. Do you hear me? I didn't kill her. I screamed. Smashing my fists into the rusty door and clawing at it. Shoving myself away from it, I walked off in no particular direction. I pulled up my phone and texted my dad to come to pick me up. As I waited at the spot we determined, I stared down at my hands, covered in the door's rust. Don't really think I have to worry about tetanus as a voodoo puppet. As I sat at a park bench and wait for my dad I did my hardest to try and remember back to when I had left the house. I clearly remember walking down the stairs. Walking past my mother and saying I loved her. And being on my way to the graveyard. There was no way I could have done that. Travis. My dad's voice shouted at me. 
Looking up I saw that he was already here. I raised a brow at that. How the hell had I not heard him? I shrugged and just entered the car and sighed as I sat there. Finally. I thought I was going to have to honk at you. He sighed, putting the car in drive and driving us both towards the highway. Dad. I finally spoke up after an awkward length of time. My dad looked at me for a second and then back at the road. His signal that I had his attention. Have I, have I been sleeping? I asked him. He raised a brow at that question and shrugged. Shouldn't you be the one who knows that? He asked me, pulling into the exit to the hotel. I sighed and shook my head. Letting the conversation die right there. Thankfully we could skip the lobby since my dad already had booked two single beds. In case I finally showed up in need of a rest. Taking me up to his room I looked around at the stereotypical hotel room. Entering the bathroom I closed the door behind myself and again let out a long and sad sigh as I sat on the toilet seat and put my face into my hands. I didn't kill her. I didn't kill her. I didn't kill her. Creel's deadline loomed large in my mind as I washed my hands of the rust still on them. Some of it had gotten underneath my fingernails, so I scrubbed and picked at them to get my nails cleaned. Except on closer inspection, it wasn't rust. It was dried blood. Backing up from the sink, I stumbled and fell into the bathtub. Taking the shower curtain with me, I sat in complete shock. Standing up I quickly shut off the water and walked out of there. You okay? My dad asked me. Concern plastered on his face. I assured him that I was perfectly fine. Just slipped and tumbled into the shower. He and I laughed it off and sat to watch the hotel's crappy TV I sat and watched an awkward silence as I fidgeted with my fingers. Where had all this blood under my nails come from? Dad. I finally spoke up, clearing my throat again to wake him from his slumber. He had a habit of falling asleep whenever the TV was on. He snorted awake and looked at me. I'm going to go get some fresh air. I said. He gave me a nod and handed me the room key. Walking out of the room I put my hood on and mumbled to myself as I walked along the halls of the hotel. As I wandered around I found myself heading outside and to my dad's car. Unlocking it I climbed into the passenger seat and opened up the glove box. Aside from all the paperwork and random crap in there I found the item I wanted. My dad along with being a smoker and drinker is also a hunter. And inside the glove box was a hunting knife. Taking the item and hiding it in my hoodie pocket I closed the car door and locked it. I once again entered the hotel and made my way back up to our room. Unlocking it and entering it, I found my dad asleep again on the bed. I didn't kill her. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't grab her by her hair and stab her in the neck. Then while she was on the floor I hacked away at her throat with the knife until her head fell off her shoulders. Taking the knife out of my pocket I pulled it from its sheath and dropped the sheath to the floor. Climbing on top of my, my dad and jerked himself at the the and stared up at me in horror as I drove the knife into his torso. He didn't get to scream much after I slit his throat. Just like you showed me, dad. I chuckled as I gutted him like the animals he had made me gut when he took me hunting when I was young. I giggled loudly as I stabbed and stabbed him. I had more time to have fun with him than I did with my mom. So I made sure to show everybody all my hard work. Some guts over here, his head on the TV I had so much fun. I killed her. I killed him. Maybe now King Creel will say what a good boy I am now. What happened? I didn't kill her. And my dad is dead. W.Y. I I didn't do this, I went for a walk and found him dead. No. Yes. Yes I did. I did it. I did it. I did it. The cleaning lady found me with my dad's corpse a couple of hours after I had my fun with him. After I murdered him. I could have killed her. But what little conscience I had left stopped me from doing it. I didn't say a word as the police slapped the cuffs on me and shoved me out of the bloodied hotel room. I was silent again when they roughly shoved me into the police cruiser and when they began driving me off towards the station. Better call that voodoo freak. He's got a lot of explaining to do on this one. The cop driving said. Driving me towards the station I looked up at them from behind the cage that separated me from them. I pushed my face close to the cage to try and listen to their conversation. It's getting harder to do whatever he says. Especially after the whole shop burned down. 
He's got us turned up to 11 covering for all his shit. The man mumbled, sighing as he stopped at a red light and looked back at me. Flinching when he saw how close I was staring at him. He soon elbowed the cage hard and sent me back into the seat. Rubbing my nose I stared in silence as they continued driving after the red light. Isn't this his clerk? Or cashier, or whatever. The other cop asked, turning to look at me with a disgusted look. I stared back with my button eyes and just stared at him. Eventually winning as he turned and looked straight ahead. How should I know? That freak never informs us of anything. The lead cop said driving off towards the station. He looked at me through the rear view mirror and kept a watchful eye on me the whole drive there. The making sure to keep quiet about King Creel around me. I sighed as we finally arrived at the station and I was pulled out of the back seat and into the station. Having all those cops eye me as I was pushed into a solo cell was uncomfortable, to say the least. I sat down on the cold bench of the holding cell and stared at the ceiling light as I took in the gravity of what I had just done. I killed my mother. I killed my father. And while inside I was tearing myself apart with grief. But, aside from some thoughts of that, I didn't feel anything other than a sense of pride. At least with my dad's death, I was able to have more fun with it. Hey, freak. The cop you brought me here said, banging on the bars with his nightstick. Bringing my attention from the ceiling over to him. I stared at him for a while. I would normally answer him, but I really didn't have anything I wanted to tell him. Your boss is here. He snuffed, stepping aside as a familiar face and top hat came into my view. I sat up straighter when he did and stood up all the way when he came to a stop in front of my cell. Travis. You've been a very naughty boy. He'd sketch at me, looking at me in the cell and looking at the bars. Tapping the metal rods with his cane with that smile of his. I looked at him and then looked at the floor in disgrace. I'm sorry, sir. I said on my own volition. The first words I'd spoken since carving my father up into pieces. He seemingly relished in those words and stared at me through those bars. He was eating up the sight of me no longer trying to fight him. I heard from this nice officer that you made a very big mess in the hotel room. He said with a chuckle. The cop rolled his eyes. He did more than make a mess. This psycho of yours completely destroyed his dad like he was a fucking fish. He shot a creole, grabbing him by the back of the collar and pulling the voodoo king back from my cell. I swallowed hard as I backed away from what I was dreading was about to happen. Son. I'll ask you to kindly let go of me. Creel said, clearly annoyed at this officer for laying a hand on him. The officer however clearly didn't take the hint. Pulling him away from me and shoving him into looking at him. Listen here. Your little deal with the department is quickly showing itself to be lopsided in your favor. The only crime that gets committed here is by you. He shoved his finger into Creel's chest. He looked down at it and then up at the officer's face. Sighing as he grabbed the man's hand and yanked it right off its wrist. It was like his hand was a glove and had been easily ripped off. He stared in disbelief for a moment and then began screaming as blood began spilling out of his stump. Creole didn't give him long to anguish as he quickly shoved the man away and grabbed his ring of keys as he tumbled down and fell to the floor with a loud thud. Dead from I assume shock. Fast acting shock. Seems you don't have a family anymore, Travis. He said with hum. Opening up my cell and walking in. Dropping the keys and tapping his cane on the cold stone floors. I looked at the floor in disgrace once again as he approached me and gripped me by the shoulders. I don't. I said with a soft mumble. He looked at me with a smile and pushed my chin up to meet his button eyes. My time's up. Isn't it? I asked him. To which he nodded with a wide smile and a tussle of my hair. Frayed so. Not like you have anywhere to go anyway. And I need my clerk back for the grand reopening. He patted me on the head and turned to leave, waiting at the door for me. I looked at him and then at the cage I was being forced to choose between. An eternity of prison with him. Or an eternity of prison behind bars. Reluctantly I chose him. Walking over to him and keeping my head down as he led me out of the station. Creole. An old grumbly voice came. Causing him to stop and turn to look at the owner of the voice. I followed suit, seeing an elderly cop with a white mustache and receding hairline coming over to us. Creole gave a slight giggle as he waved to the man. Captain. How are you, sir? Is there something I can help you with? 
Creole asked him, leaning onto his cane with a smile as he waited for an answer. The man stopped in his tracks when he laid eyes on Creole. He gulped and any courage he seemingly had was quickly wiped away. You killed another officer. D did he give you some kind of trouble? The man asked, clearly on the defense as Creole seemingly had some kind of sway over him. Creole tapped his chin and thought, as if the fact he had killed a police officer had completely slipped his mind. Oh yes. He was very rude to me and my employee. Saying things like our deal with each other was only benefiting me. Can you believe such nonsense? Creole cackled, slapping me on the back as he laughed. I stumbled forward a bit and offered my boss a little courtesy chuckle as well. The captain meanwhile was seemingly about to faint at how badly he was sweating. We would never think that, sir. The captain quickly assured, swallowing hard and leading us over to the front desk. Pulling out my record and handing it over to Creel. He marveled at it and handed it at me to see. Looking at my old self was like looking at a complete stranger. I didn't know who the person looking back at me was. And I don't think he even knows who I am. Thank you for all your help, Captain. Creole tipped his hat and led me out of the police station. Once we were outside he yanked the sheet from me and tore it up into pieces in front of me. Another piece of me was destroyed and I was left with just him now. What happens now, sir? I asked timidly. He looked at me with a raised brow and chuckled like I was an idiot. Maybe I am one. We go back to the shop, of course. After all, you and mama need to learn to get along together. Plus your punishment still isn't over yet. Just because you killed your daddy doesn't mean you get rid of what you did. He hummed, grabbing me by the hair and pulling me close. Shoving the head of the cane into my face. Besides. I'd like to meet this new Travis. The one who wants me to call him a good boy. He mused. I swallowed hard forgetting I had written that during the murder of my dad. I kept silent, which didn't make Creole happy as his smile wavered and he beat me on the head with his cane. He grabbed me by the hair and dragged me off as he forced me to walk off towards the end of town where the shop is located. I received several strikes and hits from him, but I finally arrived at the shop. Seeing that it was nearing completion. Amazing what a couple of hands can do, isn't it? He asked with a chuckle as he leaned on my shoulder and waved his hand at everything that had been done to fix the once burnt down voodoo shop. It was like visiting the site of a horrible accident that had scarred you for life. And I was forced to be back here once again. Yes, sir. Amazing. I answered back to him submissively. He smiled and ushered me into the shop. It was pretty much exactly the same. Down to the dusty counter and the wall of voodoo dolls. No telling where all those had come from. My main guess was they were all the old ones, just shoved back into a voodoo doll. Is that you, Charles? A voice came from the office. Creole's mother poked her head out there. And upon seeing me, she instantly stared daggers at me and exited from the office. A voodoo doll in her hands as she continued to sew. Seems she taught Creole that as well. Why on earth did you bring him back here? She snuffed, obviously not liking me. I share her sentiment. He's my pet mama. Besides, who else is going to be the clerk? He slapped me on the back, sending me stumbling into the strings which had been dangling from the ceiling seemingly waiting for my inevitable return. This time I didn't bother fighting it. What was even the point? I had nothing left I was willing to fight for. He'll bring us nothing but trouble, Charles. Mama Creole scolded coming over to me and grabbing my face roughly. Digging her nails into my cheeks and examining every inch of my face. Apparently, she didn't like what she saw since she pulled away with a disgusted look on her face. He's defective. She declared. Well, I already knew that. Creole said with a chuckle, coming over to his mother's side and looking at me like I was a display sign. He smiled his stupid little smile as he looked at me. Seemingly waiting for me to do something. And that something was brought to him when the door behind me opened and a familiar chime of the bell rang. I spun on my heels and looked at the person who had suddenly come into the shop. She was a teenager. Probably just starting her senior year. She visibly recoiled when she saw me and I didn't make the situation better by stepping forward to her. Causing her to back up and seemingly trying to find the door to get the hell out of there. Welcome. I sang. On my own without string influence. She looked at me with a good amount of fear and confusion in her eyes. Unfortunately we are still not open yet. 
if you like I can keep your order on hold until our grand reopening. I said with a smile as she looked around the shop and then back at the sign. Seeing clearly that we weren't open yet. A uh, dot dot no. I was just looking for a job. She asked, handing me a flyer. I stared at the flyer, grabbing it and looking over to Creel with anger in my buttons. He waved at me with a chuckle. He was trying to replace me. He was trying to get rid of me. I crumpled up the flyer and turned back to look at the girl with a big smile. Ah, I see. Come right this way. I said taking her past Creole and his mother. Who both said nothing as they watched me with interest. I led the girl over to the counter and bent down behind it. Smiling to myself when I found exactly what I was looking for. I reached out and grabbed a pair of scissors. Reappearing from behind the counter I stabbed her hand into the counter with a hard smash. She screamed loudly as she looked at the scissors sticking out of her hand. She pulled on them to try and get away. I smiled as I watched her struggle to try and get away from me. She really was so pathetic even trying to pry her hand off of the counter. I grabbed her by the hair and stared into her terrified eyes. The old me would have been terrified to see what I was doing to this poor girl. But she was after my job, and this is all I have in the end. Isn't it? You fucking freak. Let go of me. She screamed and begged, trying with all her frail might to pull herself free. Well, I certainly helped her of course. I pulled the scissors out of her hand and drove it into her temple. That certainly shut that naughty mouth of hers right up. She flopped to the floor in silence as she finally shut up. I looked over to Creole for any kind of praise. He smiled at me and clapped happily. His mother was still staring with disapproval at me. There is still no pleasing that woman. Creole walked over to me and looked at the body that was wriggling on the floor. He smiled with a sense of pride as he looked at me. You're a good boy. He said with a soft coo. As if finally giving me something that he was holding out on for so long. And I offered him another smile back, but that was quickly wiped off my face when he raised his hand and slapped me across the face. Sending me spiraling into the wall next to me. I held my cheek and looked up at him in terror. But, I I'm a good boy. I whimpered out pathetically. He looked over the counter at me with a raised brow and chuckled happily. Coming over behind the counter and grabbing me by my bloodied hoodie. He stared into my button eyes and I shuddered back. So. You still must be punished for your past sins. Nobody goes unpunished, Travis. Nobody. He said softly patting me on the spot where he'd smacked me. Before gut punching me and causing me to dry heave. No telling when the last I ate was. You're my new Mary. He said with a yellow toothy grin. Except you're more useful than that whore was. He chuckled, pulling me to my feet by the strings and forcing me to stand in place. Charles. Stop playing with your defective pet and get rid of that body. No point in letting precious materials go to waste. Mama Creole spoke up. To which Charles nodded and walked over to the dead girl. Grabbing her by the legs and pulling her away towards the basement. I guess business was starting back up again after all. Once Creel was down in the basement, Mama Creel walked over to me and got a good look at me. Touching my face before finally letting out a long exasperated sigh. Suddenly she looked a lot older than she normally looked. Not like when she was a rotting corpse, but old enough to bring my attention to it. It looks like you were right. He's not the same son I once had. She sighed looking towards her basement. The trail of blood soon disappeared as we looked at it. All those years without me must have corrupted him. Just like your lack of sleep has done to you. She sighed, rubbing her face into her hands and just shaking her head. Why? Does Baron Samedi have a deal with you? I gathered the courage to ask. Expecting to be hit or something by the woman. But she just looked at me with a sad chuckle. It's a very long story. A mother in sheer grief begging Aloha to save her baby boy. I wouldn't expect you to understand. She scoffed, turning to me, and stared again with her disapproving eyes. I said nothing to her as she went off and entered the office. I stayed at my counter until King Creole returned. Happily singing to himself as he walked past me. Over to the front door and turned the closed sign to open. Travis, my dear boy. I do believe it's time for our grand reopening. He exclaimed with glee. Clapping his hands and practically jumping up and down with excitement. He really was just like a giant child whenever he got excited. But when he was angry it was like a demon itself was hitting me. Over and over again.
Sir. Should I change? I said, looking down at my bloody clothes. He looked over at me and smacked his forehead. He'd completely forgotten. He came walking over to me and took me by the shoulder. Nodding and pointing to the basement door. I nodded obediently and walked over to the basement door. Opening it up I was soon kicked in the back and sent tumbling all the way down to the bottom. Creel's cackling followed me down all the way to the basement. I pushed myself up and looked around, finding a clean change of clothes on the table before me. Changing back into my suit I made my way back up to the top floor. I was worrying that I would be locked down there like Mary. But the door was open and Creel was standing there waiting for me. A smile on his face as he stepped out of my way so I could take my place at the counter. I sighed as I stood behind it, staring at the empty spot where Tempe once was. I really was all alone this time. All my plans crumbled around me. And now I'm stuck here. Welcome back to all King Creoles everyone. I do hope you'll stay a while. Please. Stay. Taking King Creel's blows on my back, I curled up into a ball and just accepted that he was going to beat me until he finally got bored. It took a long time. And in the end only a phone ringing from his office tore his attention from me. He looked over to his office and then down to me. Sighing annoyed, he kicked me hard with his dress shoes and turned to enter his office. I sat there and slowly managed to pull myself up onto the counter. I gasped to try and catch my breath. Finally getting my bearings I looked up to see Mama Creel staring at me with a silver platter with a coffee pot and a fancy looking coffee cup. I looked at her in confusion. Was she offering me a cup of coffee? Don't get the wrong idea. Bring this to Charles. He's going to be on the call for a while. She said, shoving the tray at me. I caught it quickly, looking down at all the items clanging around. Great. Now I'm his butler. Why didn't I go to college? Sighing and nodding obediently and walked over towards his office. Knocking softly I pushed my way into the office and stared at him as he talked to someone through a rotary phone. Monsieur LeBlanc. Comment à les vaus. Oui oui tout va bien ici. J'espère que vaus et votre petite infirmière à les bien. He said with a genuine chuckle. I stared confused at Creole, never having heard him speak French once in my entire time of knowing him. Not only was he a good speaker it sounded like he had always spoken that language. Keeping my head down I walked over to him and sat his cup down. Softly pouring some of the black coffee into his cup. He grabbed me by the shoulder and shoved me out of the way once it was enough. Quell. non juiced ma stupide marionette. Sinclair. Quisate, je n'ai pas entendu parler de Louis Depuis de Amois. He mumbled into the phone. Shooing me away with his hand and forcing me out of his office as he grabbed the cup I had poured for him and took a sip as he nodded to the receiver phone. Sighing once I was out of the office I returned to my position at the counter as I looked down at its endless dust. So. You met the Baron. Creel's mother asked me as she sat in a rocking chair making a voodoo doll. She sewed the little doll without even looking. She just stared at me as she did so. I looked at her and then to the office. Saying nothing as I nodded to her. She nodded and sighed as she finally looked down at her doll. When Charles died I acted out of anger and sheer grief. And agreed that if I supplied him with as many bodies as he wanted he would never allow my son to die again. She said with a sigh. Rubbing the doll's little head and closing her eyes. He told me how to stop him. I mumbled softly. Keeping my voice down to hide it from Creel. She looked back up at me with that smile that all mothers have. The one where she has pride over a child. Chuckling, she set the doll down on my counter. Bury him. I know. That's how Samedi takes us to the afterlife. Because Creel is undead and has never been buried I was able to put his soul back into his body. As long as he never goes into the ground, he'll never die. She explained to me. Looking at the little doll she had made in seemingly no time at all. It would also be how to put me back to rest. I looked at the woman who since I had first accidentally brought back to life by accident. She was informing me about how to beat her and her son. But why? She was his mother after all. She seemingly read my mind and stood to come over to me and take me softly by the shoulders. I shivered expecting a hit from her, but she instead wrapped her arms around me. I've made mistakes. And seeing what Charles has done with his second chance of life really has opened my eyes to my mistakes. She sighed, letting me go and fixing my hair like any mother does when they see something out of place. 
Will. You help me. I whimpered to her. Submissively looking down to the floor. Expecting to be hit or hurt for even asking for her help. But she pushed my chin up to be able to look at her. Her motherly eyes looked down at me like I was a little lost abused puppy. Our little chat was interrupted by Creole. Who slammed the door to get our attention. We both looked over and stared at him as he watched the scene with a raised brow. Walking over with his cane in his hands. Mama. What are you doing with my puppet? He asked. Coming over to me and tapping his cane on the floor. Causing me to stand up straight and rigid. Walking over to him, I stared at him in terror as he raised the cane up to scare me. Luckily he was interrupted by the front door opening. And a small child running and wrapping her arms around him. Mr. King Creel. Olivia hummed as she hugged him. His tone instantly changed as he turned to look at her with a bright smile. Picking her up and smiling at her. Olivia. My, why isn't it a surprise to see you here? He hummed as he sat her on the counter. I stared at her and then looked over to the door to see Alexandra standing there. Too ashamed to look at me as she walked into the shop. She looked over to Mama Creole and bowed her head in respect to the old woman. What are y'all doing here anyway? He asked Olivia, the little girl looking up at him with her innocent little eyes. She then pointed over to the door. Following her fingers, he saw she was pointing at Alexandra. Who moved out of the way and revealed Sophie crawling into the shop and staring up at Creel. She was looking worse, her human half rotting and her doll half leaking stuffing. You. She snarled, pouncing up with speed and velocity enough to tackle Creel and sending him over to the counter as she attacked him. Creel let out a growl as he was tackled and attacked, his mother quickly rushed behind the counter to help him. I stared in awe at it and with a quick snipping sound, I saw that Alexandra had rushed over and cut the strings holding me. Quickly. We do not have much time. She said quickly, grabbing me by the tie and rushing out of the store. Olivia followed after us apologizing to the Creels over and over as we ran. I looked back at the shop as it went out of view. I looked over then to Alexandra swallowing the bile building up in my throat. Why? Why are you helping me? I asked her softly, she looked over to me and sighed as she slowed down and let Olivia catch up with us. The little girl gasped and climbed into her mother's arms as she collapsed in exhaustion. Those little legs could only take her so far. It's the right thing to do. I cannot leave you to suffer as Mary did for all those years. And if we lift the curse of Creole from you, then perhaps you may return to normal. She explained to me. Pointing over to the cemetery in the distance. I looked over there and then looked back towards the shop. Creole's words echoed in my mind. That I had no one left. I had murdered my parents. I had been murdered and brought back to life for only one reason. To be the plaything of the voodoo king Creole. I don't know Alexandra. What if I try and kill you? I asked her. She scoffed and smiled at me. You'll have to try very hard for that, Travis. She said with a smile. Taking my hand she led me, while carrying Olivia in her other arm. We arrived at the cemetery gates and entered them. Looking around at the overgrown graves we looked out for the Baron. Olivia who was now out of her mother's arms tugged on my dress pants. I looked down at her and got to her level. And she greeted me with Tempe in her hands. The little voodoo doll reached out and grabbed my face. Holding on to me as I pulled away. He clung to me and refused to let go. I gave a soft tired smile as I pulled him off and held him in my hands. He clung to my fingers then as he seemingly refused to be separated from me. I missed you too. Little guy. I chuckled. Olivia. Hand me the purse baby girl. Alexandra asked, Olivia, nodded happily and ran over to the gate and grabbed the bag. Bringing it to her mother she smiled and received a head pat for her efforts. Fishing through the bag, Alexandra picked up a bottle of rum. Thank you, Sophie. She sighed, holding the bottle up and shaking it. Seemingly instantly a hand reached out and grabbed the bottle. The Baron appeared from the grave beneath her. He grabbed it and pulled himself up with some grunts. Patting the dirt off of him he looked down lovingly to the bottle before looking over to me with a raised brow and a scoff. You look like that asshole. He chuckled, putting the neck of the bottle in his mouth and biting it off. Spitting the top of the bottle away and swigging the rum like it was water. Letting out a satisfied groan as he pounded his chest with his hand. I looked at the floor to avoid his judgmental gaze. 
we acquire your assistance, Baron Samedi Alexandra said, causing the tall black man to look at her with a raised brow as he took a good long swig of the rum. Finally finishing his pull of the bottle he looked at her with an interested gaze. You're with him? He asked, pointing over to me. She responded with a nod. He nodded and understood that we were all working against Creole. He took another swig and looked off towards the gate. Pointing his finger over to the door and chuckling. He's right outside. Whatever you're going to do. Better do it quickly. He said with a soft giggle, going back into his hole with his bottle of rum. Great help. I mumbled, softly rubbing Tempe's head with my thumb as I looked over to the gate. Indeed the gate was thrown open as Creole and his mother entered it. In Creole's hand was what was left of Sophie. Body mangled beyond recognition he tossed it to us and caused Olivia to run to Alexandra and hid behind her mother. Oh. I've got all of you right where I want you. He chuckled, walking over and stepping on the corpse of Sophie. Walking over to us as his mother stayed by the gate entrance looking around the graveyard she had been buried in. Travis, my boy. You want to prove to me that you're a good boy. Don't you? He asked me, tilting his head as he looked at me. I stared back at him. He was right. I just wanted to show him that I was good and didn't want to be punished anymore. How could I make it so I was a good boy? Maybe. If I kill Alexander. She'd been such a problem to him ever since he had given her the second chance of being a mother. I. I began, but something pulled me back from the chain of thought. I looked down at Tempe as he pulled on my fingers. I looked down at him and he vigorously shook his head at me. Seeing him I was able to pull myself back from the brink and stare up at the creature that had abused and hurt me for all this time. The creature that had caused me to kill my own parents and help him murder countless others. Go fuck yourself, Charles. I said angrily. He tilted his head at me. Like I had just spoken in some unknown language to me. He put his hand to his ear and cocked it towards me. Did I hear that correctly? Guess I'll have to beat some sense into you. He said with a giggle, coming over to me only for his mother to grab him by the shoulder. He looked back at her confused. Charles. Leave him. You can always create a different puppet. She pointed out to him. He looked to her like she had just stabbed him. He shrugged off her hand and stared at her in complete disbelief. What? He asked. Staring at her and gritting his yellow teeth. You think I'm going to just let him go? After all the shit he's done to me he screamed, his mouth wide open and snapping a good many of his stitches. His mother tried to calm him down, but he simply shoved her off of him. Charles. I always taught you never to be selfish. Just let him go, the poor boy has suffered enough. She begged, pushing her son back and pointing an accusing finger at him. The voodoo king stared back at me and then to his mother. You brought me back to life. That was selfish. You kept me alive, that was selfish. You do not get to tell me never to be selfish. He shouted. Turning to me and pointing. He will belong to me forever. He growled. Grabbing his cane and coming over to me. I had backed up and had a gravestone between me and him. He came over to me and stepped on the grave and I smiled at him. Watch your step, Charles. I said. Pointing down to the grave as he came towards me. He stopped and had time to read the gravestone before he looked up at me in anger his mother's grave, which she dug herself out of. He didn't have much time to react as the soft earth gave way and he tumbled down into the grave. He clambered his way up and began to pull himself up, but something seemingly began to drag him back down into the grave. He looked back in shock at what he saw. Baron Samedi pulled himself up to his level and smiled down at him. His black skin melting off his body until nothing but a skeleton smiled back at Creole. Time's up, Charlie boy. Looks like I finally get to drag your sorry ass down with me. He declared, sinking back into the grave as Creole dug his fingers into the dirt to try and pull himself up. He looked around frantically for his mother, but when their eyes made contact she simply looked away. Leaving Creole as several skeletal hands rose up from the grave to start pulling him down into the grave. You think this is over, Travis? Just cause I'll be gone, won't mean a thing. You hear me? You don't go unpunished for what you've done. He screamed as he began to lose grip on the dirt and grass. The skeletal hands pulling him down into the grave refused to let up. I'll see you in hell. I said. Looking down at him as he was pulled further into the grave by the hands. He left me with one final smile as the dirt consumed him, and the last thing left of Charles Sumner, Aka King Creel, was his top hat once he was dragged underneath the dirt. 
I stared at the grave seemingly waiting for him to burst back from the grave. But he didn't, so. 95 years erased just like that. Mama Creole spoke up. Bringing my attention over to her as she walked over to her own grave. She stood a good distance away from it, so she wouldn't immediately be dragged down under as well. He's right. I was being selfish when I brought him back and made him immortal. But I don't know any mother who wouldn't do that for their child. She said, looking over to Alexandra who was holding on to Olivia. Is he really gone? I asked her. She looked up at me and offered no answer to me. Just a simple smile as she approached a grave she had occupied. Her body seemingly returned to its rotten form as she was more gingerly sucked back into her grave. Closing her eyes and accepting her fate. After so long. It was over. I looked over at Alexandra and Olivia who looked at me with some sense of fear. But when I came over to them, they offered me hugs and held me as I cried hard into them. Tempe clung to my hand as he comforted me as well. With my parents dead and no immediate family to take me in, I returned to their home. Despite my hopes and prayers. I remained the same. My body did not change back. I did not get my eyes back. I did not become who I used to be. I was cursed to remain a voodoo puppet. I spent a lot of time in my new room that Alexandra had given me. It was originally a guest room, but she left it to me to do what I wanted. I brought many of my items from my old room at home and brought them there. Olivia was so happy to have an older brother. At night when they sleep I stay wide awake staring out my window. Expecting him to be there. Expecting him to have found some way to claw his way out of hell and take me down with him. But he didn't. And somehow. I felt abandoned. Like I had been used and dumped after all my uses had been extinguished. It was hard adjusting to life with Alexandra and Olivia. Alexandra wasn't a mother to me and I was no son to her. It was like they brought in an abused puppy and tried to treat it like nothing had happened at all. I would eat with them, watch TV with them, and even when I was feeling brave go with them shopping. But it never felt genuine. Tempe did the best he could to cheer me up. But a little voodoo doll can really only do so much. Each day dragged on and on. Alexandra tried to talk me into seeing a therapist, but what therapist would look at me and be able to help me? And I bet you guys are wondering about the elephant in the room. My blackouts. And my murderous tendencies. They haven't gone away. Where would they go after all? I didn't notice it beforehand. But people have been dying in our neighborhood. And more than a few of my clothes had to be gotten rid of. Otherwise, people would have seen the blood. Alexandra knows, oh of course she knows. She walked in on me climbing back into my window with blood all over me. Lucky me we understand each other. She doesn't tell, I don't hurt her. There isn't much more I need to tell you all anymore. After all, I can't have any of you finding out where I live and operate. Can't have any of you stopping my fun. Although I will leave you all with the promise of something in the future. After all, the flyer that was delivered in the mail says it all. Coming soon the grand reopening of the half-priced voodoo store. Hopefully, they're hiring. I have prior experience after all. Thought you'd never hear from me again, huh? Honestly, I never thought I would have to tell you guys any more of my crappy life. Your good friend Travis is still cursed by the voodoo curse placed upon me by my old boss King Creel. I still look like a living puppet, although at the very least I'm no longer under the control of the strings. So at least I got that going for me. I also still live with Alexandra and Olivia. Olivia treats me like an older brother which is nice, but Alexandra is still cautious of me. Which I guess is a good segue into talking about the elephant in the room. Yes, I still have my blackouts and yes I still murder people. Despite anything I try to stop it, I always end up murdering some poor idiot that ends up coming into contact with me. I've still not been able to sleep and to say my mental state is in tatters is an understatement. The only good thing about my life is that King Creole is gone forever. But of course, nothing in this train wreck of my life ever stays the same. The flyer for the grand reopening of the half-priced voodoo shop truly rattled me and caused me to go to the side of the old voodoo shop to see if it indeed was reopening. And to see if King Creole had found a way to crawl his way out of hell and back into his shop. Suiting back up into my hoodie and leaving my room for the first time in weeks I ran right into Alexandra. Oh, Travis. She said obviously startled and afraid that I was going to hurt her in some way. 
I looked at her with my button eyes and then looked away from her. I'm going out. I'll be back soon. I said, pulling my hood on and walking past her, only for her to grab me by the arm and pull me back. I looked over at her with a bit of annoyance, but also understanding that she was worried about me and the fact that my blackouts are becoming much more frequent. Don't go back there Travis. She pleaded with me. Her eyes wide and seemingly about to burst out into tears at any second. Alexandra had been like a mother to me since I had murdered my own mother and father. But she was terrified of me whenever the idea of the voodoo shop was brought up. Or when I returned late at night from one of my blackouts. It's just going to be a quick trip. I need to see if this is true. I ate, reaching into my pocket and pulling out the flyer. Handing it to her and waiting for her to read it through. She looked up at me with a worried look and carefully handed the paper back to me. Moving out of the way of me as I continued on. Please. Just be careful. She told me, holding her fists in her chest as I walked down the stairs towards the front door. Heading out of the house I pulled my hood back on and continued on my way down to the shady side of town where the voodoo shop had been located. Since my final showdown with King Creole in the cemetery this part of town had gone to hell quicker than I could snap my fingers. It seems he was the only thing keeping that part of town from truly turning into the rotting dump it is today. Most of the buildings are condemned and slated for destruction. Seems if you pull out the heart the rest of the area just shrivels up and dies. Barely anyone visits this side of town, not even the junkies or homeless go here anymore. Seeing all this brought some joy to my heart. The fact that it was still dying made me optimistic that Creole was dead and buried once and for all. Until I rounded the corner and saw the imposing side of the half-priced voodoo store. With a giant banner stating it's nearing grand reopening. My heart sank into the deepest pits as I stared at the building and the sign. Swallowing the bile building up in my throat I approached the building and pressed my face up into the glass door. The same old dusty counter and wall of voodoo dolls greeted me. Causing me to back up quickly and shiver uncontrollably as all the horrible memories of the time I spent trapped inside the horror store. Stumbling back I said nothing to myself as I staggered away and walked off in the direction of Alexandra's house. A million thoughts were flying through my head as I thought about how it could be possible that the store was having a reopening. When my phone started ringing I almost wanted to let it go to voicemail, but for whatever reason, I reached into my pocket and pulled it out. Staring at the unfamiliar number and wanting to hang up. But I breathed through my nose and answered it. Hello? I asked. My voice quivered a bit as I was still unsure of how to be feeling at that moment. And when that soft and smooth southern accent greeted me, I stopped in my tracks and froze like a deer caught in the headlights. Travis, my boy. Long time no see. I need a favor from you. King Creole asked cheerily from the other end. I clutched my phone tightly as I looked around in all directions to try and see if he was somewhere in the vicinity. If my skin wasn't already so pale I'm sure that I would have quickly become this pale when I heard his voice. How? I mumbled into the phone. Pushing my back up against a nearby wall and sliding down it as my body seemingly shut down from sheer terror and fear of him. I don't have time to tell you, silly boy. My goodness how I've missed your stupid voice. He chuckled happily. I ended the call abruptly and shoved the phone into my pocket. To say that I ran back to Alexandra's house is an understatement. I'm pretty sure I could rival Usain Bolt with how fucking fast I ran. Opening the door and slamming it behind me, I breathed hard as I slid down onto the floor and just sat there and shivered hard. Alexandra poked her head from the kitchen and walked over to me. Kneeling next to me and wrapping her arms around me. I wrapped my own arms around her and let out a haggard breath into her. It's alright, Travis. She said, helping me up to my feet and walking me over to the kitchen. Sitting me down and going to the kitchen to get me something to drink. Olivia meanwhile stared at me with her big soft eyes. I looked over at her and offered a pained smile. She giggled and went back to eating her lunch. Tempe was next to her and looked up at me. He had basically become the replacement doll for her after the whole mother doll drama. What did you see? Alexandra asked me, placing a glass of orange juice in front of me and taking a seat next to me. She wasn't very close to me. She gave me enough space, probably just afraid of me if I was about to black out. The store is back. A and he called me. I said to her, gripping the glass of Oj. My shaky hands lifted the glass up to my mouth, but I couldn't bring myself to take a sip, so I just set it back down on the table and just sat back in the chair. 
That's not possible, Travis. Alexandra said, taking my hand in her own. We saw him dragged to hell. It's not possible for him to be coming back. Not to mention that the flyer you showed me didn't even have anything on it. She told me. Putting a hand on my shoulder. But I just stared back at her in confusion and horror. What? Yes it does. I corrected her. Reaching into my hoodie pocket and pulling it out again. Straightening it out on the kitchen table and staring at the obvious flyer down on the table. See. Right there. I declared, smacking the table and startling Olivia and Tempe with the force of it. Travis. This is just a blank sheet of paper. She quickly told me, backing up in her chair away from me and holding her hands up defensively. There isn't anything on here. She told me, taking the flyer and lifting it up again. I stared at it, but it still plainly promoted the grand reopening of the half-priced voodoo store. Yeah that paper is just all white. Olivia piped up, setting her sandwich on her plate and staring at the piece of paper with squinting eyes. I stared at the two of them and looked back at the flyer. I rubbed my button eyes hard and rough and stared back at it. But it still advertised exactly what I had said it would. Silently I backed away from the kitchen and made my way upstairs. Rubbing my face hard and pulling at my hair as I stepped into my room and closed the door behind me. I sat down on my bed and tried to make sense of all this. I knew for a fact I wasn't blacking out. That was impossible since I could remember everything so clearly. When I black out it's more like a dream nightmare that you sort of remember but can't really see all the details very clearly. I could clearly remember seeing the flyer, seeing the store, and hearing his voice over the phone. What's happening to me? I asked myself as I curled up in bed and tried to get some semblance of calm over myself. Why, you're my get out of jail free card. A familiar soft and soothing voice told me. Causing me to shoot up and look around the room in terror. I spun around to see where in God's name his voice was coming from. Even reaching into my pocket to pull my phone out to see if he had somehow possessed my phone. But when I reached into my pocket I found nothing there. I looked down at my pants and patted both pockets in my back pocket to see where the hell my phone was. Looking around my room I soon found it on my nightstand. Hooked up to its charger where I had left it since last night. How? I mumbled to myself reaching out to get the item. I suddenly froze and looked over towards the mirror attached to my nightstand. And screamed bloody murder when I saw him looking back at me. He tipped his hat to me and sat on the bed in the mirror. Long time no see, Travis my boy. He chuckled happily, looking around my room with a hum. Nodding he looked over to me and smiled. I looked behind myself to see if he truly was behind me, but he wasn't. He was seemingly trapped in the mirror. This isn't happening. The lack of sleep is just getting to me. I tried to rationalize all this. I was hallucinating. I mean I haven't slept in God knows how long. Maybe this was all just my decaying mind. No this ain't no hallucination. Ain't no party trick neither, Travis. Creole chuckled, taking off his hat and brushing his hair at the same time I did it. I looked at my hand and then back at him in abject horror as we both mimicked each other's movements. See, turning you into my little puppet wasn't just for my own entertainment. He chuckled, a little chuckle coming up from my throat as well. Causing me to quickly cover my mouth. He did the same, but he simply lowered his hands and I followed his lead, dropping my handstand staring at the reflection in the mirror. He smiled back at me, his stitched up mouth stretching long and his yellow teeth turning into those sharp teeth. You see son. You were back a plan. I didn't expect to have to use you so quickly. But since y'all caused this little mess I'm currently in, I suppose I have to use you. He chuckled, reaching into his coat pocket and pulling out the flyer that had caused this downward spiral. He held it up to me and smiled. You're not that bad of an artist. He said with a smile. I didn't make that. I shouted at him, looking behind me as Alexandra started knocking on my door. Ignoring her I stared back at the mirror and smashed my hands against it. Trying to smash that figure that haunts me into oblivion. Oh of course you didn't. I did. But your skills were very helpful. Hopefully, I'll be able to train you to play the piano. He chuckled, coming closer to the mirror and tapping on the glass in a mockery of my anger. Can't y'all see what's happening, Travis? You belong to me. You're my property and so I'm claiming you for myself. He chuckled, smashing his gloved fist against the mirror and shattered it himself. Stepping backward in terror I stared at him as he happily climbed out of the mirror and fixed his purple tie with a happy hum. 
He reached down and grabbed me by the collar and shoved me against the wall. Smiling wide as he brushed some of the glass shards came off of me. Be a good boy and put on your suit. He said with a cheery tone, tapping my cheek and shoving me towards the closet. No. You don't control me anymore. I screamed at him, shoving him back and turning to grab a pair of scissors from my desk, only to find that my hands were now clasping the doors to my closet and pulling it open. Looking around in complete confusion I tried to find where he had gone. The bastard was gone and nowhere to be seen. I looked down at my hands, confused as to why I was wearing gloves. Shaking my head hard I did my best to try and get some bearing as to what was happening. Yet in the time it took me to open my eyes again, I found myself buttoning up the suit I had been forced into wearing the entire time I had been his puppet. I tugged on the gloves I wore, completely out of my control. Soon I stood up and walked back over to the closet again and reached up into the closet shelf. Pulling out a box that I had never seen there before. I opened it up and pulled the top hat out. The top hat wasn't the same as Creole's. The band around it wasn't gold like King Creole's was. It was black. I lifted it up and placed it on my head and fixed it so it would be straight. Standing up with a wide smile, I walked over to the door where Alexandra was still banging. I opened it and stared at her as she backed away from me. Travis. What are you she began, but I didn't let her finish. Lord knows I'll have to deal with her and her betrayal later. After all, I do have so much work to do. That's right ladies and gentlemen. All King Creole is back. Oh, how I've missed you all. It feels so good to be back inside a body. I must say that Travis really hasn't been taking good care of himself. Walking around in this body is like trying to break into a new suit. Good lord, he's stiff as a corpse most of the time. I guess he's trying to fight me in some way. How adorable. Now I'm well aware of what you all are wondering. And yes, it does feel amazing to not have your mouth stitched up after almost a hundred years. It's very relieving and enjoyable. Oh and I suppose you all want to know how I managed to escape from Baron Samedi. Well as with most things in life, there are plenty of loopholes in getting out of tough situations. You all assumed that once I was dragged into the cold cold ground, that that would be the end of me. And normally it would be, I even considered that it was the end of the line for all King Creole. And while my poor old body was laid to its earthly rest, my soul easily escaped from the Baron's clutches. I had always envisioned that something may happen to my old body. And while making Travis into a puppet was mostly for my own enjoyment, there was a practical reason for doing it as well. Taking over Travis's body would be the simplest way for me to escape from the Baron's clutches. And now that I'm back to the lovely world of the living I have oh so much unfinished business to attend to. After thoroughly startling Alexandra with my attire, I pushed my way past her and ignored her continued annoying questions. I did not have any time to deal with the traitor at that very second. So I just continued onwards, until a familiar little voice caught my attention just before I was out the door. Wow, Travis. You look just like Mr. King Creole. Olivia's sweet innocent voice rang out as I put my hands on the doorknob. Turning to look at the living room I smiled nice and wide when I saw her face. Much less so when I saw her playing with that template doll I had Travis used to punch in for work. Well, what can I say? I asked with a chuckle, tipping my hat to the little girl as I walked over to her. She smiled with all the love in the world towards me. I could tell just from that how much she had grown attached to Travis. Smiling and staring down at her I got on my knees and patted her on the head. Tell your mother not to wait up for me. I'll be gone for a bit. But don't fret. I'll be back to give y'all a big thank you gift. I said with a cheery grin, which she responded to with a childlike gasp, and to wrap her arms around me. Staring at the template she had left on the floor, I merely wanted to spit on the foul thing. But hearing Alexandra rushing down the stairs I quickly stood and headed out the door. No time at all to be dealing with whatever it is she thinks she can do to stop me. My first stop on my long long road to rebuilding everything began at the police department. Strolling into the office the front desk worker stared up at me with terror. I responded back with a smile, leaning against the desk and taking off my hat. Mama always said to respect the police. Hello, dear. I greeted her, taking the hat and placing it down on the desk. Go on and bring me your chief, please. I do believe we have business to attend to. 
I told her. She nodded quickly and started running off to go find the old man. Taking my hat and placing it back on my head, I drummed my fingers against the desk in anticipation. So it really is you. A voice broke the silence. I looked over at the old man and gave him a nice wide smile. God, it feels so good to finally do that and not feel like my mouth is about to be ripped apart. In the newly living flesh. I exclaimed with a good chuckle. Spinning on my heels and showing off Travis's body. The boy might look like me in some ways, but at the same time, it's like wearing a very expensive suit that you must simply wear at all times. What could you possibly want with us? You abandon us for God knows how long and just waltz back in here in a new body and act like nothing ever happened Creel. Your deal with us is off. The old man declared, his weathered and exhausted face trying to muster up any kind of emotion that he could. But he made a bad mistake. My deal with all of you is off, huh? That means yours too. I said with a smile. To which his face showed an instant sign of regret. He quickly raised a hand to protest. Only for his hand to fall off his wrist and crumble into dust. His entire body began to collapse in on itself as he stumbled towards me. I backed away from him, I wore all black after all. I didn't want to get his ashes all over me. The old chief slowly but surely collapsed into a pile of clothes and ash on the ground. His screams of death fading into an almost echo-like wind. Did you do to him? The female officer from the front desk asked and she lifted up her gun and pointed it at me. I looked back at her with a warm smile and approached her. Her finger twitching on the trigger as I walked closer to her. A rookie. But at least she knew who I was. I'm simply ending his and my deal. No more long lifespan for him. I shrugged, looking down at the ashes strewn about the floor of the station. I looked back at her with a smile and walked closer to her, taking the gun from her trembling hands and tossing it over my shoulder. You wanna be chief? I asked, looked at me with bewilderment, and I delicately placed the old man's badge in her hands, closing them around her and tipping my hat to her. It does feel good to instill that sense of fear into someone other than Travis. I could tell she was running over everything that had happened to her. She looked at me and quickly handed the badge back to me. Causing me to raise a brow as I took it back. No. Not like this. She said, puffing her chest out a bit to try and show me that she meant that. I nodded and offered her a genuine smile. Not many like her out there. She's honest and wants to work her way up. Fair enough, darling. I nodded, tipping my hat to her and tossing the badge up and down with my hand. When y'all figure out who's succeeding him, give him a call. Clearly, a new deal is needed to be hammered out. Unless y'all want the crime wave to continue. I chuckled as I turned and walked off. Tossing the badge over my shoulder and listening to it rattle around on the floor as I walked off towards the entrance. With the police situation at least temporarily out of my way I next headed off towards the side of my lovely voodoo shop. Enjoying my way there I was suddenly hit with a splitting headache. It really threw me for a loop as it had been decades since I last experienced any kind of pain. Grabbing the wall as I slid down it, I clutched at my head as I looked up, the world began spinning, and soon enough I had that bastard trapped in my head, and I was able to take back control. I gasped and panted as hard as I could as I got myself to my feet and looked around. Him in control felt horrible. It was like being paralyzed as some alien creature forces you to walk talk and act like it. Worse still was being locked up in my own mind, I was able to see the me that exists when I black out. And let's just say he's as terrifying as I feared him to be. He's horrible and the less said about him the better. Staggering to my legs I looked around and stumbled forward to try and find a spot to collect myself and just think. I elected to go to a nearby park. Lucky for me no one ever goes there except to walk their dogs and let them crap all over the place and not pick it up afterward. Looking around as I walked through the chain link gate, I rushed to the nearest bench and just sat there hyperventilating. I can't go back to the house I mumbled to myself, jumping at any noise I heard. I'll just put them all into danger. I mumbled to myself. What, going to turn into a hobo? That familiar southern voice asked me. I turned and saw him sitting on the bench to my right. His legs crossed and a smile on his face. I shot up and was about to run when I realized it wouldn't do me any good. So I just sat back down in defeat and tried to put as much distance between us as possible. Maybe I will. As long as it ensures you don't hurt them. I said, looking at him with a scowl. He touched his chest, as if he were offended, and scat at me. Me. 
the one to hurt them. Surely your little friend behind you is the one you should be worrying the most about. He pointed behind me. Following his finger, I was greeted by my own face smiling nice and wide back at me. Flinching back I stared in horror as the image of myself stared at me with the same creepy smile Creole had always reserved for me. This couldn't be happening. I really was losing my mind. Common Travis. You've left me in the dark for so long, and it takes him to show up to finally come and let me see again. I asked myself. This Travis was the one that murdered my parents and God knows who else. How he appeared before me was evidence enough. His black suit drenched in blood splatters and the crazed smile I had seen from myself just before being able to wrangle control back. This can't be happening. I mumbled to myself. Trapped between the two. Creole put his arm around me and held me in a chokehold of sorts while he rubbed my head. I tried to wrangle free from him, but it was for nothing as whenever I tried to move, other Travis pointed a sharp kitchen knife at me. Oh, it is, Travis my boy. Creole hummed as he held me in the uncomfortable stranglehold. And when his hands went towards the stitches across my neck both me and other Travis instantly froze in our tracks. The smile on other Travis dipped a bit as he looked up at Creole. I see both of you understand what happens if I rip out y'all's stitches. Maybe that'll make you both behave yourselves. He said with a chuckle, shoving me away and into other Travis's hands. You wouldn't do that. I said quickly. Shoving the other me away and looking back at my former boss and former abuser. You need my body, you wouldn't dare touch me. I quickly shouted, standing from the bench and wanting to leave. Only to find myself sitting right back down the second I started walking away. True, Creole said with a soft and happy hum. But all I need is you two to slip and allow me back in the pilot seat. You're fighting a war on two fronts, Travis. And you can't hold us both down. Creole giggled, other Travis joining in with him as he realized just what this opportunity meant for him. You squish me down, he'll take over. Squish him down, I'll finish up my business. He said, folding his hands and placing them on his crossed legs. He's right, Travis. The other me said in excitement. Bringing the knife up to my neck and causing me to stay completely still for fear of him even nicking the stitches on my throat. I've been eyeing that little family we've got back at home for a very long time. Maybe now I'll finally get a chance. He giggled, causing me to bash his face in with the back of my head. Causing him to drop the knife and grip his nose. Now children, no fighting. Creole scolded the two of us. Causing us to stare back at him and forcibly quiet it down. He stood and fixed his tie, brushing his black hair out of his face. I let you take the reins for now, Travis. But the second you start slip in, I'll finish what I started here. He chuckled with a smile, tipping his hat to me as he seemingly vanished into thin air before my eyes. Other Travis also disappeared when I looked behind myself. I never felt more lost or terrified in my entire fucked up life. Why didn't I go to college? I asked myself that every day. But honestly, with my luck, I'd get shackled with some professor that wants to brainwash me or something. That would really be my luck for that to happen. As for now, I'm currently stealing the Wisconsin Fi from a coffee shop a decent way from both the Voodoo store and from Alexandra's shop. Hopefully, it's enough time to let one take control and regain some strength to stop them from doing anything. Alexandra. If you're reading this. I'm so sorry for everything. Honestly, I really wish you and Olivia could have just moved as far away as possible from King Creole as you could have. Then you two could live a nice normal life. Not shackled with a useless ex-voodoo puppet that either wants to kill you or use you for some horrible voodoo ritual. I just wish I could tell you both how sorry I am. And how badly I want to slice your throats open and watch you both plead and beg for mercy. Coming for both of you. Oh dear, is this working? Oh, it is. Hello all. My name is Alexandra, I'm sure Travis has talked at length about who I am. I do apologize for taking over Travis's account, but he hasn't been seen or heard from since he attacked me and Olivia. Oh dear, I probably shouldn't have said that. Well, I suppose I might as well fill you all in on what has happened. Ever since we defeated King Creole, Travis has been in a terrible downward spiral. I'm sure he has filled you all in on his little late night episodes. I've had the misfortune of walking in on his return. It terrifies me when I see his deranged face staring at me. 
those button eyes and his chalk white skin send me back to the decades I lived under Creole's control. While what I went through was nowhere as bad as how Travis got it, it was still a horrible experience. Being turned into a doll is something I cannot begin to describe to all you sweet people. I can best describe it as being unable to move, talk, or anything. I believe that's known as being paralyzed. The one thing I could do, however was communicate with the other dolls. Not through talking mind you, but through our thoughts. We each could talk to and feel each other's thoughts. It's difficult to explain, especially for me, but it was like the voice you have in your head of yourself being able to talk to another person. I tried to cheer Travis up in any way I could, but he just stayed in his room and continued his downward spiral. The day I started sleeping with a knife under my pillow was the night when I woke up to check on him and saw him standing outside of Olivia's room. Hand on the doorknob and knife clutched firmly in his hand. He looked at me with a smile that chilled me to the very bone. It was like King Creole's. I approached him and gently took him into my arms. I hugged him tightly, hoping that he would get the murderous rage out on me instead of Olivia. I held him for what felt like an hour, my heart practically pounding out of my chest. But soon he dropped the knife and wrapped his arms around me. Patting his back I carefully led him back to his bed and sat him down in it. I know he can't sleep, but it's better than having him threatening to hurt my Olivia. Since then I've made sure to keep an extra eye on him. And well it looks like I didn't keep a close enough eye on him. Travis has been sneaking out much much more frequently. Not just at night for his little murders. But going out until the brink of dawn and coming back without so much as a word. He wouldn't speak to me or anything and it caused me to wonder what he could possibly be doing. That question was answered when one night as I was tucking Olivia into bed, I heard him talking to himself. He had left his door open a crack and I was able to listen in on him. Past the ramblings and giggles, I kept hearing him repeat the same phrase over and over. It's almost time. Almost time. Almost time. Over and over again he said that. What could he have meant? I racked my brain all night trying to think of what he could possibly be walking about. A familiar friend brought some much needed clearance. I know how much you all seem to love the little template doll. And I must confess he is quite the cute little thing. And he seemingly cares deeply for Travis, so he was able to fill me in on what he had been doing all this time. Travis had been going to the voodoo shop night after night and seemingly talking to King Creole in some capacity. That's why I tried to stop Travis from going that morning. Seeing the blank sheet of paper he called a flyer sent chills up my spine. Finally, when he emerged from his room dressed up as King Creole it finally hit me. He had managed to claw his way back to us. Sometimes I wish I could just take Olivia and run from all this. But I look at Travis like a son. And any parent should help their children when they are in desperate need for help. So after Travis had left the house I quickly called Olivia in sick for the day and kept her home and near to me. She was just as wogged on, Olivia fell asleep in my arms and I held her as she did. Keeping her clothes and watching as the minutes ticked on and on. I nearly fell asleep myself when I heard the sounds of tapping on the window. I flinched awake and looked towards the window right next to the bed. And the smiling pale face of Travis met me. His red painted cheek so stark against his pale face. I had barely any time to think before he began smashing his head against the window over and over again. Olivia startled awake and quickly clung to me, trying to figure out what was going on. I quickly stood up and ordered her to run to her room and lock the door. But I don't want to leave you, mommy. She screamed hysterically. Clinging to my legs and refusing to budge as I grabbed the knife from under my pillow. I looked down at her and felt like I was already being stabbed in my heart. I didn't want to leave her either. But I had no other option. I quickly bent down and kissed her. It'll be okay. I'll come to get you. Just go please. I pleaded with her. Holding her adorable little face in my hands. She looked at me and quickly nodded. Fetching the template from my bed and quickly running for the door. I next turned my attention to Travis, who was now stabbing his way through the window. Finally smashing his way in and climbing inside. He was no longer wearing the hate, but the horrible smile was still plastered on his face. Alexandra. Just the Brit I was looking for. He chuckled at me, putting his hand into his hair and giving it a good stroke. That boy so desperately needs a good haircut. He took a step towards me and I quickly jutted the knife out towards him. Please Travis. 
I know you don't want to do this. I said, my hands trembling despite my efforts to the contrary. His smile grew wider as he chuckled at me. Stepping closer and clutching his knife with such intensity I thought he was going to break the wooden handle. Just be lucky the little brat isn't here. I would just love to gutter like a little lamb. He snickered, planting his knife into the headboard of my bed and dragging it across it as he stepped closer. I swallowed the bile building up in my mouth and continued to give up ground. Staring at his button eyes and imaging back to when I was first turned into a doll. And just the horror I felt as I stared into Creel's eyes as he laughed at me for my stupid mistake. Well, I won't ever make that same mistake ever again. Quickly holding my knife out I charged at him, catching off guard and bashing him in the head with the handle. He stumbled to the side and with an animal-like growl, he pulled the knife from the wooden headboard and slashed at me. Receiving a glancing blow on my arm I bit my lips hard so as not to give him the satisfaction of any noise from me. Clutching my arm I saw that he was winding up for another swipe at me, so I ducked and rushed him again, planting my head firmly in his stomach. I think it's called a headbutt. Whatever it's called it got him to retch and stumble to the floor. Acting quickly I kicked the knife away from his hand, only to receive a sharp and painful stab to my foot from a small knife he was hiding in his pocket. This time I let out a pained screech. Bending over I gritted my teeth while he giggled, as if he had just done the most hilarious thing he could think of. Undeterred I shrugged off the stab and pointed my own knife at his throat. I know for a fact that is his weak spot and he seemingly knew too as he quickly froze in his place. You wouldn't dare. He chuckled, his demeanor changing before my very eyes. His crazed smile and little giggles ceased. A more refined and dignified tone took over in his voice. A hint of a southern accent. King Creel. Wouldn't I? I won't let either of you harm me or Olivia. I said calmly. Despite the pain, I felt from the blood leaking out of me. He smiled at me. The smile Creel gives when he knows he has an edge over someone. I would never hurt Olivia. I've told you as such. But you. Oh, I and the other Travis would be more than happy to see your traitorous blood spilled everywhere. He chuckled, shifting a bit and pressing his neck right up against the knife I had against it. My brows raised as I backed the knife out. He smiled and easily pushed me off. If you really wanted to hurt us, you would have used that sharp part on us. He chuckled again, standing up and patting himself off. Pulling that black top hat from seemingly nowhere he placed it on his head and pulled his fingers across the brim of it. Standing up and using the bed to keep my balance as I lifted my injured leg up like a horse I stared at him. That may be true. But you no longer deserve to walk on this earth, Creel. I said to him, placing my leg down and grunting as I applied pressure to it. Walking up to him and meeting him eye to buttons. And so help me, I will save Travis from you. He offered me a smile and a TSK. Wagging his finger at me. God, he can be so condescending when he thinks he has the upper hand. He reached out and grabbed me by the throat, giving it a hard squeeze and stealing any air I had in my lungs as he held me a good three feet off the floor. And who are you to tell me that? He asked his cordial tone dropping and that animalistic snarl that he had when he was enraged. Shouldn't you be dead? Perhaps you'd like to be the actual age you should be. Remind me again, Alexandra. Aren't you supposed to be almost 130? He asked me, bringing my face mere inches from his. And you, aren't? I asked him, still defiant to him. He raised a brow and chuckled, he tossed me to the floor and walked over to me, kicking me in the head with his shiny dress shoes. The world spun as I fell fully to the floor. He climbed on top of me and squished my face into the floor. I closed my eyes and tried to force back tears, but they started flowing. You dare to tell me that? You? The woman who abandoned her children and came to America all by herself. Left the poor things with your low-life alcoholic husband. He snarled in my ear. Pressing my face down deeper into the floor while he relished my soft crying. Would you like to know what he did to them? He cooed, lifting me up by my hair and staring at me with his button eyes. No, I don't. Because Olivia is my daughter. She's the only family I need. I shouted at him. Causing him to flinch at my response. He bashed my face down on the floor again. My vision going blurry and dark from the hit. I gave her to you. And I can easily rip her away from you. He shouted at me, standing up and walking past me. Heading towards the bedroom door. 
I looked up in horror and struggled to push myself up and save Olivia. Turns out I didn't have to, since I heard a thud. Looking up I saw that Travis's body had slumped to the floor and was twitching violently. Cautiously I pushed myself up and grabbed one of the knives from the floor. Limping over to the body it suddenly stopped twitching and shot up, grabbing me by the arms. Alexandra. You need to lock me up. Stop me from doing anything else to you. Please. Travis begged me, I could tell it was him by just his voice and mannerisms. I quickly got down on the floor and grabbed him by the shoulders. Travis, you know that can't stop Creole from escaping. I told him in a soft tone to calm him down. He stared at me for a moment and seemingly knew that I was right. Looking at me, he began heaving and hiccuping. Since he can't really cry tears that's all he can really do. I wrapped my arms around him and patted his back. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. He whimpered, hugging me tightly and crying into my neck. This poor boy has gone through so much. And it pains me to see just how much he has deteriorated since I was first brought back as a human. It's okay. It's okay. I told him. Trying to calm him down enough to get him to open up about what Creel was planning. When he finally did he slumped a bit as he seemingly was trying to remember anything about what the voodoo creature was planning. The voodoo shop. That's all I know really. He wants to reopen it. I can only assume it's to get his power back and maybe put my soul and other Travis's soul in a doll. He said quickly, standing up and looking around. Confused and scared as all hell. He then looked at me and grabbed my shoulders. Please help me. I can't stay here. It's too dangerous for me here. You have to help. He said quickly, reaching into his suit pocket and handing me his cellular phone. Before quickly running towards the window and jumping out of it. Horrified I ran to see what had happened to him. But as I got to the window I saw him running off down the street at full sprint. Looking down at his phone I struggled with opening it and finally figured it out. His password was simple as well and soon I learned about all of you. Thank you all for helping him in the limited ways you all can. But now it looks like it's up to me and Olivia to help save Travis. She would not take no for an answer when I told her that I was going to try and help him. She loves him like a brother and she wants to save him. But another unlikely ally has also made himself known. The voodoo template. In fact, he has suggested getting help from an old friend of ours. Of course, it would be risky to try and contact her, but at this rate. Mary is all we have left to try and help Travis. So, we will perform a seance to try and summon her. Hopefully, she will help us in any way that she can. We've made a terrible mistake. An absolute and horrible mistake. After Travis fled my home I took Olivia and the template doll out of the house and headed with them to the voodoo shop. Why would I go there? I hear you all asking me. Well please allow me to explain. The voodoo store acts like a giant mouse trap for spirits. If you are killed in there or are cursed in any way your soul is forever trapped inside the dusty walls. So that means that even though she was finally freed from her imprisonment, Mary is still trapped inside its walls. Taking Olivia and the template there was difficult to do. While I know that Olivia absolutely adores the voodoo shop since it gave her me and a friend in the form of King Creole. The things I've seen happen in there still haunt me. But if it meant that we could save Travis, I was willing to do it. Arriving at the shop and seeing that no one was nearer inside it, we made our way inside. What Travis said was true. The voodoo store was reopening. And by the look of things, it was going to open very soon. Letting Olivia go and roam around the uninhabited store, I set about getting the seance ready and prepared. I still had the knife on me for safety, so I set that on the counter and began to pull some candles from the purse I had brought with me. Unlike Travis, I would hopefully be able to do this without reviving any vengeful spirits. Mommy, can I keep this? Olivia asked me, running to me and holding up a shrunken head. Recoiling a bit I quickly took it from her hands and set it on the counter away from her. No Olivia. We aren't here for a shopping trip. We're here to try and save Travis. I told her, taking her hand and pulling her closer to me. She pouted a bit but she knew that I was being serious, so she nodded. She pulled the template doll from her little pocket and held him close while I lit the candles. Now the other problem with the voodoo shop is just how many people have died here. The shop has been open since the 1920s. 
you can imagine just how many people King Creole has had his fun with. So doing a seance here risks other angry ghosts and spirits, trying to latch onto any trace of the other side that they can. So we had to be careful. Lighting the candles I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. Mary Simmons. I summon you forth to communicate with us. If you are so willing. I softly spoke in the dimly lit room. I held my breath as I waited for any kind of response. It felt like a million angry eyes were staring at me. They no doubt were. Jealous of me for getting a second chance. You don't have to use my last name you know. He never let anyone named Mary inside the shop anyway. A soft, snarky voice spoke to me. Opening my eyes, the form of a blonde woman came into shape. Smiling at her I chuckled and nodded. That was true, even the name Mary sent Creole into a violent mood swing. It's good to finally meet the famous Mary. I chuckled, the woman offering me a smile and fluffing up her blonde curls a bit. She looked stunning. I can see why Creole had her turned into a porcelain doll. Even if he was furious with her betrayal, her beauty was simply stunning. I take it this is about, Travis. She asked me. Coming around the counter and joining us on the other side. She looked down at Olivia with a raised brow. My little girl looked up at her and waved a shy little hand at her. That put a smile on her face. How can I help? She asked. Creole has possessed his body. Not to mention the lack of sleep and well, everything that's happened to him has broken his sanity. I explained, sighing as I twirled my hair around my fingers. I'm worried about him I mumbled, chewing on my thumbnail. I could tell. The other spirits are really riled up about the fact Creole is back. Mary explained looking around at the dusty and insidious store and sighed as she crossed her arms across her chest. I'm going to be honest with you, Alexandra. It looks very bleak. Travis isn't strong enough to fight off the both of them. All it'll take is Creole to get the final upper hand and he'll be able to suppress both of them. The ghostly figure of the woman explained. I sighed hard and shook my head. Is there any way for us to stop him? Perhaps Baron Samedi could help us again. I asked her, but I received a shake of the head from her. Why not? Creole promised him a percentage of the souls he brings into the shop to him. Baron is taking the bribe and turning the other cheek. Mary explained softly. My heart sank through the floorboards and right into the basement. How could that bastard have really found a way out of this? Is there really nothing we can do? I asked her. Really begged from her. The look she gave me was one of forlorn hope and then one of absolute terror as her gaze went past mine and towards the door. Raising a brow I followed her gaze right into the button eyes of Travis. Well, well. I didn't even have to try and trick you into coming here, did I? He giggled at me. A soft southern accent in his voice. That sent a chill up my spine when I realized he was wearing that old black top hat. I reached out and pulled Olivia close to me while she instinctively pushed her face into my stomach. King Creole took a further step into his shop and looked around. His button eyes falling squarely on Mary. Hello, Charles. Got to say you look better with some color on you. Mary said snarkily. A smile on her face. She thought because it was through a seance he wouldn't be able to touch her or retaliate. But she underestimated him. Because just as she said that he reached out and grabbed her by the throat. Seemingly pulling her out of the spirit realm and back into the human one. And, Mary. It feels so good to be able to punish you again. He growled happily. Mary stared at herself in disbelief. Really so did I. I had never heard of being able to literally pull someone back from the dead. But King Creole is always full of surprises. Which made the next part that much more surprising to me. He smashed her face against the counter. At which point her face shattered into a million little glass shards. I let out a scream at that, grabbing Olivia and holding her as close to me as I possibly could. Mary's body cracked all over the place before she crumbled away into dust. I watched as the pieces seeped into the creaky floorboards and disappeared. I looked up at Creole who spun on his heels to look at me. A big wide smile plastered on his face. Olivia squeezed me hard, terrified about what might be happening to us. In turn, she hugged me so hard that she dropped her doll onto the floor. We both backed up to the wall as Creole followed slowly after us. You know, Alexandra my dear. He said with a chuckle, his dress shoes tapping on the hard wooden floor as he approached me and Olivia. A lot of the dolls were very jealous that you were chosen instead of them. He said with a little giggle as he kept approaching us. 
his foot stepping on the voodoo doll and looking down at it. What is this disgusting thing doing here? He snarled. To which, Olivia let me go and quickly scooped up her doll. Don't hurt him, Mr. King Creole. He's my dolly. She said, quickly backing up into my arms. I looked at Creole as he was. I said, keeping Olivia close to me and making sure she didn't so much as a step away from near me. The second she got out of sight of the both of us was the second I stopped being human or worse stopped living. He looked over to me as he got behind the counter, that sickening smile on his face. Well. Once I'm done dealing with Travis and his annoying alter ego, I'll open up the shop. And once the shop is open I had the glorious idea of opening other voodoo stores around the country. I thought to myself, why have all your eggs in a basket? He chuckled, reaching down behind the counter and pulling out two glass bottles and a sharp knitting needle. How could you possibly run all those shops by yourself? I scoffed, ever carefully reaching behind my back for the knife I had tucked in my purse. Creole let out a soft chuckle as he lifted up the knitting needle and tapped the tip with his finger. I do have friends, Alexandra. You know that. Very good friends in fact. Monsieur LeBlanc and Mr. Sinclair for instance. They would love the opportunity to join my business. Once their own affairs are in order of course. He chuckled, lifting the needle up and jamming it into his temple. I gasped and quickly covered Olivia's eyes as she screamed in terror. I watched as he twisted the needle around in his head and slowly pulled it out. A wispy, almost fluffy-like source of light exited with the tip of the needle. It was a bright and fiery red, seemingly wanting to escape from the needle as Creole brought it over to the bottle and stuck the needle with the light into it. Dot, I'm sure you can figure out who that is. Creole chuckled as he pulled the needle away quickly and sealed it with a cork. The light inside the bottle grew bright and began angrily smashing itself against the bottle with minimal effect to it. That could only be the other Travis. What are you planning on doing with them? I shouted, letting my hands let go of Olivia and pointing an accusing finger at the voodoo puppet. He looked at me with a chuckle as he once again drove the needle into his head. This time he drove it in deeper, all the while staring at me with a smile that turned my blood cold. Slowly he pulled out another wispy light. This one was blue and made no attempt at resistance. Ah, poor little Travis seems to have given up. He chuckled, placing Travis's soul into the other bottle and placing the cork into it. The light didn't move at all in the bottle, it barely even glowed, unlike the red one which shone like a lantern. I was thinking of turning them into dolls. Maybe keeping them on the shelf as a little fun knick-knack. He shrugged with a chuckle. He put his hands on the counter and smiled at me. I took the opportunity to strike, pulling the knife from my purse and driving it into his hand, pinning him to the counter. Quickly I picked up Olivia and made it like lighting out of there. While Creole screamed and raved after us. At this point, I don't know what to do. It feels like I've exhausted all my options and Travis is now trapped in a bottle back in the voodoo store. And Mary has seemingly been completely wiped from the realm. He has a body back and it'll be only a few more days before the voodoo store will reopen. I'm at my wit's end. Do any of you think you can help us? Wait. Olivia is screaming. Olivia had good reason to scream, as when I quickly reached her room she was hiding under her bed from the figure that was sitting at her little table and seats where she has tea parties. I swallowed hard as I approached the figure. But when it turned to me I felt a wave of relief wash over me. Baron Samedi. I sighed, bowing a bit to the voodoo loa and ushering Olivia to come out from under her bed. Showing her that everything was okay. She poked her head out further and carefully slid out and ran to me. She hugged my waist and buried her face into my dress. Bonjour, madam. Seems you've had a little run-in with the cockroach. He chuckled in his shrill voice. He got up and removed his top hat to me. I nodded and patted Olivia's head as she whimpered audibly. I guess her notion of King Creole being her friend has finally been shattered. Which is just fine by me. He said that the two of you have a deal with each other I said with a tone of betrayal. He had been the one to decry King Creole as nothing more than a cockroach and had seemed more than delighted to drag the undead voodoo king back down to hell where he belongs. So why would he let him go? I wouldn't call it a deal with him. It's a deal with his mama. The Baron chuckled, pulling a cigar from nowhere and chomped his disgusting yellow teeth down on the item. 
lighting up the item he puffed on it for a good few seconds before finally finishing what he had been saying. His mama had a change in heart and wanted her sonny boy back up here. So I looked the other way in exchange for a little tribute from him. He shrugged, tapping his cigar and dropping ash all over my floors. You can't do that. He was dead and buried, he shouldn't be allowed to roam any longer. I pleaded to the loa, but he just looked at me and raised a brow, taking the cigar out of his mouth and blowing a disgusting cloud of smoke into my face. I could say the same of you, bitch. You shouldn't be alive neither, and yet here you are. Walking and talking to me. He snuffed, placing the cigar back in his mouth and continuing to puff away. He had a point. I might as well be the same age as Creole is, and yet I walk around as if I haven't aged since I first walked into his dreadful shop. Monsieur Baron, please. There has to be something you can do to save Travis. I begged from him. At Travis's name, the Baron looked at me with a puzzled look and removed his cigar. Travis. The loose end. He asked me. I looked up at him in a bit of confusion. Travis is certainly a lot of things, but I've never exactly considered him a loose end. Whatever that meant. I simply nodded since I just hoped that it was my Travis we were talking about. I see. So that's how the cockroach shit is walking around without a body. He just took one over. The Baron nodded to himself. Yes I butted in quickly. He's taken out Travis's soul and has the body all to himself now I said. This revelation greatly interested the Baron who nodded and stroked his chin with his gloved hands. I see. I see. Tell you what girly, get me both of that boy's souls and I'll see if I can't help him some. He nodded with a chuckle, reaching a hand out to shake mine. But I refused his hand. Instead nodding a verbal agreement. I've dealt with voodoo long enough to know to never agree to a concrete agreement. Just before the Baron left he took a look at the doll that Olivia was clutching for dear life. He got down on her level and beckoned for her to come to him. Olivia whimpered loudly as she gripped me for dear life. But slowly I coaxed her into going over to the voodoo loa. Let me see your dolly. I promise I won't hurt him. He chuckled. Olivia looked down at her template doll and carefully handed him over to Samedi. He took the voodoo doll and examined it. His eyes opened ever so slightly the more he looked at it. He gave a happy giggle and handed the doll back to Olivia. That little thing has a mighty big secret. He chuckled as he disappeared into a cloud of smoke. I hugged Olivia as she came running back to me. Rubbing her back I looked down at the little template doll. Why was he suddenly getting so much attention? It's true that he certainly is an odd one. Unlike the other dolls I used to talk to in the shop, the template never talks about his former life. He's like a vault in the way that he never opens up about himself. What could the Baron mean in the template having a big secret? Deciding to leave Olivia at home by herself was one of the hardest decisions in my new life. I could have left her with a sitter, but I trust her more by herself than her with a stranger. She is safer there and being anywhere near the voodoo store. While that puts me in danger without her to protect me from King Creole, it's worth it as long as she stays safe. Leaving her with food and a tight hug and a kiss, I went off to the voodoo store. Knife in purse and nothing more than my determination. Arriving at the store my heart sank to the floor seeing that after so long, the half-priced voodoo store was now open again. I approached the door and peered into the glass. Seeing Creole in Travis's body talking to a new customer. I took a deep breath as I entered the store. Both of them stopped mid-conversation and looked at me. Creole kept his outward smile, but I knew he was furious at me. Like he usually is. The customer however just shrugged and went back to talking to the voodoo salesman. Like I was saying, I was hoping you could get rid of my ex-wife. The bitch is sucking me dry of alimony, and I want her gone. The man said, leaning on the counter and looking at Creole like he was going to save whatever poor life that he was living at that moment. What? Oh, yes of course. The voodoo king chuckled, fixing his tie and patting the counter free of dust. Sending the man sputtering and coughing. Creole smiled and reached behind the counter and pulled out a notepad. I simply need her details. Name, address, blood type, that sort of stuff. He said with a chuckle and handed the man the notepad. He stopped coughing and looked annoyed at Creole, but took a pen from his pocket and began scribbling on the notepad. Muttering to himself and finally ripping the page and handing the scrap to the voodoo king. Creole took the paper and crumbled it up in his hand. A puff of smoke coming in between his fingers. When he opened up his hand nothing remained of the paper but ash. And it is done. Creole hummed as he blew the ashes into the man's face. 
She sputtered again and stared at Creel with nothing but anger in his eyes. But he simply turned around and walked away. Muttering to himself and walking past me. Rudely bumping his shoulder into mine and continuing without even saying he was sorry. Quite the charmer I mumbled as I walked over to Creel. He stared at me with that grin and drummed his fingers on the counter. I took a deep breath and cracked my knuckles like I've seen cool people do on the Netflix. I want Travis's souls I demanded. My, my, my. Look at you demanding something from me in my own shop. He hummed with acid in his voice. Standing up straight and reaching behind the counter. He placed the two bottles down in front of me. The blue soul still remained motionless, while the red one continued to fruitlessly smash itself against the bottle to escape. Why do you want them? He asked with a chuckle, lifting the blue one up and giving it a hard shake. None of your business. This is a business transaction. I have stated my desired product and you must give me what I desire. I said, clutching the straps of my purse tightly as I mustered up all the courage I had. You say it is none of my business. But darling, you're currently in my shop. Alone. With nothing but that little knife in your purse. What can you possibly do to me? He chuckled, taking the bottles back and placing it back down behind the counter. I huffed, knowing that he was right, but I still had an ace up my sleeve. Taking a deep breath I reached into my pocket and pulled out the knife. He looked at me with a pleased smile and a giggle as I raised it up. Of course, he didn't expect me to throw the weapon at the wall behind him. Crashing into the bottles of souls and sending a couple crashing down. You goddamn bitch. He shouted reaching up and grabbing a straggling soul and then another. While he was preoccupied I jumped over the counter and searched behind it for the bottles. Only to come to the horrible realization that there was nothing there behind the counter. The sound of his chuckles left my blood frozen. You really didn't think I would have his souls out in the open, did you? He snickered as he shoved each soul back in its respective bottle and then back up on the shelf. I looked back at him and swallowed the bile building up in my throat. I was caught there with nothing to show for it. And in my horror he gripped me by the shoulder and pulled me to the feet, spinning me around to stare at me with his button eyes. Seeing Travis's face with such anger and hatred towards me nearly broke my heart into a million pieces. The bell to the front door jangled and both of us looked over at the entrance. And my jaw dropped as Olivia struggled to push the door open. Finally, she quickly shuffled into the store, her little arm squeezing the template doll in her arms. Don't hurt my mommy. She said with all the courage a seven-year-old can have. Creole looked at her and then at me and snuffed, a long and annoyed chuckle coming from his throat. He pushed me away and towards Olivia. I stumbled forward and she quickly ran to me and hugged me hard. Why must you insist on bringing that thing here? Creole scoffed, his button gaze looking down at the template doll in Olivia's hands. She pouted and let me go. Going over to him and pointing up at him with an accusing finger. He's the real Charles. She said angrily. You're nothing but a big bully who hurts people. She shouted angrily. My jaw dropped to the floor as I watched my little girl stand up for herself and for her doll friend. Although her words didn't really make any sense to me. Oh. Is that right? He chuckled, reaching down and grabbing Olivia by her hair and yanking her up to his eye line. Gasping I stood to stop him, but I was suddenly held back by the strings that once tortured and hurt Travis. They wrapped themselves around my wrists and kept me back. I'm not the real Charles, huh? And this stupid doll is, huh? He snorted laughing, snatching the doll from her little hands and dangling it in front of her as she screamed. Let her go. I screamed as the strings tightened and began cutting into my wrists drawing blood with how hard they were tightening. Creole giggled as he grabbed Olivia harder by the hair until he suddenly let out a grunt as suddenly dropped her to the floor. I watched as the little template doll stabbed Creole with a needle. The little doll then let itself go from Creole's grip and crawled up the voodoo king's chest and up to his throat. Get off me. He shouted, grabbing the doll only to be again stabbed by the doll. Who then produced a razor blade from its mouth and in one swift motion sliced the stitches across Creole's throat. He gagged and clutched his throat as the black sludge that kept his body alive began leaking out of him. The strings around my arms let go. Allowing me to run to Olivia and picked her up. The little doll latching to my ankle as I ran to the door. Creole clutched his throat as he stared at us run. 
I could feel the buttons burning into my skull as we ran from the shop. Seems Tempe as he likes to be called, does claim to be the real Charles Sumner. Or more accurately everything that he used to be. All the good that was Charles Sumner was placed into the doll. While the hatred and anger over his death was left to corrupt and decay into the horrible King Creole. I don't know if I believe him, but he saved my life. And even Creole and Samedi seem to know something about this little guy. I and Olivia will perform a seance with him to see if we can get in touch with the spirit stuck inside the doll. And maybe just maybe we can finally end the reign of King Creole. Setting Tempe down carefully on the table I stared at him as he stared back up at me with his little button eyes. We stared at each other for an uncomfortable amount of seconds before Olivia finally came running back with her box of chalks and a couple candles from my room. Thank you, sweetheart, I told her, taking her items and rewarding her with a forehead kiss. She smiled up at me and climbed into the chair next to me as I started drawing a circle around the template doll. It sprouted from a circle into a series of designs that when I finally finished, covered the entire table around where Tempe was placed. How is this supposed to let him talk to us, mommy? Olivia asked me, playing with a loose piece of chalk from her box. I sighed as I lit the candles and placed them in their designated spots. I wasn't sure that this would work at all. In fact, I was almost sure that it would cause more harm than good. But at this point, it was the only kind of lead that I had. The circle will keep his spirit trapped inside it so we can safely talk to him, I explained. I stood to go turn the lights off and stopped as I turned to look at Tempe sitting down on the counter. He looked at me and gave the slightest nod to me. Nodding back I flicked off the lights and walked back to my chair with Olivia. Taking her hand in my own I looked at her and gave her another comforting smile. I call on the spirit of Charles Sumner to come forth and speak to us, I told whatever spirits were hanging around the seance. I closed my eyes and gripped Olivia's hand as I waited for something to happen. And something did happen. I smelt burning. Opening my eyes quickly I saw that the entire table was becoming engulfed in flames as the candles were suddenly shooting three foot flames into the ceiling. Flinching hard, I quickly grabbed Olivia and pulled her away from the table. Tempe sat still as the smoke and fire coalesced around him and soon obscured him completely. I nearly thought that something had gone wrong and that we had lost our only hope of saving Travis. But as suddenly as the fire had become uncontrollable it immediately died down and on the table was sitting a young man. His skin was tannish and his hair was black and messy. Looking at him, it seemed impossible for me to remember who he was. But imagining that those soft hazel eyes being replaced with buttons snapped me back to who this was. Bonjour. He chuckled awkwardly. Waving to me and Olivia from his position on the table. He sat there with his legs crossed and a soft smile on his face. I and Olivia looked at each other in shock, but slowly we approached the table together. Charles Sumner. I asked him. He let out another awkward chuckle and rubbed his head with his hand. Seemingly tugging at the back of his hair. It certainly has been a while since anyone has called me by my real name. He said with a look of both happiness and a little sadness as well. I looked down at Olivia who was already calm as any little kid can be near a strange man sitting on her table. But yes, he began again. I'm Charlie Sumner. Or Tempe if you'd like. He smiled, his teeth nice and white, and that smile alone calming me down. So. You really are the real Charles? I asked him. Picking up my knocked over a chair and sitting down in it. Far enough away from him to be safe, if he tried anything funny. Charles shrugged and looked around the room for a second. I wouldn't say, the King Creel is the fake Charles Sumner either. He corrected me. Sighing as he sat with his knees pulled up to his chin. Resting his head on his knees. I guess you can call us the sides of a coin. He explained. Like Dr. Jelly and Mr. Hyde. Olivia spoke up, raising her little hand up to draw our attention to her. We both looked down at her and offered her a little snicker. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, sweetie, I told her. Seemingly blowing her mind that she had been saying it wrong this entire time. Charles joined me in a little chuckle, but he shook his head after a little bit. It isn't like that exactly. It's more like this. He suddenly shifted to more comfortable and began to explain it to the best of his ability. After I was murdered and brought back I wasn't instantly King Creole. I was still Charles Sumner. 
but learning what Mary did to me caused me to lash out and do what I did to her and her accomplices. He explained, looking at the two of us to see if we were still following along. Well, I kept all that anger and rage built up inside of me. I didn't have anyone to talk to except my mama, and I didn't expect her to understand how I felt. Being brought back to life and having killed and cursed so many people. And one day I guess all that built up anger and rage split into a completely different creature. He sighed, his breath shaking as he put his face into his hands. King Creole. I finished for him. So how can we stop him? We've tried everything to beat him. I asked him, to which he responded with a shrug. Sending my stomach to the floor. I don't know. His spirit is resilient. You saw the other Travis's soul. Those kinds of souls seem to have endless energy inside them. They just refuse to give up. He sighed looking around the kitchen and taking in his surroundings. Everything's a lot smaller when you aren't a doll. He chuckled. What about Baron Samedi? He offered to help if we got Travis's souls to him. Charles scoffed at that. What he'll probably do is take the souls with him. Probably the first of Creel's new tribute to him. He responded to us, suddenly his tan face going pale and backing up quickly from the table. I raised a brow at him, but the freezing cold hand being placed on my shoulder shocked me into staying still how right you are. The familiar voice of Travis with that newly soft southern accent sent me into panic mode as I quickly turned to meet him, only to receive a smack at the back of the head by a hard object. Sending me down to the kitchen floor. Get away from me. Olivia shouted, running away from Creole and quickly climbing up onto the table to cower with Charles. I heard the steps of his dress shoes and the tapping of his cane as he passed me. I reached an arm out to try and stop him, only to have it stepped on by his shoes. I do owe you a big thanks, Alexandra. He told me, a smile on his face as he lowered his face to meet mine, as he began grinding his foot into my hand. You made it much easier to finally rid myself of him. I could only assume he was talking about Charles. I swear to god I'll fucking rip your head off if you touch Olivia. I snarled at him, letting out a restrained grunt as he pressed even more weight onto my hand. The sickening crunch that came afterward caused me to let out an agonized scream. No need for such foul language. I thought you Brits were taught better than that. He chuckled, letting my hand go from his vice-like grip and sending a blow right to my ribs, taking the breath out of me. Don't hurt my mommy. Olivia's voice brought me back from the brink of passing out in pain. Looking up I saw that she had launched herself a creole and was frantically beating her with her little hands as she clung to him. She clung to his back as she tried to protect me from him. My, certainly a brave effort creole growled. Seconds from getting her off his back when the unmistakable sound of the frying pan hitting him rang out in the kitchen. He stumbled forward and began slumping against the wall. Straining my neck I saw that Charles had managed to reach out and grab a frying pan from the sink and had struck his altar self with it. End the seance. He quickly shouted, looking down at the still flaming candles and the circle keeping him trapped on the table. Not fully understanding why he wanted that, I simply nodded and crawled over to the table. Grabbing the nearest candle I could reach from the floor. I snuffed out against the floor and sighed hard as they all went out. Leaving me and Olivia in darkness. Where did he go? Olivia's scared voice asked me as she quickly came running over to me and helped me get up to my knees. I looked around our darkened kitchen, still expecting to see Creole against the wall. Wait. But to my surprise, he wasn't anywhere to be seen. Looking at the table I saw, the Tempe was still sitting on his spot on the kitchen table. He must have been called here by the seance. It is a part of his soul after all. I sighed, mentally smacking myself for not foreseeing the possibility of this happening. I really must stop doing these seances. If anything they've just caused nothing but problems. Sitting up and gripping my head as it spun, I managed to get up straight and walk over to Tempe. What do we do now, mommy? Olivia asked me. I looked over to her as I picked Tempe up and handed him to her. She wrapped her arms around him and looked up at me. Still waiting for an answer from me. And I didn't have one for her. It truly felt like I had nowhere else to go. No way at all to save Travis. I don't know, sweetheart. I really don't. I sighed, sitting on the chair and letting out a hard sigh as I touched the back of my head. Wincing at the sting I felt back. I looked over to Olivia who was busy whispering something at Tempe. I raised a brow at that. It had never crossed my mind that she was able to talk to him without the need for a seance. Otherwise how else had she known that I was in danger at the voodoo store? 
Mommy. Her excited voice quickly brought me out of that train of thought and I looked down at her. Tempe says that maybe he can help us after all. She said quickly, jumping up and down and holding the little template all up in the air as she did so. I looked at them both with doubts, but I listened to their plan. Olivia did her best to describe it and I listened to both of them. Can that even work? I mean honestly you two. That has to be really one of the brashest ideas ever. I snuffed at them. Olivia held Tempe up to her ear and nodded as he seemingly whispered to her. She nodded and looked back at me. He says to tell you that it isn't as dumb as you rushing in there with only a knife. She said with a straight face. I sighed and shook my head. Well, he wasn't wrong about that one. So I finally nodded, standing up and walking over to the two of them. We might as well try it. Because if it doesn't work, we're all going to be screwed. I chuckled nervously. Picking the two of them up with a grunt and walking off to go and prepare everything we were going to need. This included some more chalk, candles, a branch from the tree outside, and of course a bottle of Olivia's old mother's booze. All packed up the three of us waited till nightfall and made our way out towards the voodoo store. We weren't expecting it to be closed, it is open 24 hours after all. In fact, the whole plan was expecting the store to be open and for King Creole to be there. Lucky enough for us, he was currently dealing with the man I had seen him with the last time he was there. I wonder how badly getting rid of his wife had messed him up. Okay, Tempe. Show Olivia the right circles to draw. And Olivia be careful not to burn yourself or Tempe. We have to get this right or it isn't going to work at all. I told the two of them as we hid in the alley next to the store. They both nodded up at me and with one final hug of Olivia, I stood and went back to the door. Just in time to see the undead corpse of a woman shambling into the store right before me. Keeping my mouth shut to keep me from screaming I let her go ahead. I peeked into the store as I saw the woman shambling over towards who I could only guess was her husband. The old zombie trick, he must be running out of ideas. The man let out a blood curdling scream as the undead woman latched onto him and began biting into his neck. I watched his creole chuckle to himself as the body was eaten in front of him. Taking this opportunity I entered the store again and quickly dropped my purse in the door to keep it from closing all the way. I wasn't going to let him lock me in here again. He looked over at the door, most likely expecting another customer, but his smile quickly turned into an angry scowl as he saw me. Don't you have anything better to do than annoy me? He asked, sitting up straight and walking past the counter over to me. His displeasure rose with each step towards me. I stood my ground as he walked closer to me. If you give me Travis back this could all be over, I told me, puffing out my chest to meet his gaze as he finally stood mere inches from me. He chuckled at me and raised a brow at me. I can still never shake the horror of seeing Creel's mannerisms coming from Travis's body. It hurts my heart terribly to see it. You know I can't do that. And ain't nothing going to convince me neither. He smiled at me, reaching his hand out and calmly grabbing me by the throat. I took the chance to inhale deeply and store as much air in my lungs as I could before he began to put pressure onto my windpipe. I stared at him with as much hatred as he stared back at me. And then I made a smile at him. Gotcha. I coughed out at him. He raised a brow at me before he was tackled from behind by the undead woman. Sending the both of us forward and thanks to the ajar door, stumbling forward into the street. His grip loosened on me and quickie crawled away from him and the woman. You rotting whore. He snarled, grabbing the woman by her hair and jamming his fingers into her eye. Her whole body soon began to disintegrate and disappear into the night in a cloud of ash. He turned to look at me, just as I placed the last candle down on the floor. He stared at the symbol on the floor and then at the candles and he quickly began crawling to try and blow one of them out. Hold. I shouted at the floor. The chalk symbols glowing and Creel's hand stopping inches away from the candle. He looked around like the trapped rodent he was, smashing against a seemingly invisible box around him and clawing at it for some sort of escape. You sneaky bitch. He snarled, standing up and looking at me, and then Olivia who quickly ran to my side with Tempe in tow. You realize this can't hold me very long, correct? He snuffed at me. I nodded to him, picking up Olivia and walking around the circle towards the voodoo store entrance. But it will hold you long enough to save Travis, I said with a raised head. As I and Olivia returned one last time. To the half-priced voodoo store.
stepping into the store was eerie. While every time I went in knowing what to expect, this time the entire store sent off an almost paralyzing sense of fear into me. Olivia as normal was just excited to be inside again. She hugged Tempe tightly as the pair went about looking for where Travis's soul might be kept. Don't wander out of my sight, I told her as she started towards Creel's office. She looked up at me and gave me a strange look. She then looked back at the office and pointed towards it. I raised my brow at her and looked over at the office, then back at her. What is darling? I asked her. You don't hear the phone ringing, mommy. She asked me with a look of absolute confusion on her face. I looked at her and then up over to the office door. I didn't hear anything but the creaking of the old wood and the soft chittering sounds of mice in the walls. I couldn't hear anything that sounded like a telephone ringing. Um, alright you go to the office and answer it. Just don't touch anything, dear. I told her. To which she nodded and went to the door. Keeping it open and walking inside to answer whatever imaginary phone she thought she heard. I meanwhile went about trying to locate any kind of lead on where Travis's soul might have been being kept. I looked once again behind the counter, on the back wall, and even to the wall of new voodoo dolls. But nothing called to me as being where Travis was being kept. Olivia. Are you done in there? I asked her, walking over and letting myself into King Creel's office. I looked around the rather messy looking office with a soft calling to tidy it up. But I pushed that down and walked over to Olivia who was sitting on Creel's chair and talking on a rotary telephone. What's a math head? She asked me when she saw I was in the office with her. This man is calling about some math heads. Does that mean someone who really loves math? She asked me. I looked at her just as confused as she no doubt was. I took it from her and put it up to my ear. Who is this? I asked. On the other end, I heard nothing but a dial tone. Then a hard sigh and the sound of someone shifting in a chair. You're that limey bitch that Charles keeps complaining about. A tired and annoyed voice of a man told me from the other end. Where is that idiot with the meth heads he promised me? He said, his voice becoming one of anger now. He's indisposed right now. I'll pass it along. I told him, not having the time to talk to whoever this was on the other end. I was about to hang up the call, but suddenly a garbled and slashing noise came from the other end. Tell that bastard to give me what he owes me. The voice suddenly said. It came in distorted and almost impossible to hear clearly. I pulled the phone away as it began to use the black sludge that normally comes out of Creel when he's damaged. I quickly slammed the phone back on its receiver and backed away from it. Olivia, don't answer that anymore, I told her quickly. To which she nodded, still confused about the whole process. No doubt still confused as to what a math head was. We quickly switched gears into looking for the bottles with Travis's soul. I was about to give up hope when Olivia suddenly tugged on my sleeve and pointed down at the floor. Tempe says try right there. She said, hugging the doll into her chest as she looked up at me. I stared at her for a moment before getting on my knee and knocking on the creaky old floorboards. Most of them sounded hollow until I got to a spot right next to Creel's chair which sounded hollow. I quickly dug my nails into the opening spaces between them and pried it open. Staring back at us were the two bottles. The red one was still trying in vain to escape, while the blue one was still idle at the bottom. Seemingly never having moved from where it had fallen. I nodded quickly and let the floorboard fall back down into place. Looking at Olivia and Tempe I offered them both a smile and kissed Olivia on the head. Good job sweetie, I said with a loving smile quickly standing up and heading for the door into the main floor of the shop. And right into Creel who had certainly seen better days. It looked like he had been hit by a train, his body was ragged, and black ooze dripped from cuts all over his body. Quite the spell. But not enough to hold me. He chuckled. It was impossible, the spell still had a few more minutes left in it. I looked over at where we had trapped him and sure enough, the candles were still breathing, and the chalk line was still in place. How did you escape? I asked him, pushing Olivia behind me and handing her the bottles to hold on to. Creel chuckled, letting out long haggard breaths as he looked at me with his button eyes. His pale face contorting into a scowl as he pushed his mangled body to stand up straight. Sometimes, brute force is all you need. He chuckled, suddenly going into a coughing fit and hacking up more of the black sludge that kept him and by extension, Travis's body alive. I looked back at the prison spell and then at him. 
You didn't, I said, finally realizing he had simply thrown himself at it over and over again to simply force his way through it. The equivalent of running into strong glass and being cut by all the shards. Sometimes it's the simplest ways that are also the hardest. He chuckled at me, wiping his mouth and standing up straight as the cuts and bruises began to slowly heal themselves. I must thank you for answering that phone call for me, Olivia dear. Who was it? He asked her as she poked her head out from behind me. Some sad sounding man asking for math heads. She said quickly, sticking her tongue out at him when she was done. Quickly hiding behind me again and gripping me with her hands as she kept the bottles tucked under her armpits. Creole looked as confused as I was when she said that, but soon he was able to put two and two together and nodded knowingly. Sinclair. He chuckled. Sking as he shook his head. He's going to give me hell for not answering that. Oh well, he can wait. He said, turning around and walking over to the counter. Reaching over it and pulling out his cane as the last of his injuries healed. What are you going to do? I asked, trying to build up a bit of courage that I had. Beat us to death with that. Hopefully, that hadn't given him any ideas. He looked over at me and chuckled. His smile spread up to his red painted cheeks. Nothing so sweet and simple. He hummed at me, raising the cane at us and slamming it down in front of him. Sending a loud smacking sound across the store. The wood shaking and things falling from the shelf. Olivia whimpered and quickly went to hug me as hard as she could. I put an arm behind me to pat her head, trying to keep strong for her. You see, Creel said after the shaking had stopped. Your little stunt with the undead whore has given me a wonderful idea. Why not just bring back the two people who scare you so much more than I do? He said with a childlike giggle. What do you mean? I asked him. My question soon answered by the floorboards in front of him exploding and two sets of arms clawing their way up from there. I recognized one immediately as the flesh began to return to her rotting corpse. Olivia's old mother Sophie. Her eyeless sockets stared at Olivia and instantly sent her into a screaming fit. The other body was at first unfamiliar to me. Even as more and more skin was added to his body it was still impossible to remember who this was. That is until his mouth opened and he began screaming at me. Alex, you bloody whore. Leaving me with the fucking brats, eh? He shouted at me as he pulled himself to his feet. My blood ran cold as I backed up and fell down next to Olivia, who was bawling her eyes out as Shopee crawled her way to us. Her body was still trapped between being half-human and half-doll, and she used her one good arm to crawl her way towards us. Billy, please. I, I couldn't raise your children. My voice trembled as my ex-husband made his way over to me and grabbed me by the hair. His nails dug into my scalp as he pulled me up. All those horrible memories of being his wife, being forced to bear his children, and the night I managed to escape all came running back to me. Left me to deal with them brats after you took off to this place. He spat at me as he pushed me to the wall behind us near Creel's office door. I trembled as I looked up at his rotting face. Suddenly though Olivia screamed out and I looked to see that Sophie had her hand around her throat. You little spoiled brat. Look what you fucking did to me. She screamed at Olivia while she tried to kick and get the half-human and doll hybrid away from her. The bottle she was holding now on the floor as Creole walked to go pick them back up. Happily chuckling to himself. I looked back at Bill as I thought about all I had gone through to get away from him. Then all I had done to take care of Olivia. She mattered more to me than anything in the world. She's my daughter and I will protect her. Taking a deep breath, I grabbed Bill by the head and slammed his head into the wall next to me. Ah. You'll pay for that, you two cent whore. He cried, gabbing his cracking face as I quickly ran to Olivia. Grabbing Sophie by the hair and yanking her away from Olivia. Staring at her sockets as I gritted my teeth at her. Don't touch my daughter. I screamed at her, grabbing a loose floorboard from their initial entrance and striking her on the head with her. Turning quickly and striking Bill with it while he was still dealing with his face. I panted hard as I kicked Sophie away further and quickly picked up Olivia. She was still crying and even hyperventilating, and I tried my best to calm her down. My, how very brave Creel said with a chuckle. I turned to quickly look at him, my heart sinking as he tossed the blue bottle up and down in his hand. I swallowed as I backed up with Olivia in my arms. Something came to my mind as I realized she was hugging me with both arms. Where was Tempe? My answer came moments later when Creel let out a surprise growl as he was suddenly missing a button eye. 
I looked at him in shock and surprise when I saw Tempe had managed to climb up onto his hat and had suddenly cut one of the buttons from his eyes out. Looking down to the floor I quickly put Olivia down and picked up the floorboard piece. Creole looked up at me as I shouted out and caught him upside the head with his. A sickening crack coming from him as the board snapped in half. Did you really think that would work he shouted at me, but his tone changed when I grabbed him by the tie and grabbed his remaining button eye with my fingers and tore it from his face. Ah. You goddamn whore. He screamed at me as he stumbled backward and twisted his head back and forth rapidly. I quickly picked up the bottle he had dropped when I struck him and grabbed the other red bottle from the floor. Olivia. Let's go, baby. I said to her, she looked up at me with tears in her eyes and quickly nodded. Running past her crumbling and rotting mother as she scooped up Tempe from the floor and ran towards me and the exit. I waited until she was safely outside before turning to watch Bill also crumble to dust as Creole stumbled around trying to find his buttons. Goodbye, Bill, I said, more for me than for him. I was safe from him forever and with a daughter who I loved with all my heart. I clutched the bottles and quickly left the store as Creole shouted after me. Good luck doing anything with those. He screamed at me, his laugh picking up intensity as we ran away from the store. I can't wait to see what you whip up. He cackled as we finally managed to get out of earshot from him. I took a moment to comfort Olivia by the side of the road as she bawled her eyes out. Even Tempe hugged her leg as we both did our best to calm her down. Arriving back home I quickly put her to bed with Tempe. Leaving her nightlight on I went to the kitchen and let out an exhausted sigh as I placed the bottles on the table. The red one was still trying to escape, throwing itself against the sides of the bottle over and over again. I picked up the blue bottle and stared at it with a sigh. Creole was right. What was I meant to do with them now? You can hand them to me. A shrill voice suddenly told me. I stood up and backed away from the table as I stared at a familiar face. Le Baron Samedi. I won't let you take them. Not if they count as Creole's tribute to him. I said, clutching the bottle close to my chest. But the Baron simply shook his head and walked past me over to the fridge. I backed away from him, also sliding the red bottle over towards me. Look, that cockroach's days are numbered. I can see the writing on the walls and I need a way to get back what I've lost in investments. He said, opening up the fridge and letting out an annoyed TSK. No liquor. What kind of fucking house is this? He looked over at me with an annoyed look. I stared at him and crossed my arms at him. I'll give you some, I said, pulling the bottle of booze out from under the table and placing it down in front of him. If you and I make a deal, I said. He stared at me and the corners of his mouth curled up into a smile. He came over and sat down on the other side of the table. I'm listening, bitch. He said, pulling out a cigar and placing it in his mouth. Eagerly waiting to see what my proposition was. Taking a deep breath I nodded and laid it all out for him. I want Travis back. Not as a puppet, but as a human. I told him. And he shook his head back at me. Can't. He's been dead too long. Same with his family, can't bring them back either. Unless you want them as fucking zombies. He said with a smirk, puffing away at his cigar. I nodded, knowing as much. But I had heard you ask for the impossible, so you can get what you want. Then take away the murderous tendencies he's gotten. Put the soul back together and let him sleep. I told him. To this, he let out an audible hum. Nodding to me as he blew out a perfect smoke ring. Interesting. Go on, this is seemingly like fun. He said with a smile. And give him back his eyes. Let him sleep, so this never happens again. I said, sliding the liquor closer to him. A tempting offer for him. He stared at it and licked his lips. Seemingly disparate for a drink. Hmm, and this is all I get for my hard work. He pointed at the bottle. Definitely tempted for it, but also trying to contain himself. There must be more. He told me. You get Creole. And all those souls he has trapped in the voodoo store. His eyes lit up at that. He slowly lifted his hand up to the cigar and took it from his mouth. Staring at me and chuckling. Truly an excellent deal. He nodded. Reaching out to take the bottle before I reached out and pulled it back over to me. Not until I have your assurances that he'll stay in hell, I told him. He looked at me suddenly annoyed and backed away from the bottle. He tilted his head back and forth before finally nodding. Deal. He nodded, to which I finally passed him the bottle. He took it with a smile and bit the end off. 
guzzling down the liquor with a pleased hum. I nodded with a smile as I stood up and walked off towards Olivia's room, leaving the bottles there for the Baron to work his magic. Walking up to her room I noticed that the light was out. Entering and I soon found the reason why. Take another step and I cut her head off Creole growled at me in the dark. The night light shining brightly soon afterward and revealing that Creole had his hand over Olivia's mouth and a knife across her throat. I gasped and wanted to take a step towards him, but the slight flinch I made towards him caused him to hold the knife closer to her throat. So I complied and stood my ground. Don't hurt her, I begged. He looked down at her as tears rolled down her throat. And then back at me, he gritted his yellow teeth as he seemingly wrestled with his decision. His mother had always made it a point to him to never harm a child. Y'all are leaving me no choice. He chuckled, standing up and keeping Olivia against his chest and walking towards me. I backed up away from him and swallowed hard. If you are playing dirty. I suppose so must I. He declared, pushing the knife closer to her throat. Olivia suddenly squirmed and drove her little foot into his crotch. Creole let out a surprised scream and dropped her suddenly. Olivia ran to me and got behind me. It's over Charles, I told him. The voodoo king looked up at me as he looked around like a caged animal. A soft chuckle coming from his throat as he forced himself up. Staring at me with buttons from his suit and looking down at Olivia. Who was now clutching Tempe. Au revoir poor la moment. He said with a smile as he rolled his head around and suddenly collapsed to the floor. Falling to his knees and then on his face as we went limp. We both looked at each other then behind us when someone cleared their throat. The Baron waved to us as he held up the liquor bottle I had given him. Which was now filled to the brim with a black sludge. It's done long, cheery. He said with a nod to me. Pointing over to the limp body as it suddenly pushed itself up and looked around. His eyes blinking in confusion and then looking up at us. Travis. I shouted as I quickly walked over to him and helped him to his knees and hugged him. Even Olivia running over and hugging him. Travis really was back. Hey guys been a while hasn't it? I guess Alexandra has been filling you in on everything while I was gone. And she's the reason I'm here now again. Having my eyes back is certainly weird. Blinking feels so weird and being able to fall asleep for the first time in God knows how long felt amazing. Even if it was only for two hours. While the rest of my body is still pale and the scar is still across my throat I've slowly been going back to a real sense of normalcy. Being able to actually eat, see, cry, everything I've missed feels simply amazing. Day-to-day -day life with Alexandra and Olivia is going along well, while Alexandra still keeps an eye on me. I wouldn't blame her, after all, I did try to murder her and was possessed. And another pretty good news, I applied to college. I figured I might as well do it, since I would much rather suffer through any kind of bullshit class than go back to the workforce. My current experience with it has certainly scarred me. I'm sure some of you are wondering how the hell I'll be able to do that looking the way I do. Well, makeup exists for a reason, right? And maybe even online classes. Either way, I'm never going back to the voodoo store for as long as I live. I've learned my lesson. I have a pretty good life here with Alexandra and Olivia. I pick Olivia up from school and she shows me off to her friends when they don't believe her brother had his head cut off and lived. Brother. Definitely, a weird thing to hear from a 20-year-old single child. But she definitely feels like my little sister now. There really isn't too much left to tell you guys. Other than the occasional nightmare I don't really like to think of all King Creoles. I have the scars to show what I've gone through, and I would never go back there. I guess this is the end of this. Unless something horrible ends up happening. From Travis, I worked at the half-priced voodoo store. Au revoir Monchiri. The end. If you like this series so far subscribe.